All right, I'm okay now. You okay? If you please stand. Thank you to the commissioners. Uh, good morning, God. The same God who made the universe and the earth, to the God who created men and women, to the same God that gave the human beings the right to choose and be creative. Today we come together in many voices to share our opinions on various subjects. We ask that the patience may prevail over the business at hand. We ask for a special blessing upon all attendees today. May we uphold our commissioners, governing women and men who take the time from their daily walk of life to help govern. Our prayer is for communities to grow with love and compassion that brings peace, hope, and joy to all neighboring communities. But Lord, we as humans cannot resolve all problems on our own, but with your guidance and with our compromising, the battles will be won by compassion and love for each other. Thank you, God, for listening to our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Bell. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just a couple of items before we get started with the agenda. We have a pledge. Good morning, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Good morning. We have a pledge of public comment, or I'm sorry, public conduct. We may disagree. We may be respectful, but we will be respectful of one another. We will direct all comments to only issues. We will avoid personal attacks up on this side. So if we can all follow by that, including the audience, we'll have a great meeting. Um, consent goes already. Uh, let's see. Consent is uh, items 9 through 34, just so the audience knows uh, those, that those are consent items. So we'll go ahead at this point. Um, Ms. County Administrator, it's odd seeing you down there. It's the first time. <laughs> but uh, one more thing that I want to say. You will notice that some commissioners have plexiglass. You will notice that some don't, but those that do not have the plexiglass are distanced from each other. So we've uh, taken that into consideration, obviously. We want everyone to be safe. We also have an overflow room up on the fifth floor if we need to use it. It is up there. Uh, it's very nice. If you get an opportunity, go up there and take a look at it. Uh, it's just been redone for our use. So, Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. I'm on the board. I don't know how, how I know we got to go back to the board again. Um, well, I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, That's well, why. Uh, regarding with what you just said, we still need to be, if we aren't masked and we're less than six feet apart, we have to wear a mask according to CDC guidelines. This is not, this is not working. Look. So we're going to have to, they're going to adjust yeah, that. I see the point. But I just, yeah, I mean, we're just. Yeah, I see it. It's, it's but really even the anybody at the dais, if you're less than six feet from somebody, you must wear a mask according to CDC guidelines. And I just needed to say that as a leader in Manatee County. Anything else, Commissioner? No, thank Whitmore? you. All right, thank you. Let me figure if I can. Okay, this is not working. So you know. Get her removed, and it's not. Commissioner Bellamy, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I just want to make a, a comment on, you know, our seating arrangements and the plexiglass. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm social distance. I just want to be honest with you all. And I don't feel like this plexiglass will do what it needs to be, what it needs to do, because I know how mobile I am moving back and forth. And there's nothing against my colleagues to the left or to the right of me. Um, I was under the impression that we were going to look at this and we were going to have it where we would not be potentially putting anyone at any risk. And I do not feel like that's that way, not even just from my perspective, from um, the 
county attorney, yourself, as well as Mr. Satchel, we are not, we're not within six feet of each other, and right. people are not masked. I, I'm just concerned about it. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and add, um, I will tell you that uh, the county administrator has worked very hard, and from what she has told me, all of you have been down here, looked at the dais, looked at the plexiglass, uh, and that I was told everyone was pleased. I do understand as far as the plexiglass, it probably should come out a little further. Perhaps we can get that done before our next meeting. But as of yesterday, I was told that everyone had been down here, looked at everything, and there were no issues. However, if someone does have an issue, until we can get more plexiglass put up, you can join this meeting by Zoom. Uh, it is on Zoom, and commissioners can do that as well. Um, Madam Chair, our, keep that in mind. our buttons aren't working. Yeah. Kevin and I's well, buttons aren't working. What's the button? No nurse is coming. Right. No nurse is coming? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. But Madam, last time. Madam Chair. That's not working either. <laughs> okay, you know what? Exactly. We're going to take a 10-minute recess to get things oh, in order. Thank we, you. We're on recess. Madam Chair, we need to wear a mask. You're Thank you. Recess. Thank you, James. One, two, three, four, one, two, three.
Patrick and Tom are doing better. Welcome back. Uh, we might have a few more issues, obviously. We have a lot of new equipment here, um, and it's been months since we've been here. So uh, just bear with us. We'll get better as the day goes on, I know. We do have an 11 o'clock time certain on the CARES Act and a 1.30 time certain on item number 40 on the agenda. So, uh, Madam Administrator, do you have any changes to the agenda for us today? Yes, Madam Chairman. We do have some changes to today's agenda. Uh, members of the board, uh, changes to your regular agenda today. Under the administrator, the update item number 36 of the CARES Act Strategies Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the coronavirus local strategies involved with testing, local data, statistics, and vaccine distribution and the extension of the local state of emergency. Your ongoing update response to COVID PowerPoint presentation was added. Under changes to reports under public works, this is item number 40, report on the 9th Avenue Northwest Roadway Improvement Project. The PowerPoint presentation was updated and replaced to include modifications to the design level choices with lesser scope options than were originally considered and a written comment submitted through the online public comment form was added. Those are the changes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any items <clears throat> from the consent agenda which are items four, I'm sorry, um, nine through 34. Are there any items that commissioners would like pulled? All right, not seeing any. That's, I think, the second time that's happened. That's wonderful. Okay. Then we'll go ahead and go into awards and presentations uh, and proclamations. So hold up. Yes. First one, number four, presentation of the February Employee of the Month. We have, staff, we have staff waiting outside. They're going to enter in and then leave so that more participants can be seated in here. Perfect. I think it's Jeff Bowman. Yes, it is. Mr. Bowman. I was wondering why we had all the men in black and women in black out there. <laughs> Is this a good time to bring up my neighbor's incessantly barking dog? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably now. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present your February Employee of the Month, Chief Jeff Bowman. Madam Administrator, Mr. County Attorney, um, Jeff joined Code Enforcement August of 2014. He's got over 28 years of public service in other jurisdictions. He's a graduate of the Certified Public Managers Program from Florida State University and Leadership Manatee, and also holds a number of certifications from FEMA and FACE. He leads a special operations team of over 20 professionals that you see behind me. And I truly mean they're special operations and they are professionals. They can do anything. They conduct or coordinate extensive training for the code enforcement officers. Jeff has expanded that. He's changed the culture of code enforcement. A couple of examples. They implemented a community code enforcement concept to increase community awareness. Neighborhood meetings, landlord meetings, and an outstanding relationship with the Sheriff's Department. They're professional looking in their appearance. Look at them. You know a code enforcement officer when you see one on the street. Mm -hmm. Their trucks are specially identified now. So that distinguishes them as part of an elite group. The biggest thing that they've done with their culture change is compliance through cooperation. And that was brought to Manatee County by Jeff. And I'm very proud of the fact that they do that. You know, people run on, on tough times sometimes. 
and don't kick them when they're down. Help them up. <coughs> and all of these, Jeff, through his example, always does the right thing when no one's looking. That's a mark of integrity. And I'm very proud that the committee selected Jeff as employee of the month. He's a devoted father to Tori, and today we have his friend Lily with us. Mm -hmm. So, very proud to have everybody here to honor you, Jeff. It is my pleasure to present you with the February Employee of the Month. Congratulations. Thank you. I think uh, Officer Albritton has been designated as a speaker for the group. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As I said, I'm Officer Albritton. Um, Jeff is a man of integrity. Um, I think I can speak for the entire team that Chief Bowman is the one that you want to have behind you. He always has our back. He never lets us down. If he makes a commitment to you, he's going to make sure he fulfills that commitment. I can speak for myself with personal experiences. I had zero experience in code enforcement. He took a leap out, gave me a job. I'm still here. He encourages me every day. He encourages our team every day. So I appreciate him, and I'm sure I can speak on every in the behalf of our team that we all appreciate Chief Bowman for everything that he does for us. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to thank the commission and the county administrator for allowing us to be leaders. Every, every employee in the county is allowed to be a, a leader, and I think that's important <clears throat> that we instill that in the employees. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank uh, the code enforcement team. Uh, I don't think that we would be as good as we are if it wasn't for the team that we have. And I think that they set the example for the state and for the country. I think we have the best team here in Manatee County, as well as the rest of the departments. We all work uh, collaboratively together. Uh, it's just a wonderful team. I've been in five other jurisdictions. This is the best by far. And I'm happy and proud and honored to work for Manatee County. So thank you and thank you, team. Jeff, don't go anywhere. We have many commissioners that would like to say a few words. Commissioner Servia. Thank you. When I saw that Jeff Bowman was the employee of the month, I was so excited because there is no one who deserves it more than that guy right there. Outstanding job. And the people that are standing behind you are, are exactly like you. The work that you guys do is incredible with thir I think you have 13 officers is that the correct number 14. and you take care of I uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of problems every month so what you guys do is so appreciated and I kind of equate it to um, you know code enforcement was not always loved right when I worked here <laughs> back in the 90s Love. you know people would see code enforcement and they would be like oh no <laughs> Now that whole thing has shifted. It's like community policing. You guys are out there at the ground level talking to neighbors and trying to get things working uh, and compliance. And it's that relationship that makes the community and the staff and everyone love code enforcement. So thank you for shifting that. Thank you for the work that you do. You are, you and your team are the best. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Um, Jeff, I thought, didn't we start out years ago with 10, correct? And I know some of the commissioners really pushed to add more. Yes. Wasn't that correct? Yes. Yeah. I just want to tell you, you've done a good job. It's, it's nice to have somebody cool, calm, and collected to deal with 
everything, including us. What I did see is I saw uh, Sherry looking at you with pride and a, and a smile over that mask. <laughs> so um, I just want to tell you thank you. Um, it's been great working with you. And I know the district commissioners work with you a lot more than the at large. But um, all of you guys, congratulations. Good thank job. You. Thank you. Commissioner Bellamy. Jeff is my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff has, has met me in areas we have had several cases and several issues as far as, as it connects to the district too. And Jeff has led. And if you look around and look at his team, you should see the smile behind those masks. When I see them in district two and they're dealing with the people out in our community and they're finding a way to make a difference, it's quite clear that they have a great leader. And that's what that's what Jeff is. I am so thankful for your efforts, not only just for you as being the leader, but every time I see code enforcement, I look them right in the eyes and I tell them thanks for all that you all do because they're out there and they're making a difference with a smile on their face and they're making Manatee County better. Thank you for your leadership, Jeff. Appreciate everything you do, sir. Thank you. Madam Administrator. Okay, I get to finish it. No, you so. don't. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, well, I get to add to it then. Um, so Jeff and, and the code enforcement team, um, always doing a great job up and up and through March of this past year. But when that happened and we gave you extra assignments, you all stepped up and said, we're the people to do it. And you've met every challenge. This is a fantastic uh, group of people. And I know, Jeff, you don't like taking personal credit. And so I wanted to make sure and say to all of the code enforcement team, you've done everything this community has asked and then some. So thank you very much. All right, uh, no one else is on the board, so I'll finish this up. Uh, kind of hard to follow, though, after the administrator, but um, you know, Jeff, you really have changed, not just you know what you do, but also uh, code enforcement. You've changed the, the I'm going to say Kevin's word, the culture. And it's, it's really been refreshing for me, being a district commissioner, of course, I call you quite a bit. And it, it, it is always handled almost immediately. So you guys, what I really appreciate about you is that you don't go out there with a strong arm. You try to help people. And, and that says an awful lot about what we do here in Manatee County. So I, um, I'm just thrilled. I think, uh, you know, you should be the employee of the month. I know you're very proud of him. We are. Uh, thank you for being here for him today. We appreciate it. Um, and guys, y'all just all, I mean, you, code enforcement is really making a difference in this county. It's making a difference to a lot of citizens, as was said earlier, that, you know, really do need help. And when Jeff first started, there was a situation in Mayaka that had been going on for quite a while that I kind of inherited when I got elected. And, and Jeff, I mean, he personally went out there, took care of the situation, and I knew then we were in good hands. So, um, Jeff, congratulations. Well deserved, and uh, we'll we'll all see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving right along. I'm not sure, uh, Madam Chair or Madam Administrator, the introduction of the spring 2021 results. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Xavier Cologne and Caitlin Steltzer will be bringing your, there's a team of five in to just do introductions to kick off the spring in uh, interns. They're out in the hallway. I think the key word there is the word spring. Yeah. We're ready. Just, yeah. I'll just, just stand, stand here over and let them call. The mask. Mask does make it. Good day in the neighborhood. Nobody cares. I mean, they can't see us. And these older ones, it's easier to breathe through yeah. than those. Kevin, oh, you know what? I've got those at home. I'll try that. Because I'm having jacket. trouble. That's my problem. I can't breathe. Yeah. My wife can't either. And she gets a <laughs> headache right away. And it gets, yeah. Hi. I can't breathe. Good, Good morning, morning, Madam Chair, County Commissioners. Um, Madam County Administrator and Mr. County Attorney, thank you guys so much for having us this morning. My name is Xavier Cologne, and I have the privilege of being the coordinator for the Results First Internship Program. Just to give you a brief background, it was created in 2017 with the goal of um, attracting new talent, uh, creatively solving problems throughout the county, 
and also giving an intimate uh, knowledge of local government to these aspiring graduates and also current students. Uh, we have five this spring. We do it in spring and summer. Um, we will have them for 12 weeks and they do professional development and one of the big professional developments is public speaking. This is their first foray and uh, we like to do it big. So once they do this one, then anything else will be easier. So I will have their, one of their mentors will come up and introduce the teams and then the intern will introduce themselves. They know they have to wait for the mic wiping, but thank you guys so much. This program is a big success because of the buy-in we get from county leadership and our county commissioners. And we have this program imitated in Sarasota and they were just impressed by how much buy-in we get from everybody. So thank you guys so much. And here are our spring interns. Hey. My name is Hector Rojas, and I'm here for Information Technology Services. Um, the co-mentor is Al Cox, and our manager is Cindy Snyder from the um, Client Services Department. So I'm here to um, proudly uh, show our intern, which is um, Carl Juzma. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carl Juzma. I am a junior at SPC College, St. Petersburg College. I am going for my bachelor's degree in computer technology with a subplan of software development. My uh, current project is the preparation and deployment of CARES Act systems, which will allow our employees to work remotely and within the office. Good. Welcome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Wendy Edwards. Uh, I work in the property management uh, department under energy and sustainability. Um, my co-mentor is Hallmar Podges, um, and we work under Eric Kaplan. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Sheru Abraham, and here she is. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. My name is Sharu Abraham. I'm at USF in my second year, where I'm currently studying computer science. Um, as a data analytics intern, I'm currently developing a cost-benefit analysis calculator for property management's drone program to evaluate the cost of the program in relation to the benefits of utilizing drones. Thank you for your time. Welcome. That's a lot of <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa Zigich, and I'm the Destination Sales Manager over at the Bradenton Area Convention Center, and with the CVB as well. And my co-mentor, or our co-mentor, is Becca Prosson, and she's also with the CVB. And we are, are in our supervisors, Anna Pohl, and she's the General Manager of the Bradenton Area Convention Center. And our intern is Luis Maza. I'm happy to introduce him. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Luis Maza. I'm a, a senior in University of Tampa. Uh, my project is to create a five, one and five year strategic plan to optimize all the three venues. So, Premier Sports Campus, um, Powell Cross State, and the Convention Center. Thank you. Oh. Nice to have you. Good morning, my name is Michaela Lindykamp. I am a Neighborhood Services Specialist with the Neighborhood Services Department. And my supervisor and our supervisor for this project is Simone Peterson, and I get the privilege of mentoring Audrey Bennett, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about her project. Hi, Audrey. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Oh, wait a minute. Explain. <laughs> 
name is Audrey Bennett, and I am a sophomore at NYU, New York University. I am studying Applied Data Analytics and Visualization, and my project is that I am designing a grant, a database of grants for the community and other neighborhoods to apply for that will be featured on the Mansi County website. Oh, good. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Kyle Rogers. I work in the Human Resources Department under Training and Development and under Christine Fritz, and I am mentoring Brian Long. Welcome, Brian. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian. I'm the HR intern. I'm a senior at the University of South Florida as a psychology major. Cool. Our current project is to develop a onboarding plan to increase communication among new hire employees and their peers, resulting in an enhanced first year experience. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for your time. Like I said, these guys are tackling pro um, problems throughout the county. They went through a rigorous hiring process competing against other students. We have become a well-known um, internship program which has been emulated in Sarasota and also we have in Pinellas County where they kind of studied our thing. They really like the project base. It's part of our results first adoption throughout the county and like I said we thank you so much for your input and for your support for this program and they will be presenting their final products at the April 13th um, work session. So thank you so much. Uh, hold up. We do have some comments. Commissioner uh, Servia. Yes. Um, this is one of my favorite things every year is to hear about the students who are going to be working with us as interns and then to see their projects later in the year. It, it is just an incredible program and that is why it's been emulated in other counties. You know, the, the work that we receive as Manatee County from these students is, is so valuable that it doesn't even compare to the cost of putting this program together. And that's what you always want, right? Results first. Um, Xavier is a product of this program. And our goal is hopefully that we get to uh, uh, invite some of these people who would like to uh, come work here in the future. And I, I can't not mention Sherry Corrier mm. because this was her baby. Mm -hmm. She developed this, and this has brought so much young talent to our community. It's just been a phenomenal program. So welcome to Manatee County, all of you. Thank you to the mentors. Thank you to the students. Thank you, Sherry. Awesome program. A good job. You know, I, I think Commissioner Servia really did hit on the on the fact that a lot of interns do get hired to Manatee County. And, and I got to tell you, being the oldest person up here on the dais, I hate oh, wow. saying that, but it's true. <laughs> um, you know, I can tell you that there's nothing better than to have younger people than myself coming to this county, getting involved and in making a difference because you all have fresh ideas. You're getting, uh, a, a lot of you are just now getting out of school and you can make the huge difference that we need in this county. So it's a very serious program. It's always been successful. And I can tell you that I look forward to seeing your, pro your projects that you do uh, show us in April. And I just wish you all the best. And thank you for coming to Manatee County. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, Sherry, you, uh, Misty brought this to my attention. I forgot. You started this under Ed. And what was it called with the young, what was it? Manatee Millennial Movement. Millennial Andrew. Movement. And you actually, actually took this on the road nationwide, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And can you tell the new commissioners, they probably don't know anything about this. Can you tell them, Simone was one of your first ones, and I think Xavier, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, some other members, Ogden Clark, who's in your public works uh, oh, division. Ogden, right. He's also was one of our early um, first um, employees, actually. Um, the internship program's really been designed and developed through the assistance of our young professionals uh, coming to me and talking about opportunities for them to contribute to the organization and to look at their future. 
We, but, but I think the most unique thing about it is that it's a community-wide program now. When the M3 program was started, we were able to collaborate with the Chambers, the Bradenton Area EDC, um, other networks of young professionals, and they have all come together. We did, um, we have, we've taken this uh, across the country. Um, when traveling was done back um, in 2017, <laughs> 18, back in the day. yeah, 19, National Association of Counties, uh, Florida Association of Counties, Neighborhoods USA, and this group is an phenomenal. Um, it, it runs so smoothly, and I think it, what Xavier mentioned is these projects that are selected are um, developed by the departments as things that they're not able to get done during the year with the staff that they have and the budget that they have. And so um, we finalize and review the most important projects and then these great young professionals seek out your county to come and learn in, in the office. It's a brief 10 week program and it culminates in almost every instance with a project that then can be implemented and used throughout the community. So we're just, we're so proud of all of them. And this is your future workforce and um, they're, you're in great hands. Good Thank job. you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. All right, next we're going to, uh, well, before we do that, what is the pleasure of the board on proclamations? We have a motion. Second. We have a someone? motion to approve by yeah, Commissioner. I'm, okay. I'm not. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure someone made the motion. And I'll make the motion. Okay, to and, I, and I seconded it. <laughs> okay. okay. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Bellamy, second by Commissioner Servia. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we're moving forward. Number six, adoption and presentation of proclamation designating February 2021 as Black History Month in Manatee County. Commissioner Bellamy. Good morning, fellow commissioners. Before I read the proclamation, I would ask that our um, current president of the NAACP and our past president of the NAACP please join me um, at the podium. Welcome this morning. Mm -hmm. And I apologize, but I'll let them give their name for the record if they want to say something afterwards. Okay, here we are in the month of four, uh, February, and it brings me great honor and, and pleasure um, as a county commissioner um, to read this proclamation um, as it relates to um, African American History Month or Black History Month. Proclamation Board of Manatee County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida, whereas Black History Month dates back to 1926 and observes African American achievements. And whereas Black History Month celebrates the achievements and contributions of African Americans in the United States. Whereas Black History Month's intent is not only to increase the knowledge of Black history and Black communities, but also spread the issue to American society as a whole. And whereas all members of the nation are affected by Black history because it is a part of American history, which should be celebrated by everyone. And whereas Black History Month has become a symbolic time period in which the appreciation and celebration of African Americans begin in every year and continues all year. Now, therefore, by the Board of County Commissioners of Manti County, Florida, that February 2021 shall be known, designated, and set aside as Black History Month in Manatee County, Florida. And the Board further calls upon the people of Manti County to recognize this special observance with appropriate ceremonies and activities adopted with a quorum present and voting this ninth day of February 2021. We have, we, we have two proclamations. Um, one will obviously be extended um, to the NAACP, um, as one will also be extended to our Minnesota Black, Black Chamber of Commerce. I would like to extend them an opportunity to say a word of, upon them receiving the proclamation if they would like. So I'll have to wait until um, she clean the mic.
Madam Chair, to the County Commissioners, we would like to thank you so much. I'm grateful. Um, this is something that I think we can all recognize, pause, and reflect on the African Americans that have made this nation a great nation. And I just want you all to know that we're so much better together. I want to acknowledge um, Commissioner Bellamy. Um, he did such a great job with bringing forth the public crisis as a declaration. And I think we have to all acknowledge if we do not understand that we are all in this together and we understand where we are, we can't move forward together. But thank you again for acknowledging the African American History Month. And again, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you give her your, can you say your name for the record, I am, please? So, I'm Tarnisha Clyde. I, um, as Commissioner Bellamy stated, the immediate past chair or president of the Manti County branch of the NAACP, along with the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce CEO, founder, and president. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, the rest of commissioners, it is indeed an honor. My name is Robert Powell. I am the newly uh, elected uh, president of the NAACP here in Manatee County. Just want to say that it is an honor. I definitely do look forward to working with each and every one of you. And like she said, um, looking forward to working together in unity to bring this county together. That's my main goal. Definitely want to thank Commissioner Bellamy for all of his efforts and definitely look forward again to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Servia, just a moment. Yes, um, thank you, Robert and Tarnisha, for being here. I really appreciate uh, what uh, Commissioner Bellamy read into the record because it is important to remember that black history is American history. Thank you very much. Commissioner Whitmore. Um, yes, I would love to meet with you both. We've talked a few times separately and stuff. Um, what you said is totally true. We need to do better, all of us do. And um, I think we all need to dialogue and, and do what we can to work together and make this place a better place. So uh, I would love it if you guys would take the time to meet with me sometime. Just give a call and I'll meet with you. I'll meet with you over wherever you want, or you can come to me. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to, I guess, be the last person here. Um, you know what? I, I agree with everything that you've said. I agree with all that you've heard from Commissioner Servia and Commissioner Whitmore. Um, and I would love to, I think you should meet with all commissioners, to be honest. Um, and, and, you know, we do have a lot of work to do. I mean, we all know this. And, and my concern is that we do it down the right path to get the best solutions that we can. I think that's really more important than anything else because there's no need if we can't get results. You know, it's it's done nothing. So let's move forward, see what we can do, and, and please set up uh, appointments with all commissioners. I think that's real important. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, next we're going to go to um, <laughs> uh, future agenda items. Future agenda items only. Let's see how many I have here. Let's see. I only have one. So when I call your name, please come up, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Robert Tarnay. I hope I said that correctly. Conservative negligence is the topic. My name is Robert, Robert Tarnay. I'll try to get through this without shouting or theatrics or verbal assaults. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank we you. We appreciate it. I'm a Democrat, but I respect conservatism. It's the other side of the coin. It creates the balance. It keeps us in check. Speaking at the January 26th meeting and concerning the meeting between the two at-large commissioners, to start off, Commissioner Satcher said, this isn't Mayberry. This is better than Mayberry. 
I would expect Barney Fife to walk through it any minute. <laughs> at 51 minutes at the meeting, Mr. Van Ostenbridge said, referring to the meeting between the two at-large commissioners, I was notified of it 15 minutes before it started. Someone called me and told me there was a meeting taking place. So I checked my county calendar. Sure enough, there it is. I have a calendar. I have referred to it all the time. He further went on to say, I was not notified of the meeting. I wasn't notified of the meeting. Nobody notified me. In his own words, he tells us that he relies on his constituents to tell him to look at his calendar. At one hour, 17 minutes, Carol Whitmore said, our advertisement was posted eight days before the meeting. Reggie Bellamy, at two hours and 57 minutes, he said, I think it could have been done better. It should have been handled differently. Did you not look at your calendar? At three hours and 19 minutes, the lawyer said, I did not know it had been scheduled. The, this is an embarrassment. It was posted eight days before, and you knew Carol was proposing to have a meeting. George Cruz began his discourse with the words, this place is a shit house." Yeah. How yeah. polite. <laughs> I don't think that was the word, but. That's what it sounded like over the, that wasn't the medium. Word. Well, they wouldn't say it in Maybury. George, if you thought the meeting was so beneficial, why didn't you call Mr. Satcher and let him know? Illegal. Uh -uh. Gang of four, Reggie, the lawyer, you're all an embarrassment. Not only are you an embarrassment, you tell us you're an embarrassment. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to respond first to your comment. I know, I've got you. It'll be next. I don't know what that noise was. <laughs> oh, is that what that is? Okay. What is that? Um, you need to look back. Your information was not correct. Or perhaps you could set up an appointment with me, and I'd be happy to discuss the meeting with you so that you have correct information. Uh, next is Glenn Jubilina, Affordable Housing. Point of order. <laughs> For the record, Glenn Jablina, I sent you all copies of this. So uh, affordable housing surplus, uh, you need to redirect the administrator to immediately include for-profit builders. This resolution took place a year ago and still the, uh, the property management, or Denise, does not have four profits in there. We need to get that done today. Renewable energy, where is that policy? Um, James Thatcher, uh, when, he, when he has a concern, the two at-large commissioners should go out there, that item should be pulled, address your concerns, and come back and vote on it. Uh, property management needs to be privatized. Future genome items also uh, should be 10 minutes. Um, so, um, I would like to ask Mr. Clegg where, where, where he, where the guard was to protect, to protect the county here for the last 10 years. Not once has property management stepped up to the plate and filled out the mandatory law to do, to do, uh, these reports. It's unconscionable. We pay them $150,000 a year, can't step up their plate once every three years and do this. I don't buy it. I don't buy it one bit. And the last part I want to bring is the density bonus. You know, here's, here's the problem that I have with the density bonus. And I always sent you every bit of this. Density bonus is a privilege. It's not a right. Density bonus is for affordable housing, not market rate rentals or sales. Here's the thing, vulgar and others mouthpiece for the developers, they never tell you what the retail price is going to be. 
They never tell you what the rental's gonna be. They never tell you the percentage of Alice folks over that they can't afford it. They never tell you the entry level MCSO, EMS, Friar school teachers will never be able to afford to live there, much less the checkout clerks at the local grocery stores, restaurants, or other services. It's okay that they drive miles to get to, to, get to their job because they could never live out there. It's okay they tell you that the added bonus will put additional stress on our resources, but they want the services anyways. They never tell you with the free density that they will rake in millions for the developers. They never tell you, and you as commissioners never asked. I propose a $10,000 per unit fee up to 2,400 square feet and 15,000 over. He gave 150 out last week. We could add a million five in the coffers by then. I sent you all the stuff how we can do it. Please take me seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Glad. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on fu uh, future agenda items? For the record. Please state your name. You'll have three minutes. Thank you, Glenn. You need your paperwork, Glenn. Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. For the gentleman, um, you need to refer to Florida Statute 286. And also, we have procedures for this um, meeting, which is attached to the agenda on um, on the county website. I behoove you to go to 4.3.1 to find out what issues with that meeting are, are there um, and why these other people were not notified and why they can't be notified by each other. Um, so over the weekend, we had a lot of information coming out in the newspaper, lots of it. I don't find it um, odd at all why these things are coming out in the newspaper. I think we have some big problems on the ninth floor that need to be corrected by this board. It's very disheartening, and even with the interns, I don't think that was not strategical. So um, I would like to um, plead with the board that we have to get this under control. We have to get the leaks from the ninth floor under control. We have to get this county working for all of you and we're not doing it fast enough because we see what is going on at the hands of a couple people. So, um, and the good news is we have bishops. So now that we're getting bishops, I think we solved our $10 million animal project. So congratulations to the board. Now we can move forward from that. So with those future agenda items, oh, actually my future agenda would be, let's have work sessions on real work. You know, what needs to be fixed? How much it costs, where are we going to find the money? Less taxes, less regulations, less government. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to come forward and speak on future agenda items? And I don't think there's anyone on the fifth floor. So, okay, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Are we doing call ins? Are we doing uh, oh, I didn't even think about that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any call ins? See, I can't see. Oh, do now. we still do that? Okay. Not at this time. Not at this time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. go ahead. Madam. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting to it. Yeah. Are you talking about comments that you want to make? <laughs> Commissioner Whitmore, what are you talking about? I'm pushing my button to speak. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I getting to it. Just give me time. I'm Be getting right to please. it. Commissioner Cruz, you are first. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, for Glenn. Two, two things that you said. Number one, next Tuesday is a work session on uh, surplus land. Uh, I've made it pretty clear. I want to get rid of all of it as quickly as humanly possible. Anyone who will build us affordable housing, I'll let them put virtually anything on there within reason. It, it, it's a waste of, of our county resources, and it's a waste of opportunity. I'm 100% on board with you. I'm looking forward to that work session. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you beforehand. Let's look at the for-profit versus non-profit, what Florida statute says, and try to come up with a plan we can present there uh, at that work session. Uh, the second thing that, that I also agree with you on, which is not unsurprising since we think the same way when it comes to this, um, I wasn't thrilled with how last Thursday went relative to that density bonus. Um, like I said before, th this wasn't springing on anybody. We've got the opportunity to get more density in exchange for something. At, at no point in time should we be giving away a, a single free square foot or a single free unit 
without something in return. Sarasota learned that lesson the hard way with, with Rosemary District. They increased the density from 25 units per acre to 75 units per acre just to spur it. They could have easily tacked on a 10 or 25% affordable housing component and had hundreds and hundreds of affordable units in Rosemary intertwined with, with the nice restaurants and the parks. They didn't do that. They let 1,800 units get built. They learned their lesson, and now to build in Rosemary, there is uh, an affordable housing component to get that density bonus. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Sarasota proved that being short-sighted is, is a bad way of doing business. We should not be also short-sighted. We've got these incentives on the books today. We need to be enforcing them immediately. And every time someone comes up on a land use meeting and request a single square foot of additional density, I'm gonna bring this up over and over and over again until we start learning our lesson and start setting proper precedent. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, we could do that by setting policy. So you can do that all you want, but if we set policy, uh, then the development community, the business community knows what we want. I mean, we can say it, but if only one commissioner says it, if we all support it like most of us, I think, do, in some shape or form, then we need to set a policy for that and um, and be ready for the, uh, the virtually everything that you're saying. We have to look at surrounding areas, the zoning, and we have the not in my backyard residents surrounding when we do this kind of thing. So I think us coming with a strong policy and letting the the citizens know we, we'd have a better chance of succeeding because we'll have a hundred people here in red shirts and everybody will change their mind. Um, Thank you, sir, for your comments. I don't know you, but I appreciate your comments. Um, the meeting was very, it was lawful. It was advertised eight days before versus 24 hours before. And that's all I'm gonna say with that. We need to get on with the business of this county. I'm sick of this. Uh, we're, you know, we all are working for the citizens and this other stuff needs to stop. So let's, uh, we got some good meetings coming up about, uh, I think it's impact fees today. Isn't it today? Yeah. Are you kidding? That, that, yeah. Impact fees and many, many other things that we need to. We've got to find an administrator. Um, we've got many other things that are important. So let's get to work and stop all this stuff. But I appreciate your comments publicly. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go next, and then it'll be Commissioner Bellamy. Um, Glenn, so you know, I've sent an email. Uh, I'm still waiting for a response on for profits. Uh, so that is on the list. I'm, I'm still waiting for information, and if I've received it, I've missed it somehow, but at any rate, I have requested it. Um, I am certainly glad to hear Commissioner Whitmore say that she thinks we need to move this county forward, and I can assure you I will help you in any way I can to accomplish that endeavor. I, I'm thankful that uh, commissioners now feel that we need to be doing that. I think it's very, very important, and it's what the citizens of this county want to see and that's why they voted for the people they voted for. So we, we have a job to do, and we need to do it. Commissioner Bellamy, you are next, sir. Yes, to my, to my, to my good friend, Mr. Cruz. Um, is it one of our goals as far as the affordable housing work session for us to make sure we come back with a policy that we're going to be able to vote on within right. this work session that we're having? Because if not, I think that's something that we need to lean toward mm -hmm. so we can make some, some um, progress in that direction, sir. Right. Well, I, I guess, but the stupid thing. I guess, but but the reality is, I, I could see maybe we need to quote unquote have policy, but this is literally in black and white already in our plan. The, all, the only policy you'd be setting is enforcing what's already on the books. Right. That, that, that seems like an odd policy to set to say, we've given you an opportunity to get density in exchange for uh, affordable housing, and our policy is we're going to enforce what we're already supposed to enforce. I don't know how that's a policy thing. That's just, you know, it's kind of like, just should be there anyway. But but to the extent we need to set policy to to read our plan and enforce it, then yes, I would like to set policy that we read and enforce the plan already on the books, yes. So maybe, and I'm not as in-depth as you are as far as it comes to affordable housing, but when we were talking about the Florida statute as far as um, for-profit and not-for-profit, I'm sure that's something that, that we will address at the work session also and see what our options are on, and do we need to set policy on that or we just follow the statute. I just want to make sure I understand it. That's two different work sessions because in April we have an all things housing work session. That's going to be the affordable housing. That's going to discuss density bonuses, things of that nature. If we can push it up, great. Uh, but that's a, next Tuesday is 
surplus land, and that's specific to that there are certain policies relative to what you do with surplus land, how you notice it, who you can sell it to, what the bidding process is. If you sell it to someone that's not, you know, going to use it for affordable housing or nonprofit, there's certain criteria in terms of where the funds go towards, and it's for. So I think we should all kind of. You know, if we have any information, maybe that can be passed around from a previous one or speak to Jerry and, and Denise about it and, and make sure we're educated on it because it is important. It, it's just it's a waste of our money, it's a waste of our time, and it's a waste of opportunity for resources for people like Glenn and everyone else in this community to, to do good things. <clears throat> Commissioner Satcher. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, if I understand... Uh, Mr. Jibalina, correctly, he's referring to the Erie Road uh, project, and I will just uh, express some agreement there. Um, I was surprised that that came up, and when I looked at it, I thought it'd be at least be a close vote, and I was disappointed that it was a six-to-one vote uh, because I do know that location, and that location is horrible for putting any extra bonus um, or any extra uh, lots on when we're where we are as far as with the safety and being able to take care of our community in that spot. That's the wrong spot for that project. And uh, I know it's a, you know, I went over it ad nauseum, um, okay. but I'll, I'll say it again. Um, and I also do want to say this on this talk about uh, affordable housing. That's something that I'm in favor of, I believe is necessary. We need to do that going forward. I do believe that we need to realize the real danger, and that is if you look at the county overall, where is their open land? It's going to be District 1. It's going to be my district. And, uh, and to say now, after every district is almost full, this is a future right. agenda, correct? Um, yeah. Commissioner Satcher, if I could just say one thing. Uh, we cannot, at this point, speak about anything that took place uh, in the land use meeting uh, in the last 30 days. So for 30 because days. Because it, it still could come before us again. So we need to be very careful on what we say at this point, please. So that's still in the potential okay. appeal period. Yeah, for somebody 30 to days. File an appeal. So <laughs> that is not something you would have known. We got it. So, um, you. Speaking on the future, and thank you for the, uh, for the direction. I appreciate it. Um, speaking for the future, we do need to at least consider that if we adopt an all or nothing, every single uh, high density project is approved uh, policy going forward, uh, that would have a disproportionate impact on District 1, uh, changing the character and nature of, of a huge uh, percentage of the county. District 1 is uh, much larger in size than any other area in the county mm -hmm. and uh, to start doing that would not be good I'm not saying I'm against affordable housing. I'm with Glenn and on a lot of his uh, You know ideas and with Commissioner Cruz So I'm not saying I'm against it, but we do need to consider that if every single project is district one after another after another um, that that creates a different uh, situation than what any other district has um, and would not be appropriate so I think that, uh, however, I think the goal of having places for people to live and workforce housing to have and to, uh, you know, be a part of the fabric of our community, that's a wonderful goal. So I want that to be a part of the fabric of the community. I don't want that um, to be the entire community. That's all I'm saying. And I think that that's uh, something that I want to plant the seed going forward um, just because I saw just because I was in a work session earlier and uh, and there were some concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. And that's why I just said, Mr. Cruz, not in my backyard, where we, that's why we have a policy, but maybe we need to have, um, you know, we need to look at what it is and see if it, if that's what we want, if we want to tweak it or whatever, but this is what you're going to see, and we've, I've been seeing it for years ever since I've been up here, is it's okay as long as it's not in your area. So what we're going to have to do is um, think about it, think about it, and look at our policies. And from your perspective and the staff's perspective, I want to see where you're both coming from. And I understand what James is saying because you have a lot of land, and that could happen in the future. But also we've got... Um, Lake Flores and um, the other one. Aqua. Well, we got Long Bar, but we are, or Long, yeah. Aqua, but we have the other one. Peninsula Bay. Yeah, Peninsula Bay, where it's major density, and that's all in West Bradenton, major, and it's kind of what you're talking about. So I think um, 
this is a broader discussion in the future, but we have to look at just what Commissioner Satcher just said, because that's what we're going to hear. And we've been hearing that for years, and that's kind of why we kind of probably deviated away and the building community decided that it didn't make sense to do that because it was not being able to get the projects and make, I guess, the bottom line that they wanted to, I'm assuming. All right, we're going to move on. I, I will just say, however, this is subject for a workshop. Um, and I can tell you that in my district, um, you know, it's come up several times. So it is something that we'll need to discuss. If we need to tweak it, we need to tweak it. Um, Commissioner Satcher, thank you for mentioning it. I'm going to go ahead now and uh, open uh, consent agenda items, c citizen comments. I have two cards. Uh, the first one is Andrea Griffin. You'll have three minutes, please. And so you know, I'm going to go ahead. It says she wants a full explanation of refunds totaling a half a million dollars. The public should know why these refunds are being provided. And she's talking about, I believe it's impact fees. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. So I was reviewing the agenda. Um, I'm happy that the agenda is coming out a little sooner. I know you guys are having some technical issues um, on the computer system. And uh, a lot of us were up until 11 o'clock trying to get some information, but we were able to get it. Um, anyways, um, so we had work sessions on how to tax us and how to regulate us um, in January. And now we are in February and looking at the agenda of giving about a half. I wasn't worried about the little thousand dollars and other stuff that uh, is also being refunded with this consent agenda. I'm only focused on um, four items. The four items are the Manatee Land Investor LLC, Matinami, uh, Tampa, Sarasota for 13,000, the Matinami, Sarah, if I'm saying it correctly, uh, Sarasota for the 35,000, and a Merrill construction billing adjustment of almost 30,000. Now, I do realize that you guys will most likely approve these and this will most likely be refunded to these people. I know that, coming in here. But what I do want is I want a full explanation because people like me, like the citizens of this county, are hearing on one hand, you guys want more money from us. And then on another hand, we see a half a million dollars just in one day being refunded back from the same exact account that you're wanting to fill with our money. So um, I just think it's, it's prudent and I think it's fair and not unreasonable for this um, board to pull these four items and explain to the people of this county why these, these refunds should be approved and refunded back to these people. Um, also on a side note, uh, we're all still Americans, so we still have rights, even with recommendations. So if you guys want to breathe, you are allowed to do so. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. I, I love that. Thank you, Andra. Uh, next one is Glenn Jubilina. I have five cards. On consent? Yeah. Uh, Glenn knows the rules. No, the rest of the ones that you have, Glenn, are not on consent. I'm sorry? No. No, it's not. Uh, He's got to get on the mic. trust me. He's got to get on the mic to dial all yeah. the board. Get up to the mic and uh, state your name, and I'll tell you what I have cards for you for. Number 37, Glenn Jubilina for the record. Okay, number 39, 37. 37, 36, and 38, I believe we agreed that that's what this is. Okay. That is none of those are on consent. None of those are None of those are on consent? No, sir. The only one I have for you for consent is item 12. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Refresh me You'll be me back up this afternoon. Don't you worry. Refresh me on 12. <laughs> wants to know what 12 is. Budget amendments. Budget amendments. Oh, FPLE. That, is that the uh, financial end of it? Yes. Okay, I'll talk about that. Okay. So somewhere in that budget was the agreement between... ESCO and FPL. Right. Mm -hmm. So, help me understand how does a healthcare fund finance six million dollars between new two nonprofit government agencies? How does the payback calculations that were done by ESCO and FPL, who are the energy experts, uh, miscalculate over forty percent of the back pay and savings? How does after five years in over $2.6 million short on repayments is the loan extended for another five years? 
That's a terrible policy. That's now how I want my tax money spent. The maintenance, you know, if, if, if the 2.6 million should have gone to renewable projects, we should have called that note in after five years. Sorry about the ESO, go back to Mama FPNL and take it up with them. FPNL, you need to write us a check for $2.6 million. Your five years are up and we need to continue on. It, it just blows me away. Who makes that decision that when we make a bad loan, we renew it for another five years? They're not gonna pay back this 2.6 million in another five years because they've miscalculated it to begin with. And who gave them the right to extend the loan? Who, who, makes, who makes that kind of bad decision? This is bad governance and unacceptable to the taxpayers. We're asking this board to remove all the contracts, sign off on them before they're ever put on the agenda, because it just seems to me every time it comes to the agenda, you guys just sign it off without really doing your homework. Um, so I, I don't know how a health fund pays for an energy project. Why don't you do that with affordable housing? Why don't you give us $6.2 million for affordable housing? Because I guarantee the, the payback would be a lot better than these guys. And for, as far as making interest, did you look at those rates? 0.02, ridiculous amount of, of uh, interest that they're paying back. This is a bad deal. This is bad government. Uh, whoever renewed that $2.6 million on a bad loan to begin with is, is not in the finance division whatsoever. Heads need to roll on that. I do not want my taxpayers' money renewed for another five years on a company that couldn't get it right to begin with. It's a bad, bad deal. You guys need to start checking over these contracts way before it gets to the dais for your John Hancocks. Good timing. What do you have, a timer up there? No, don't flatline, Glenn. Um, is there anyone from the public, anyone else that would like to come forward and speak on sent items? Is, do we have phone calls? Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead. 628-628, caller, please press star six to unmute. Please lay it off. Go ahead, caller. Hi, this is Caroline um, from Bradenton. Um, I'd like to comment about uh, the not in my backyard comment um, about um, integration of communities. I grew up born and raised in Chicago where we had projects that were all over. Well, we bulldozed all of them. It's just an idea. And we speckled our community so we could have integration of, you know, Caroline, black, white, brown. Caroline, I hate to interrupt you, but that is not on consent. That was a future agenda item with the permission of the board. I will go ahead and let her complete her statement. Yeah, her Is that okay? Her. All right. Okay, Caroline, go ahead. Sorry okay, to um, have interrupted Basically, you. I just wanted to say, it maybe if I could be involved when you guys do have further comment on this, is basically it's going to be so much better for the community to have integration in our community with affordable housing. In other words, we experience not in back, your, my backyard, like in Lincoln Park and some very risky areas like Sarasota, you know, um, Longboat Key, but we need it everywhere. We need it, we need it integrated in, in, into the community. And however that can happen, it's got to happen. Um, and then also I have, um, I don't know if you guys, you guys don't know about me. I recently moved here, but I'm in, I worked on Academy Award winning films and Emmy Award winning films for 30 years as a production designer in um, Los Angeles. So I would like to uh, propose a beautification plan for uh, Bellamy's district as well as all throughout um, Bradenton of murals um, that um, paid ode to African American artists um, in areas that frankly there's a lot of ugly areas all around Bradenton, not, I'm saying just Bellamy's area, but all around where we can get artists that do this free. And I was invited by Vanity Fair a couple of years ago to Miami uh, Art Expo. So I'm in touch. I work with two Academy Award winning African-American directors 
And so I know how to gather these artists and some of them will do them free. So when I talk about beautifying areas that need that, you know, to basically uplift the people that live there, um, believe it or not, it can do a lot for the people that live there. Um, so um, that's something that I would love on the agenda as well. Thanks. Thank you. Can we please get her last name? Uh, Caroline Perez. What's her last name? Perez. What's the last name? Perzan. Per Perzan. It's um, P-E-R-Z-A-N. And I would love to be a part of your committee in, in terms of doing that. My resume goes back 30 years. Like I said, I work with Spielberg, um, Steve McQueen, Lee Daniels. Lee, they're both African-American. Um, Steve McQueen won the Academy Award um, uh, for a feature film. Um, Thank you, Caroline. Ago. So I, Thank you very much. I want to be a part. <laughs> Thank you. That's all, Madam Chair. Any other phone calls? That's all of the calls we have. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Uh, I'm going to start off. I've got two other commissioners on the board. Um, Madam Administrator, I, I think we should probably make uh, an explanation on what was brought up about the return of impact fees. Would you like to kind of, and then, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to set up a meeting uh, with the citizen. But for the record and for the public, Public that's watching this. Can you Madam touch Chairman, base on that? Madam Chairman, I was going to pull items oh, is that okay. 9 and 12 for a brief presentation perfect. and then motion to approve the consent agenda minus items 9 and 12. That's perfect. Right, you didn't do that earlier, so I didn't know, but thank well, you for doing it's that. It's due to the public comment. Yeah, that's why. Okay. Never mind. Commissioner Serbia, do you have anything else to add before I go forward? Well, we, I, I made a I motion. I second the motion. Right. Thank you, George. Okay. okay. Sorry. We have a motion on the floor to pull items 9 and 12. Um, and gosh, yeah, we're and approve have to, the and to consent approve. agenda. And approve consent. Okay. Mm, that's really kind of weird. I have to open this to public comment. So is there anyone from the public that wants to come forward on this item, on this motion? No, the, Not no, seeing any. 11.30. What? I know. She made it. Just trust me. <clears throat> all right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's approved. Okay. Commissioner Satcher. So uh, in life, when you communicate something, sometimes it doesn't come across uh, the way you mean it. And, and we all... Uh, process things differently what we're hearing. Let me be clear, I'm talking about a tall apartment. Mm -hmm. at, oh, I can't talk about that topic? No. Oh my goodness, give me a but break. But you could talk about any apartment. Just in general. In general, in yeah. general, I think tall apartments or extra uh, people on at the end of, an un, of a road that might not be appropriate for it is a bad idea. I was not speaking am not speaking um, to my backyard, and I definitely, so far from my mind, was speaking about integration, completely uh, different. That, that's what the, the, the commenter was saying, that that was what we were talking about when we were talking about adding, uh, having a high density in apartments. So I just want to make it clear that that had nothing to do um, or, or whatever words she used had nothing to do with what I actually meant to be com uh, conveying at all. So, and I'm glad that no one else picked that up because that's not what I was saying. Mm -mm. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that, um, actually, is this on? I thought Caroline had a few good ideas. Um, mm -hmm. it's not on. I like her idea of some local art within the community. I thought that was a good idea. It instills a sense of community pride, neighborhood pride. Um, I don't think we need to restrict it to Reggie's district, but if he wants to start the ball. I know, I was jealous. <laughs> yeah, I've actually talked to our administrator about doing that in District 3. Um, some of the things she talked about, I might, she might see a bit of a challenge. I don't know how well she's going to do integrating Longbow Key. Um, <laughs> well, they're but very artistic. We're going to get some. Is it in my district? Sure. I don't know how much affordable housing she's going to manage to, to get out there. Um, but I did like the part about local art, so I wanted to at least give her props on that. Okay. All right. At this point, oh, well, Commissioner Whitmore. Nope. Sorry about that. That's okay. I um, just need to take they, 
You know, we did this years ago, for those of us that have actually been here, um, where we did the <coughs> the decorating of the, I want to say the chameleon. You all know what I'm talking about. It was on all the buildings in Manatee County. The geckos, yeah. the geckos all over the county, we did that. And I know in my city, at the skate park, we had um, a local kid do a mural on the on the bathrooms. And I've seen them um, in the city of Bradenton and Palmetto. They did the bus station, the transit station. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's good. Um, and somebody that's willing in the community that has experience, I hope, Caroline, if you're still listening, which I'm sure you are, that you contact um, Commissioner Bellamy and um, he could take the message to all of us. Um, if you want to, he off she offered to help you in your district, but we, you know, but we could also, whatever this program is, we could do it all over the county, whoever wants to do it. But, or, um, I, I would tell you to contact the administrator, but I don't know who it is yet. So um, oh I don't know what to do. Maybe send us an email and, you know, we can contact you. Uh, but there's really not anybody in charge right now. So you did mention Bellamy. So I would at least start there. Maybe he could have staff forward it to us. <laughs> Commissioner Bellamy. <laughs> Trust me, that's the last person that needs to be in charge. I know. <laughs> We're all working together. Um, Car Caroline is a talent. And um, she, she's very inspiring and she's motivated to make an impact, um, to make a difference wherever she, wherever she is. Um, we, I spoke with um, Celeste this morning about reaching out to communicate with her because we have some other things that we're talking about. Um, as those conversations go forward, if need be, um, some of that information will come back, come back to the board and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. But I don't necessarily think you know, everything about County beautification needs to go <laughs> needs to go through Bellevue. Bellevue <laughs> takes the lead of that. That is definitely going in the wrong direction. So. Forward it, to us. Yeah, uh, oh. Commissioner Cruz. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, all I'll say real quick about that is, if you want an example of what I think she's referring to, uh, go up to downtown St. Pete. I, I go up there a fair bit, and yep. just walking around those roads, you see the murals everywhere. everywhere. It's so much fun. You can spend the whole day just walking up and down those roads just to look at the different murals there. It, it really makes a, it, it a cool atmosphere there, and, and I'm 100% on board. That, that could be a, a really good thing, especially with some of our older buildings. It kind of spruces them up. It, it just makes it a, a more vibrant community, so I do like the idea. And, and you know, I'm going to add to that. I, I, don't, I don't know if this is a good thing or not to say, but I know Sarasota has quite a few murals, mm -hmm. you know, as well. So it does add a lot to old buildings, especially. Commissioner Bellamy. Right, and, and thanks for bringing that up, um, Commissioner Cruz, because I have um, actually saw those murals in Sarasota and in um, St. Pete, and I've actually had a, a tour with um, the CRA director, Palmetto, and that's some of the things that we want to bring um, to the table as far as murals when we're talking about the Palmetto Trails project um, to, to make sure some of the history in, in Palmetto can be captured and, and you know, the people that come behind us will know some of the things that have taken place. So the murals is a, is, is a great idea and a great start. And I'll follow up with that definitely. Thank you, sir. All right, at this point, that's the last commissioner that's on the board. We're gonna go ahead and take a 10 minute recess. <laughs>
I got a timer on that. Well, yeah, why don't you? All right, let's get back to it. We've got a fairly short agenda. Okay, so we have an 11 o'clock time certain. We have uh, two items that have been pulled that will be heard about 11.30. And then we'll go to recess for lunch at noon, come back at 1.30 for item 40. So that being said, we're a little bit ahead of our game. Give me one second here to get back to the agenda. Okay. So we can't go to time certain. Um, item number 37, we'll just go ahead and move forward. Authorization to bring forward capital improvement plan quarterly adjustments. Madam Administrator, who is going to handle yes, that Yes, um, Director Brewer will be presenting that. She's at the oh. podium and then some of the other directors as well. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Commissioners, Madam Administrator, County Attorney. I know, I think I almost need a little bump up so everybody can see me over the... You're short. I am, I am. Um, so this item before you is something that's been brought forward by Parks and by Public Works. And I've got, I'm going to put a, a PowerPoint up there. It has nothing new. It's just giving you the verbiage that was on your agenda so you can better look at it. So the point of this is that as we've moved through the year, there's some items that have come up that each of these departments have brought forward that they'd like to talk to you about so that you can be aware of it. Um, the goal of today is to answer questions, to have the departments answer questions. And then as you know, next Tuesday, the 16th, we're gonna have an all day budget work session. And in the afternoon, we'll be going over CIP and we'll be going over specific cash flows. So that way, they're just bringing forward these items that are imperative that they feel now. And then on the 16th, we'll be showing you cash flows and also items that they've brought forward for future years so that you can review that and then give us feedback and direction which way to go. So with that, let's see if I can make the world work. Um, there are five items that are on your agenda today. Um, for two from Public Works, which is a discussion on Canal Road and US 301, widening, widening a portion of it. State Road 70 at Post Boulevard. And then for Parks and Natural Resources, there are three new things, GT Bray Dive Well, GT Bray Pool Decking, and Clemens Aquatics. So if the board is okay with it, I'd like to go ahead and give you a brief of each one and then have the department yeah. director um, come I up. think what we're going to have to do, we do have an 11 o'clock, so what we're going to have to do, you've got about 10 minutes. So, Jan, if you could present, and then we'll have to okay, come back. probably go to 11 o'clock. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The first one is Canal Road at US 301 and US 41. It is an existing project. The increase in the project would be 638089 and it would be an FY22, so that's in your next year CIP. The funding source would be Northwest Road Impact Fees, and an update to the project scope, scope is as followed. Design and construct four travel lanes between US 301 to north of 17th Street East, including the realignment of Mendoza Road connecting 37th Street East to 39th Street East at Canal Road. And again, the funding for that, we'll go over in the cash flow when we're there next week. This is just to make you aware. The next project is State Road 70 at Post Boulevard. It's a temporary traffic signal. This is completely new. It is a project increase of 277,800. Proposed funding source would be Southeast Road impact fees and a description of the project as follows. Design and construct a temporary traffic signal at State Road 70 and Post Boulevard intersection. Construct pedestrian ramps and crosswalks. Temporary traffic signal will be a diagonal span wire design and provide wireless communication to connect traffic signal to the county's central signal system software. Those are the two for public works. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to keep going forward? Um, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay. The next section comes from Parks and Natural Resources. The first one is the existing GT Bray dive well. The project cost is estimated at 1.5 million. 
The funding source proposed is Parks Reserve, and a description of the project is as follows. Remodeling the existing pool to exclude it as a dive well and to convert it to a shallow learn to swim pool lesson pool. And the director would have to expand on that. I'll just keep going so I can get through them. The next one is GT Prey Pool Decking. The project cost at the current time is undetermined and the funding source would, would be Parks Reserves. Description as follows. A study completed by Artiman and Associates, Inc. on August 6 concluded that the finding of a structural failures associated with subsurface soil weakness and they're expected to continue without removal or re and replacement of the existing soil and decking. A design firm would need to be hired to prepare a repair strategy for the decking issues. That's number two. The last one is Clemens Aquatics. Project cost is undetermined. The funding source again would be Parks Reserve and a description of the project. The pump room is failing with underground voids and need to be repaired and replaced. A construction manager would need to be hired to facilitate the repairs in accordance with the plans and specifications. So those are the overall five projects. Again, it is just asking the board to be aware of them. They can and ask any questions of the directors. Again, we'll go all over the cash flows next week so you can see, we'll highlight those in there so that way you can make whatever determination you want. If you are in agreement with these, then the next option after we have the 16th meeting, we'd bring it back as a BA to bring it into the current year, the ones that need it. And with right. that, that's the update. Thank you, Jan. Um, just out of curiosity, Chad, you, it's about, uh, you've got about nine minutes before 11 o'clock. Can you get through those two items in that amount of time, sir? She's doing a great job cleaning that mic. Thank you. Yes, uh, Chad Butso for the record, Public Works Director. Any questions that you had, the highlights that Jan provided were very accurate. Canal Road is a long-lived, uh, unfortunately not much action, IST project, but it was an entire project from 301 to 41. We're aggressively approaching it to put it into phases to make it much more constructible. The most urgent need is between 301 and 17th. It's at that same time we also were considering, uh, because of 17th already to the west, back to 41 already being a four lane road and the exploding growth in that area and that intersection where we're very soon gonna be putting in the temporary signal, finally got our DOT permit, so much progress in the next 30 days will show up there to change the scope from our easy to wait. Uh, we already have made a previous land deal with a uh, developer in the area, uh, so the right of way is there, but we didn't officially have it within the project scope to do the uh, realignment and include it. The intent would be to signalize that intersection uh, at that time and provide another one of those good quality east-west connections in the county. Um, uh, Commissioner Whitmore, are your questions in reference to public works at this point? We'll come back to park. Questions were regarding what Jan presented, but I didn't get a chance to say anything, but I'll wait. I, I want to... Mine's regarding the Clemens Aquatics. Okay, thank you. But I did your, ask it for Jan. Thank so. you for your assistance. Uh, I guess I'm next on the board. Um, I do have one question, uh, Chad. On that temporary signal light, we will get re reimbursed from DOT, is that correct? Or what's happening with that? And there's gonna be a roundabout that goes there eventually there at State Road 70. That location that on 70 is not one of the ones that's currently planned for the roundabout. Okay. Recently, they acknowledged that it would qualify for a signal and actually approached us to improve the situation where they are programming within that uh, project that has the multiple roundabouts in it. They are planning to add to that scope a permanent signal for that intersection. And we're essentially, we will work with you and try to speed you along through your permit process if you're willing to put in the temporary signal. So for the improvement to the area, most people know that intersection is post road to the north, Greenbrook East is what I call it, the east leg of Greenbrook. So it's uh, uh, Greenbrook West already has the signal. This one is there. Our timing of wanting to bring it forward now is to uh, try to be there for the fall sports as we're coming out of COVID and Premier really uh, starts to ramp up and 
see if we can even make it for some of the summer schedule. Yeah, and the reason I asked that question is because I know, you know, DOT did a presentation and went out to the public, and they were having, it was like seven total either traffic lights or roundabouts. That's why I was asking. So in this case, they weren't offering to reimburse, but they were say, acknowledging it would just be this uh, temporary. Uh, it's going to be in place for several years, but uh, they will build the final uh, complete signal when they do that project. Okay. All right. I don't have any other questions. No other commissioners on the board. This will be coming back to us um, on two, next Tuesday. Is that correct? It'll be included in that discussion. And this is just talking about the topic. The action item is still the BA that Jan has to bring back for both of these uh, items. So this is talking to you in detail about uh, we see these as uh, things that we are already working on and we're seeing what your uh, priorities are, recommending these adjustments, and then we'll follow back up with the uh, detail of the budget amendment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Charlie, you got like five minutes. Can you handle it? No. Sorry, I don't think so. I know these are. I have a question also. No, that's, that's fine. And, and thank you for your. your... Uh, well, I, I can talk about the dive well just now. We might be able to go on the other okay. issues. All right. And then you can come back after our 11 o'clock yeah. or 1130. Actually, after lunch. Yes. Yeah. And this does not address our Olympic pool uh, for lap lane swimming. This is a dive well next to it that's 14 feet deep. Um, and it's 40 years old. And these are the kinds of underground, uh, unforeseen st uh, problems that begin smallly, elevate to large problems, still sight unseen. And you get to the point where repairs of this magnitude far exceed our budgeted R&R accounts throughout the year. This is exactly what reserves, I believe, are, are, are necessary for, to be able to have an amount to these very large capital items. You know, this is an asset for the community, and our business is learn to swim, not so much learn to dive. And when it comes to our abilities to serve the, our members, our walk-in customers, uh, who want to have those swim lessons, at the moment, we're relegated to use an Olympic-sized pool probably using 20% of its capacity while 80% lies unused. We can't have lap swimming while we're having learned to swim or other prog programs. It's a hugely underutilized asset. If we convert the dive well to a learn to swim pool by shallowing it up and incorporating it with our whole system, that's a better use of resources. It's a capture of an underutilized asset to, to bring in more capability, allows us to use the Olympic pool in a, in a much more efficient way and really uh, of the options that we evaluated, which was to repair it to another dive well or re reduce it to a, like a splash park, this option falls right in the middle of those costs and is really the way to go, we believe, for the GT Bray pool experience. And Charlie, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have you come back on the rest of it, so I apologize for that, but right. we have that time certain. Commissioner Whitmore, did you want to ask a question uh, right quick? Yeah, well, Charlie's here, and I, I called Charlie last night, and I've also spoken to Sherry about it. When you look at both pools, Clemen is in worse shape than um, GT Bray. Even though you can't use the dive well right now, Clemen has structural issues underneath, and the pump house is ready to go. Yes. So my preference was, and I told Charlie I was going to ask this, that this go first. This is, to me, more pressing, and it doesn't look like we have a funding source for it. We've done a lot at GT Bray, but this has actual structural issues that we need to take care of, not just because we want to make it into a splash park or learn to swim. This has a pump house that's failing and some compromise under the pool. Yeah. Madam Chair, my favorite quote from Yogi Berra is, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. <laughs> I believe there's sufficient funding in the reserves to do both simultaneously what to serve our communities. What reserves? The parks, the parks reserves that Jan can uh, detail in a minute. Uh, with her report. Okay. Okay, I just want to um, make sure it gets done first. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I would uh, defer to Charlie's opinion that we have enough in reserves to do both. And I would also 
just plea to the board that uh, we made a commitment to GT Bray and to the residents of District 3 in West Bradenton. It's um, sort of the, Bray is sort of the heart. It's, it's a great mm -hmm. uh, euphemism for West Bradenton, right? West Bradenton has great bones and it's a great place to live, uh, but it's aging. Mm -hmm. And GT Bray is a perfect example of that. Really, it's, it has fantastic bones. It's right in the middle of our district and it is aging and it, it, needs, some, it needs revitalization. Commissioner Johnson started the revitalization of GT Bray. It's coming a long way. Uh, and I don't want to do a half-hearted effort. Don't don't leave us sort of hanging. Let's let's complete the the project and and fulfill the commitment to District Three with GT Bray. So I ask the board to approve this. Thank you. Actually, that's what I thought we were doing. To be honest, um, <clears throat> Commissioner Servia. Yes. Um, thank you, Charlie, for the explanation, and thank you both commissioners for your comments. Um, I just want to point out that I'm thankful that we have those reserves in the Parks and Rec budget to act quickly mm -hmm. and repair the structural problems and convert this dive well <coughs> to a learn to swim pool. And that's how we remain very nimble and we move quickly. So just pointing that out for a future discussion on reserves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, um, Charlie, we'll come back. Thank you John. so much. No, there's still, we've got to talk more about Clemens. Um, all right, we're going to go to the 11 o'clock time certain. Um, Sherry, if you would like to move us forward on yes, that. Yes, Madam Chairman, um, Director Jake Sauer is coming towards uh, Mike as well as Deputy County Administrator Karen Stewart. Today you'll get an update on the uh, current vaccine and testing process as well as the under the emergency rental assistance program. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Jake Sauer for the record, Director of Public Safety for Manta County. <clears throat> Just going to remind everyone, all the data included in this presentation is produced based off the most recent information available in the Florida Department of Health and the ACCA databases, or as it was reported directly to public safety from local hospitals. In Manta County, there have now been 28,929 residents to test positive for COVID-19, which unfortunately includes 508 confirmed fatalities. This is an increase of almost 900 new cases since February 2nd when I last provided a public briefing on the situation. In the last week, the percentage of tests that come back positive is 5.8%, which is a good size decrease from the last week when it was 8.1%. Mm -hmm. Mates County EMS has seen fewer delays at local hospitals, and I would like to thank hospital leadership for working together to address these issues. Mm -hmm. EMS staff will continue to monitor call volume, hospital capacities, and COVID patient counts closely and share this information with our partners. The Manta County Emergency Operations Center remains at a level two partial activation for the COVID-19 response and will continue to field any urgent requests from partner organizations for equipment, personnel, or other required resources. On slide three, the graph shows the number of new positive cases per date, as well as a seven day average, which smooths out outliers in the data to show a trend. Since the second week of January, a significant decrease in the number of new positive cases being reported has occurred, which we certainly welcome. In the graph on slide four, the bars represent the percentage of tests that are positive for COVID-19 each day since September, and the line is a seven-day running average. Like in terms of new positive cases, there was a spike around the holidays when people were traveling, but there has been a recent and relatively significant downward trend for percent positive as well. For this variable, 10% is a threshold established by the Florida Department of Health as an important benchmark to not cross, and again, Manatee County has not exceeded that threshold since January 28th more signs of improving conditions. Slide number five provides data surrounding COVID-19 in our local hospitals and ICUs. There has been a noteworthy decrease in the number of people in Manatee County hospitals and ICUs since January, when there was as many as 102 COVID positive patients in hospitals and 20 positives in ICUs. Those same numbers have reached as low as 65 in hospitals and four in ICU in January, and that's an approximate 40% reduction. Public safety will continue to engage with and assist our hospitals with any unmet needs through our healthcare work group. 
The purpose of this slide is to remind everyone that we are operating fully within the scope of state and federal guidelines that has been released to date. The Governor's Executive Order 20-315 limits the population groups that can be vaccinated to include only those persons 65 and older, those in long-term care facilities, and frontline health care personnel. Under the, uh, under the order, hospital providers also may vaccinate those they deem to be extremely vulnerable to COVID-19. However, to date, hospitals locally have received no additional vaccine doses to be able to do that. <clears throat> Through an emergency public health advisory issued recently, Resident re residency restrictions were also implemented by the Florida Department of Health. And going forward to be vaccinated, people must either provide proof that they live in Florida at least part-time or prove that they are a frontline health care worker who is providing medical services locally. To date, Manta County has administered 24,346 shots, whether Pfizer or Moderna. That's at via points of distribution at Tom Bennett Park and our public safety center. The number of vaccines administered each day continues to rise as we improve processes and the state has begun to ship more to us each week. A number of other partners have administered vaccines as well, including our local hospitals, MCR Health through the Region 6 Incident Management Team and via CVS and Walgreens who vaccinate residents of long-term care facilities. Between their efforts and what we have accomplished at our pods, there have been 32,842 residents of Manatee County who have received at least one dose of the vaccine so far. We continue to encourage our residents to sign up to the, with the vaccination registration pool where residents 65 and older are randomly selected to be vaccinated whenever new shipments of vaccines are received here in Mancy County. To date, over 119,000 unique users have signed up for the pool, but since couples are allowed to sign up together, this actually represents over 186,000 individuals in the pool. There was an initial surge in signups the first few days that the site launched, but since then, web traffic has remained steady and the site has functioned as planned. To sign up, the public should visit www.vax.myminity.org or call 311 if you need assistance with the registration process. And I want to stress that, again, we're still in a marathon and not a sprint. And we have seen a peak in signups using the vaccine waiting pool. And as we continue to vaccinate those from the pool, we have seen the pool decrease uh, of those waiting to be vaccinated. Staff continue to work long hours to ensure the sites are efficient and effective, but until we get additional allotments of vaccines, the process may take longer uh, than we want. I want to take a second to recognize the large groups of people involved in these vaccination operations and all the hard work that they have been putting in. A team effort uh, definitely is required when we talk about a vaccine distribution program in Amanda County. We're lucky to have one of the best, as I continue to tell you. I just highlighted a few here today as there are countless others involved in the vaccination efforts from the Medical Reserve Corps, Department of Health, Mina T, to these groups listed here on the slide. There are countless partners all pitching in to get these vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. The county's allotment of first dose vaccines was the same this week as it was for last week, which is 6,100 doses, and we anticipate this to remain the same for the next week or two going forward uh, per the state. This week, vaccination operations will take place each day from Wednesday to Friday at Tom Bennett Park, where 1,700 doses will be administered daily. On Thursday, we will also have 1,025 people come to the Public Safety Center to receive their second dose. MCR Health received an additional 1,000 doses, conduct more targeted uh, vaccinations in the underserved communities as well. <clears throat> The Federal Retail Pharmacy Program is a collaboration between the federal government and several different pharmacy networks that aims to increase access to COVID-19 vaccinations across the United States. As I notified you yesterday afternoon, 18 Manatee County pharmacies will be a part of this program, which could begin receiving vaccines as soon as Friday. If the vaccines are distributed evenly to all the pharmacies in the network, it will equate to approximately 384 vaccines per pharmacy per week moving forward. This adds almost an additional 7,000 new doses to vaccine, uh, to those wanting the vaccine, uh, to assist also the Department of Health in Manatee County as we receive our initial 6,100 each week. I want to emphasize that these numbers and the timeframes very, very well might change, but this is what the initial guidance provided, us by, provided to us by the state and federal government looks like, and I wanted to make sure to keep you all informed on the most up-to-date information. And with that, I can take any questions that you might have. Okay, I'm first on the board, and then there's three others so far. Um, Jake, 
you know, we're getting an awful lot of emails, as you're aware. <clears throat> and thank you for your assistance, by the way, on all of that. You and Dr. Bensey both, um, and the, the administrator. Um, yeah, I'm curious. A lot of people feel that because of the lottery system that it's really not fair to so many of our seniors that signed up, you know, initially mm -hmm. uh, for the program. And I understand that Sarasota has changed how they do things. Can you kind of give us an idea? And I know at one time you had mentioned to me that after the state program got up and running, that if it looked like it was being successful and not crashing every time we turned around, that perhaps we might change over to that. What are your thoughts? Where are we on that? If you could yeah, so there's point. a couple of um, different things I can explain with that. I'll, I'll touch on the state system first. The state system to date uh, has not demonstrated an ability to handle the influx that it, it would take uh, in, a, in a type of situation in this county. They also do things completely different than both Manatee and Sarasota County do. Uh, in, in Manatee County, we do a vaccine waiting pool and randomize those pulled from the list and select those for appointments. In Sarasota, they do everything almost the same as we do except for it's a first in, first out type system. The state system uh, would completely take over that operation. We would tell them how many doses for, for the next pod system that we were to operate. So to say, if we're gonna start on Wednesday this week, we would tell them 1,700 doses, um, 200 an hour, and they would start making appointments. The problem is when they open up those appointments, the person still has to go into that system and select that system. So it requires them to be around a computer to select that appointment as soon as they open it which I do not believe we want to go back to, in my opinion. Um, Sarasota does do a first in, first out. That's how they operate. We talk consistently with Sarasota County, Sarasota County Department of Health. Uh, we both agree there's pros and cons to both systems. I think um, off the record kind of talking, Sarasota wishes You're they right would have. right now not off I know, the record. I understand so, that. Okay. Um, Sarasota okay. sometimes wishes they could have done <laughs> the, uh, the randomized system because it really does equal out the playing field for those needing to get the vaccine. So they, they have uh, the same amount of number of persons in their registration system as well. However, if you're 188,000, you know you're not going to get a vaccine anytime soon. Right. In a randomized system, you know when we pull those, uh, you could possibly receive a vaccine. Uh, I, and thank you for that, but I think <laughs> I, for me the question is, for those that really felt that it was important to sign up immediately, you know, a lot of them have not been called and they don't know when they will. Whereas that is the complaint and I understand it and I sympathize with mm -hmm. people. If you're 185,000 and you get called before the first 10, you know, that signed up, that's, you know, that is questionable. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would, I would really love to have you come forward and give me more information, me personally, more information on that because I don't know that that's really fair to everyone that has already signed up, you sure. know, that's having to wait. I mean, I, I don't know how we can really, you know, if you have 180,000 people, you know, the, and you've got the last 10,000, well, when did they sign up and why did they wait so long to sign up? So, you know, those are questions there that I think we, are being asked, I, at least I know I am. I'm getting the emails all the time and you see them, Jake, and thank you for helping me with those. But yeah, I, I do, um, you know, I, it, I do think it it's is important to those that reach out that we, you know, I've been contacting them and helping answer their questions as well. Um, I, I'll get with the team to, to uh, figure out uh, some information to give to you so that you have that on hand as well. And then we can definitely further discuss that. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, um, next is Commissioner Servia. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for that question. That was going to be one of my questions, and I appreciate the response. Also, Jake, you know, I don't think there is a perfect system, so let's all realize that um, no matter what the system, there will be people who are not happy because everyone wants a vaccine right away. So, uh, but thank you very much for, for the reply. It is something we hear a lot about. Um, another question that I hear is why has Sarasota County vaccinated more people than Manatee County, Jake? 
and I know that we have talked about that, but for the benefit of the public, could you please answer that? Yeah, so uh, much like the testing system that, that is in place with the state of Florida and how they report those who got tested and those who become positive, uh, vaccinations fall under that same type of category. So if, if you are vaccinated at the Tom Bennett Park, but you live in a different county, uh, that, that subset gets reported in that county. So uh, when you talk about Sarasota County, they, they have an ability to vaccinate between 1,000 and 1,500 at their current walk-in site now. Uh, Manatee County has the ability to vaccinate up to 3,000 per day using both of our sites. Um, we've, we've certainly vaccinated um, as many as possible uh, when we talk about the Tom Bennett Park and the Public Safety Center sites. But when you look at the Florida Department of Health vaccine uh, report, that, that is reporting on those who got vaccinated by their home address. So I do not believe uh, when you talk about Sarasota and Manatee, who's been more um, vaccinated, it's not because of the, the production the pods are, uh, producing, it's because it's it's reported in, in what county they live in. Yes, and that's really important to understand because people are trying to increase their odds of a vaccine, and so they register as some people in four, five, or six counties, mm -hmm. and then they travel to where they can get the vaccine first, and then, as you said, it's reported back that a Manatee County resident got vaccinated. Correct. So um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I also have heard a number of times asking why the city of Sarasota recently, I think has promised or received 7,000 vaccines and Manatee County can't get a number that large. Could you address that? Yeah, so uh, we tried to find out from the state uh, exactly that same question on our state call yesterday. We've sp spoken with uh, Sarasota County as well. Uh, Sarasota, the city of Sarasota ha is prepared, if they were to receive those vaccines, to run an operation at the Van Wazel Performing Arts Center. Uh, according to state officials, no, no vaccinations um, have been allotted to that system yet. Uh, and, and I don't know when, if, if any, would be allotted to that system yet. Thank you for clarifying that. And then my last question is, um, I post the daily numbers um, out there on my social media. And I have had the question, why is the uh, AHCA data for ICU numbers and COVID counts being used sometimes? Yeah, so the, the ACA data yes. that we report in our, on our daily dashboard is the most reliable data because sometimes as hospitals get busy, our local hospitals, they can't report uh, to us in a timely fashion. And I don't believe... Um, not reporting that information because we didn't receive it, uh, that, that could skew that data. So we, were, we report the ACA data directly from the Florida Department of Health and ACA. Thank you for that. All right, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, please. Hey, Jake, um, 186,000 in the pool. How many seniors over 65 do we have in Manatee County? <laughs> That's good a good question. question. I, do, I do not know. 100. Yeah, I thought it was right around 100,000. Yeah. Do we know if there's, I mean, obviously some are from out of town, right? But do we know if there are any um, duplicate registrations? There are duplicate registrations, <laughs> and the IT team is going in every day to try and find those duplicate sure. duplicates and, and take them out of the system. But, um, People should also know that if there is a duplicate, if I registered as Kevin Van Austin Bridge and then went it back in and registered as Kevin Charles Van Austin Bridge, once I'm vaccinated, I'm not going back for round two, right? So, you know, both, both by, you know, names will be pulled out mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, we have noticed that um, some people have gone into the system. It would be K Van Austin Bridge, sure. Kevin Van Austin Bridge, uh -huh. um, Kevin V. Um, okay. So that, those are hard to, to, to try and find, to take out of the system. I will tell you, though, that <clears throat> as we continue to schedule appointments, what we're starting to see is we've reached our peak. That number goes down as we schedule those appointments. They're taken out of the system. So we're starting to see a downward trend, which is a good, is a good trend to be in. Those that are getting uh, uh, selected and those are also, we're starting to see when we call some of those, they've already been vaccinated in other areas. So, uh, and I expect to see that continue to drop as, as uh, these 18 pharmacies get back, get online and start scheduling their own vaccines as well. Um, so. That, that's something we, we're definitely, uh, we're on the right path, you right. know, for, um, since we stood it up until about last, uh, early last week, 
that number was still rising. People were still getting into the pool. Now we're seeing the pool start to go back down. So sure. And as far as the the system that we're using, I, I like Commissioner Baugh and Serbia. I get a lot of heat about that as well. It is fair. The people who have been selected, obviously, they're over the moon. They write me and tell me this is the best system. Manatee exactly. County is the greatest. Uh, those that haven't been selected write me and tell me what an idiot I am. Um, <laughs> me too. So, yeah. So, I mean, but I feel like if we were to go back, if we were to leave the lottery system, we would go back to a registration. It, 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 we're back to, you know, toilet paper at Winn-Dixie again, right? It, you're going to have this mad rush, like it's Black <laughs> Friday every time. And um, I, I don't think that's that's the direction we want to go. Yeah. Um, so it isn't, like you said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Just, you know, let's all just keep beating legislators over the head for more vaccines. And I mean, I do. I call them every week. Yeah. You know, it's me mm -hmm. again. They, I'm surprised they still answer. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you know, Jim Boyd told me he has COVID and he's at home. And I said, well, <laughs> he's in his apartment. And I said, well, buddy, I'll be calling all the time now. I know you have nothing else going on. Yeah, he's, so he's not. He can, he can keep lobbying for more he vaccines. Can't get it. <laughs> anyway, I, I appreciate the work you're doing. And it's a marathon. Just stay the course. Thank you. Um, one, one other thing real quick um, that you reminded me of. One of our pain points is 311 operators mm -hmm. um, trying to schedule those appointments. So uh, as they call back, I've, I've heard from um, constituents, from, from your constituents as well, that uh, they miss those phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't get to the phone quick enough. Uh, they try to call back into the system. They have to wait for our second call. That's, that's always been a pain point. When you're scheduling 1,700 a day, and, and 30 operators working feverishly to get all those appointments filled from the vaccine waiting pool. We feel we could do that faster. Uh, Sar Sarasota County uses a system known as Everbridge, and that's a mass notification system. We also use Everbridge during hurricanes and disasters to put out mass notifications. They have a COVID-19 product that they've built that Sarasota County has been using. Uh, we've been partnering with them to assist us with those schedules as well. Uh, we've been in testing and evaluation this week, and if all that goes well, then I think another good benefit for uh, our constituents, your constituents, sorry, is uh, moving to this Everbridge scheduling system that will text them, call them, and also send an email, and they can have up to two hours to respond instead of trying to catch that phone call right away. So I think that's going to help them as well uh, when we get that system online and running. And Mondays are when we're notifying people. Is that correct? Is that yeah. Yeah, so be the case. The state's starting to get into a good rhythm now that they'll let us know late Friday afternoon. Our team meets Friday afternoon after the state notifies us what what our allotment looks like. We we start to plan the next week's drive-throughs, uh, and then Monday mornings typically is when those allotments show up. Then we go ahead and start scheduling. Okay, so people don't have to sit there, you know, every single day, 24 hours a day, like they're waiting for the prom date, you know, call to come. They, they can just. You know, Monday is the only day you have to worry about it. Well, we'll, we'll, we start Wait, scheduling on Monday, old. but because yeah. that, that's such labor intensive, it, it takes us all the way up to Wednesday to, oh, up to, to, Wednesday. to, to okay. schedule well, Friday. Scratch that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we could be calling, you know, Monday through yeah. through Wednesday. And what is that number? 742-4300. Okay. Right. You got one commissioner that keeps looking at her phone, just so you know. Uh, commissioner Whitmore. Well, um, it, and also some people tell me it says Manatee County on it too, but I, I talked to a lady named Elizabeth for over an hour yesterday and um, about this, you know, their rationalizations and um, why they <clears throat> think that we should do it differently. I'm glad to hear what Kevin said. And then I, I spoke to Dr. Dolan's dad, who's 95, for about an hour last night, um, thinking that the pool isn't um, fair. My husband and I signed up the second day it started, and we haven't been called yet. And then uh, we signed up in Sarasota two weeks ago. So, and we were number 120,000 two weeks ago. So, you know, which is more fair? I know that I'm never going to get called in Sarasota for a long time when they're doing 1,000 to 1,500 a day. And that's not to talk forever. bad about Sarasota. They're doing, they're doing an excellent job, too. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I did it in both because I know many people that have gone in different counties to, see, mm -hmm. to increase your odds. And now that our pharmacies are going to be allowing it, that's another option. Um, but I did want to um, uh, also say I gave shots. I gave vaccines Friday. And then I also put three cases of syringe and needles together because you actually got to assemble everything to do these vaccines. And it was a well-oiled machine. And if you're in, in my world, you don't get much positive. But my God, people were crying. They were so happy. Uh, the funny thing is, is when you're, I was on the passenger side, 
when the person wanted the shot in the left arm versus the right. And these women and men would just flip over in the car because you can't get out of your car so we could give the um, vaccines. But uh, it was probably the most rewarding thing I've done. Well-oiled machine, no stopping. I met a, a bunch of nurses from the Department of Health. I think that's where one lady was, um, one girl was from Fort Myers, and then they were all over. And they worked so hard. But I have to give credit, um, paramedics uh, at the beach, they were um, mixing vaccines all day, and uh, South Manatee Fire, he was there mixing vaccines, and I was assembling the syringes, and then I gave vaccines. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, MCR, it's a targeted vaccines. What does that mean? Because I have so many people that are asking me, where else can I go? Do you not have to be their patient to get that targeted vaccine? Do you do not have to be their patient to get the, the targeted vaccine? That's a partnership with the Florida Department of Health Manatee and MCR. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, uh, he is working to target uh, underserved populations. I know okay. 13th Avenue, um, Palmetto Youth Center, Rabonia Parish, Got it. those types of areas. Okay, well, that's good to know. And also, 5,100 vaccines we get, and then you mentioned about 11 or 1,200 second doses. Does that come out of that 5,100? No. Oh, it's on top of it. Yes. Oh, great. And then, um, and then that's done at the EOC building, the second dose. It could be done. This week it is done at the Public Safety Center. When we have large days and we're doing 1,700 to 2,000 a day at Tom Bennett, it's easier to do those at Tom Bennett Park as oh. well. Uh, this is a smaller day, so that will be performed at the Public Safety Center. I always ask this because so many uh, people still are kind of well, what we hear is some people are leery still. But what I, what I was surprised at all the people, the thousands that are showing up that aren't leery. But what kind of major reactions have you had? Have you had anything yet that you had to transport anybody or give uh, epinephrine or something? We've had uh, two that I'm aware of that needed uh, medical intervention, uh, allergic reaction. Okay. And now the second dose is where you're seeing a lot more flu like symptoms. And a lot of people that I'm talking to, if, uh, even some physicians, got very sick, had to cancel their patients because they actually got the flu. I mean, you, they've got the virus in them, and your body's really trying to fight it. But nothing major, right, on the second dose? We have seen on the second dose you can exhibit some symptoms after getting that uh, vaccine. We do not know of any that have lasted more than 12 hours. That and also that. I tried to refer some people to, I heard, the hospitals. And I know you're saying they don't have vaccines, but the hospitals have been given permission to give them to their high-risk patients or to the public besides their health care workers? Un under the governor's executive order, 20-315, there is a last line in there where hospitals that deem patients uh, medically necessary to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, they can give those. Uh, unfortunately, they do not have any vaccines to give. Our local hospitals do not have any vaccines to give out to those type of, type of persons yet. And do you project any more than 5,100? Because the setup you have at... Um, at Bennett Park is like, I know, what do you think you could handle? I, I heard somebody say like 10,000. Well, we can uh, comfortably handle 2,000 at Tom Bennett Park a day, uh, a little bit more than that, probably 23 to 2,500 if I asked the team. Um, <coughs> could extend the hours to that type of operation. So, you know, 2,500, 2,000 a day, you know. Yeah. Where it comes gets tricky is scheduling oh, first sure. doses and then in 28 days, uh, trying to fit in second doses as well. Um, but I, I don't anticipate our, our allotment going up uh, significant, significantly okay. this month at all. Commissioner Whitmore, I'm going to Done. interfere at this point. Not we done. have three, just a minute, just hear me out. We have two minutes until 1130, and we have another commissioner on the board that has not spoken. Almost done. Okay, uh, please, that's what I wanted you to be aware of. Thank talking, you, please. move on. Um, no, I'm not going to, I don't appreciate no? you cutting me off and being rude. I'm done. Okay, good. Commissioner Satcher. Um, Jake, at this point, is there any plan for the uh, mobile units? So we're meeting with uh, phase one, B, with our team for phase one B, and then uh, moving into phase two of this and what that's going to look like for Manatee County and our team. Unfortunately, because uh, there's such still a high demand uh, for the vaccine, it's just not feasible for us to take allotments from what would be the mass vaccination site here at the county and start doing smaller 100, 200 doses. The state IMT team is available for that. We continue to send them locations to operate those types of community drives. 
but I, I still feel because the demand is so high and, uh, and the numbers in the, in the COVID vaccine waiting pool is so high, uh, our, best, our best avenue right now to get as many shots in arms is still at uh, using the Tom Bennett Park Tom site. Bennett, which is proven amazingly effective. Okay, and then the state team that you're talking about, that is outside of our allotments. You're asking the state to consider a location so, do it. so how that works is, is we give them community locations that they can uh, use uh, to, to vaccinate in the community. When they come in, they say they're ready and we're gonna hit this one. We've, we've um, worked with the, the park manager or the church manager. Those allotments do come out, they, they come straight from us. Oh, they do, okay. Um, the 5,100 and then we had 1,000. Um, is that 5,100 plus 1,000 or 5,100? 6,100 and then 1,000 goes to MCR for the, the community vaccinations. And the MCR, um, is that also the 65 plus or is that regardless? Yes, they still follow the, the, 65 plus. the governor's so guidelines. Serving the same at risk yes. uh, that the governor has said is, needs to be Correct. priority. Okay. And then, um, well, and then we've got the standby pool people. We've spoken about that. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate that, that there doesn't, there's not a great option just because there's not enough right now. Um, the, and I will just point out that when people were doing first come first serve, uh, we had elderly people sitting out in the sun, in the heat, in chairs. Uh, you know, we had people emails, you know, we get one to two maybe a day right now with this system. I remember much more when we were trying to do first come first serve and the system was crashing and it was and there was wasn't really a way around it. People are, you know, taking days off from whatever they would normally be doing and refreshing. So I understand and agree that this is not ideal. Um, I do think so far it's better than the alternative. Um, if we could come up with some sort of compromise in the future, you know, to um, I'd be willing to consider it. I don't know what the board would say, um, but overall, I appreciate you doing a great job and, uh, and getting those shots in the arm. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. There are no more commissioners on the board. We might have finished up just one minute late. Thank you, Jake, thank for you. your informative. Well, we have Karen. Do we have time or can we continue, Madam Administrator, yeah. or... How do you want to handle this? I think this? you could continue for an update for Karen. I think the emergency rental assistance program is an important one, but it's just a limited presentation. You've heard some of it. And then you can go to your uh, pulled items. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good morning, commissioners, Karen Stewart, staff. I don't have a PowerPoint today since I've shown it to you a few times recently. But I do want to give you a, just a brief update. Uh, for the CARES Act extension, we have uh, provided our request to opt in to the state. We've also provided our spending plan to the state. Um, we've been notified by the state's consultant that they've received it, but it is pending review. And so until that is uh, reviewed, approved, and we receive an amendment for our agreement with the Florida Department of Emergency Management, we will not be able to open the business round. Um, we are still hoping it might be this week. We are ready to launch as soon as we get the, the uh, agreement executed for the amendment, but there, we will not be able to launch until then. In addition, we cannot move forward with the amendments with, for nonprofits to uh, work through March 31st until we receive this amendment as well. So um, we're on a little bit of a hold, but we are uh, ready, uh, willing, and able to launch as soon as possible. In addition, um, the emergency rental assistance, we um, are in good shape with that. We have uh, our manager in place. We have our two coordinators hired, and they're being trained this week. Uh, next week, the temp staff will start, and uh, they will be re uh, trained on the ne Neighborly software, and on the 16th, the program will launch in Neighborly. Uh, we did have a meeting with the clerk's office yesterday to talk about the payments and um, the, the volume that we anticipate for that. So we just wanted to let you know that we're, we're ready to go. Uh, we'll be ready to launch uh, next week with the emergency rental assistance. And we're on hold for CARES, but ready to go as soon as we get that taken care of with the state. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. <clears throat>
I have no one on the board, so I'm going to go ahead and open this up to public comment. I have one card filled out, Glenn Jubilina. For the record, Glenn Jablina, I just want to talk about the lottery for, for a moment here. I don't think that system's fair. I don't think it's fair at all. I mean, on the first day, I was probably on the phone for 10 or 12 hours before I got through. It should be like signing up for a college course. You get there early or you don't get a seat in that class. We'll see you next semester. So I think the people that, that did their due diligence and got in there should make it priority. It's real easy. You take 10,000 people at a crack, and you go from the oldest down to 65, and then when that segment is done, we move to the next 10,000. It would be much more satisfying to me if I knew where I was in line. I like Carol, 120,000, you know? But if you had, if people knew where they were, you'd take a lot of stress off them. But you don't do that. They sit there every Monday. Oh, man, am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? That's unfair. It's an unfair system. I'm not happy with it. Uh, had I been chosen first, I might have not gotten COVID-19, but I did, and I'm still waiting to be called. So that's my first, that's, that's my concern on this. My other thing on the care <coughs> is that, you know, they, they sent out four, uh, they, supposedly 460 letters saying that you were not qualified for January and February. Again, I understand they're waiting on funds. I understand there's forms. But you've put undue stress on 460 families. We just gave a bad loan to ESCO for $2.6 million for another five years. We can't do a bridge loan and give it to uh, the CARES and say, here's $5 million. Take the ball and run with it. We know we're, we're getting $12 million. And you didn't spend, you didn't spend it the, the, the 2.1 you got. You're getting $12 million for rental assistance. So my question is, it said right there in the application from December 27th to December 31st, 2021. <clears throat> it's in black and white. There's no lie in there. So I think another letter needs to go out and reassure those 460 families that are under stress right now. Say, you know what? You're covered. Because that's what the government, the U.S. Department of Treasury told us we were good between December 27th of 2020 through December 31st of 2021. This, you're disqualified, should have never went out. Should have never went out to those 460 because we know we have the funds there. This needs to be corrected. 460 folks out there have now told their landlords, take a hike for January, and you're probably not going to see any money on, 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 on February. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> Anyone else from the public like to come forward, please? State your name. You'll have three minutes. Andrew Griffin, uh, Manatee County resident. So um, you guys know my position. I'm not sure why my computer is not working for some reason, but you guys know my position for um, the vaccine. I think you guys have not uh, been forthcoming. Um, I was uh, I explained how the vaccine was developed with fetal aborted fetal tissue. Um, Misty decides to call Dr. Bensey instead of doing research. Um, they tell me it's not true, and I find a report that they use the proteins from aborted fetal tissue to develop this vaccine. You guys aren't telling people because one bishop or pope says it's within lawful limits of aborted fetal tissue, which is, is, is insane to me. Um, also, nobody on here has explained to the public what RNA is or mRNA which is the main ingredient in these vaccines. Not one person on here, not one, not one professional, not one doctor, 
Nobody. Nobody's educating the public. They're saying the vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. We're finding out the vaccine's not even FDA approved. So that means everybody that's taking the vaccine is automatically enrolled in a vaccine trial. Um, during the course of me being here, um, I was blocked again on Misty Servius page. So she's on Facebook here blocking people while we're having a meeting, which is really very dis disturbing to me uh, because I disagree with her misinformation campaign on her Facebook. Uh, this is the same woman that has repeatedly said that she likes all information. She likes all the community to call her and all the people to be inclusive, yet the people that disagree with her, she chooses to violate the First Amendment right of freedom of speech. She is a government employee. Not only is she a government employee, she is my specific district uh, representative that I am now blocked. Um, her friend, Laura Priscilla, can be rude to me, but I can't be rude back to her without being blocked. So, Misty, why don't you get off your Facebook page and start dealing with uh, government business, which you're being paid to do. With that, I'm going to close. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else from the public like to come forward, please? State your name. You'll have three minutes. <clears throat> Hi there, it's Michelle Martin. First of all, I love these new digs. Good job getting us in here. Nice to be back. Yeah, I love it. Um, I just have two things to say. First, I loved some of uh, Jake's updates and the good news about the reduced um, numbers for COVID. And I'm wondering if there's any plan for the um, PSA messages to go out there to share this good news with the public to kind of diffuse some of their terror and you know get us kind of back to better mental health so that we're not all terrified of each other and assaulted when we don't wear masks. And then the other thing, so that's what I'm hoping, so that something was done with the PSA to spread this good news. Even though everybody's flooding down here from other places, including the snowbirds and people who are trying to you know, live a little bit more free, they're still flooding our area and our numbers are still going down and our hospitals are in great shape and our ambulances are fine. So when you guys put on your Facebook these announcements that look terrifying, maybe we could have a little bit of context and talk about how great this news is. And then the other thing is, um, it surprises me how powerful messaging is. And as you know, I'm in marketing and I'm in messaging, and it still is shocking to me how powerful messaging is. And we've heard an example of it with Carol today, who said that people are crying in ecstasy mm -hmm. because they're getting a vaccine of which they have no idea what they're doing to their bodies. They're, they're complete Russian, playing Russian roulette. They're complete guinea pigs, big pharma, but they can't wait to do it. That is the power of messaging. So when we say we have to get this vaccine because COVID, you know, even though 89% of the people who get COVID don't even know that they have it, their symptoms are so low, we're still trying to make everybody alarmed about COVID and terrified of COVID. At the same time, we're saying this mystery vaccine is causing flu-like symptoms, and Carol, the nurse here, is dismissing it as, well, it's just the flu. Oh, I didn't see Which, that. yeah, Carol, I wrote it. Yeah. We, okay. can re we can no. rewind, we can rewind. But anyway, the point no, is, it's amazing the messaging, and so I want you guys to understand the power that you have as commissioners in your messaging, that you, you alarm the public, with your information about COVID, and you try to convince the public that the, the vaccine is the way to go, even though you know many people get flu-like symptoms, particularly on this second dose. So remind yourselves, as you're encouraging people to go get the second vaccine, a lot of these elderly people are gonna have flu-like symptoms, mm -hmm. and that's on you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Seth, anyone on the phone? Yes, Madam Chair. 628, 628, please press star six to unmute. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Yes, Vanessa, everybody. It's yes, Caroline again. Sorry to interrupt with the second comment, guys, but um, I wrote some commissioners about this. I'm calling as an advocate of the under 65 high risk. Uh, I'm sorry, would you please people. state your um, your full name, please, for the record? 
Oh, sure. It's, it's, it's Caroline again. It's Caroline Perzan. Um, okay. And by the way, I do want to do this. I'm interested in, in doing this art project for all of Bradenton, all of the districts. Okay. Just to make it uh, clear, but I am going to send you guys a link. Right now we're talking but, about um, the, the CARES Act, Caroline. Do you have anything yes. to add about the CARES yes, Act? Yes, I know that. Okay. Yes, yes I do. So um, I am calling um, because about the, as an advocate for, my, for, you know, because of HIPAA rules, I don't want to name names, but basically for the 65 and under high-risk people with comorbidities who, are, who maybe are disabled or have very high risk diseases, cancers, et cetera, that are on DeSantis's order. So I have done what Jennifer Jen Bensey told me to do. I call Blake. They have no list. MCR has no list. So mm -hmm. all I'm asking you guys is when you hear, please don't forget about um, that last line on the order. When you hear that there is a list at, at the hospitals being made, and, and, and I called many more hospitals, like in Sarasota as well, nobody knows of anything about that that part of the order. So it's very frustrating because remember, there are people with cerebral palsy, cancers, you know, all those people. They are in that order. But but I've called even Tallahassee, and no one. It's I just call it the forgotten group of the order. So please don't forget about us and others. And that's why I'm at home, because I can't, you know, I actually believe in science. And just so you know, because my husband works for the uh, Mayo Clinic, is for that lady that just spoke, the flu-like symptoms on your second dose are due to your, actually, immune system being pumped up. It, it means that it's, it's actually working. So it doesn't mean you have the flu. It doesn't mean you have COVID. It means it's actually a really good sign that it is actually working. And as far as, like, um, um, getting the ingredients, all she needs to do is go to the Moderna website or Pfizer website or the CDC, and the ingredients are all listed there. So there you go. Thank you very much. Please don't forget. <clears throat> Thank you. Seth, is there anyone else on the phone? That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and close public comment. Uh, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I want to reply to two people that we heard from in the audience. Uh, Glenn Javelina talked about it would be nice if we could start with the oldest uh, people in the pool and work down to 65, and I too wish we could do that. I do. Uh, you know, I hear from so many people in their 90s. My aunt is in her 90s and hasn't been chosen yet. Um, but unfortunately, the governor's order doesn't allow us to do that. The governor said everyone 65 and older goes uh, in the, uh, the pot that's available for getting a vaccine. So I'm with you, Glenn. I wish we could do it, but we can't. Um, in response to Andrew Griffin's comments, I did have to send her an email indicating that she was blocked again. Uh, she, she does have a habit of going on my social. No, we can't. Yes, of going on my social media and calling people names. And unfortunately, you know, we just can't, I can't tolerate that. And the rules are clearly posted for her. She is a constant offender in that regard. But it's temporary. In 48 hours, she'll be allowed back on. Um, so all is well. That's all that I have. Thank all right, you. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other commissioner comments. Thanks to all that have um, helped us with this. So we're going to go ahead and move forward right quick to item nine. Um, there's, a, there's a motion to extend the state of emergency. Yes, ma'am. Oh, OK. So I didn't know that. Sorry. Second. So moved. I'm sorry. Who made the motion? I don't know. Whitmore okay. made it. I seconded it. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the emergency order by Commissioner Whitmore, second by Commissioner Servia. Before we vote, is there anyone from the public that wants to come forward on this issue? Michelle Martin. I know that the um, state of emergency stays in place so that you guys can keep getting money. But I asked this months ago, and I'm asking it again. What are the benchmarks <clears throat> for removing that? We are at 5% now. What are the benchmarks for removing it? The governor. governor. No, every, every county doesn't have to have a state of emergency just because the governor does. They do. You do if you want CARES money. 
That's yeah. the point. So what are the benchmarks in removing it? So until the governor removes it, you guys are going to just keep it in place so that you keep getting the money. That is correct. Or pay okay. for the shops. Yeah. Ms. Sorry, Van Austin Bridge. Yeah, Ms. Martin, uh, the, the residents of this county pay federal income taxes whether they want to or not. It's not a voluntary program. Our, our tax money is forcibly taken from us by the feds, Amen. by the IRS. Um, and <laughs> that money goes to Washington. If we do not put in for this, we don't. our residents will not get that money back. Okay. Um, and I cannot stop the federal government from forcibly taking your money from you, but I can ensure that it returns to this community, and that's why I vote to extend the emergency care. Okay. Thanks. That's, for that. that's exactly why. Thank you, Commissioner. Good. Anyone else want to come forward? God. Yes, ma'am. Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. I, I, I mimic exactly what, I echo exactly what Michelle Martin says. I mean, at some point, this money is going to be getting paid back to our federal government. I mean, let's let's not forget this money. I mean, think about it. If you're you're spending five trillion dollars in a year, where's that money coming? From? When is that money going to go back? I guess is my question. So, higher taxes down the road is going to be what we, what's going to be filling those coffers. Um, also, while we're in a state of emergency, I mean, you guys are l uncomfortable up here in masks because one or two, maybe three commissioners. Don't want you guys being without masks. You guys are human beings. You're American citizens. I just really want you to take your liberties back up here on this dais. You have rights too. And if you feel like you're being suffocated because of three county commissioners, take the masks off. Breathe. They don't get to dictate. We have a chair here. And as much as time as Kara likes to take up, even though she doesn't uh, seem to, she thinks that she doesn't get time to talk, I keep timing her every time I come here, and she talks more than any person on this dais. So I think you guys need to take control back of the situation. If I understand the argument of, you know, getting the money here, that makes perfect sense. I mean, if somebody's getting it, we might as well get it. I get that. But all those restrictions, we can start releasing. We can have our state of emergency and stop with this nonsense with this mask. I haven't worn a mask in 10 months. I haven't been sick. I'm not going to act like I am. And I wish you guys would start leading by example. We need to start getting normalcy back in this county, and we're not doing it by acting like this is helping. It's not helping. Science proves the masks aren't helping. So I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? All right, we do have Seth, I believe, one phone call. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. 189, 189, please press star six. Go ahead, caller. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is Don Kitterman for the record. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a, a couple of comments. Um, First, I wanted to thank you all, all of you up there, uh, for pri prioritizing, um, you know, assuring that citizens can get the financial assistance they need uh, during this time. The CARES Act funding does provide, as you all know, which is why you're supporting it, um, various safety nets to, to businesses and individuals. And, um, you know, that's being offered statewide in every county for a good reason. So it in my opinion, would be kind of foolish to poo-poo it. Um, so thank you for that uh, diligence. Um, next, I, I wanted to share also that I have um, probably about 10 people that I know personally who have received both doses of their uh, Moderna vaccine through the Manatee County system. And I just wanted to share with you that uh, I think I've sent in an email already expressing um, that the process that they went through, like as far as the physical at Bennett Park, getting it, the drive through, whatever, everybody raved about how fantastic everything was, was run and how easy it was for them um, in and out wise, quick time. Um, also, I wanted to share that I would say probably roughly 75% of them on the second dose had no um, side effects whatsoever. They're all doing great, feeling great. Um, the most recent second dose happened almost two weeks ago now, so a week and a half ago, I guess. Um, and uh, a couple of them did have what was being discussed a moment ago, some um, body aches and just kind of generally not feeling well um, for maybe the 24 hours, 36 hours after the second dose 
but um, nothing severe, and it rectified and went away, and they're doing great now. And one of these people um, is my mother, who is 71 years old, works in a high school in our county, and I just want to let you guys know I'm so grateful that she was able to get vaccinated, and she has some protection now because her school has reported uh, roughly five cases just in the last two weeks. Um, another comment I wanted to make was I wanted to thank all of you. I know you're in closer quarters now because you're, you're back in the setting where you belong um, and that um, I'm appreciating seeing all of you utilizing masks and, you know, the, just the general protocol. And, and, yeah, maybe they're not the most comfortable and convenient, but, you know, if kindergartners can pull it off for six hours a day. Obviously, none of you are suffocating, but I, I appreciate your efforts and um, that role model in showing that. And the last comment I wanted to make was in reference to, um, I, I don't know if any of you up there are confused Thank by you, this call or if maybe you already know we appreciate this. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Seth, on the phone? That's all, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. We're going to close public comment. We have five minutes. How fast can we do number nine? <laughs> did, you, did you all take the vote on the motion? I thought we did. Did we? Yeah, we voted on, voted the, on, Nicole on the motion, Knapp didn't we? Here. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Pulled items nine and 12. Nicole Knapp is here. Okay. Wait a minute. We have to vote on the motion to extend the emergency. First and second. So all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's approved unanimously. Thank you. Hi, Nicole. Sorry about that, guys. Nicole, I think the two uh, questions were on the impact fees that were being reimbursed. Right. Correct. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Nicole Knapp, impact fee administrator. Um, I'm going to do my best to describe uh, overall um, how, why these refunds are on here, but to do that, I kind of have to explain the credit system first. Um, and so let me start by saying that r the refunds themselves are not complicated, but the projects they stem from are multi-layered. For example, the Manatee Land Investors LLC uh, project that's mentioned, um, it has, it's impressed with a, a local development agreement, a reimbursement agreement, and a credit authorization agreement, all that were approved by the board over the last um, six, seven years. And they were for the Port Harbor Extension project. So. Um, if I can't answer any of your questions here today or explain the process, then we'll have to bring these back before you at a future agenda. Um, so as I ex said, to explain the refunds, I'd have to kind of explain that there's a credit system. So um, the county individually reviews and grants impact fee credits for system improvements using percentages that are outlined in Chapter 11 of the Land Development Code and that are also adopted in the Administrative Procedure Manual, that document most recently approved by the board just over two years ago, December of 2019. And the general intent is to limit impact-free credits to the actual cost of the system improvements. So for example, following the approval of an LDA or a reimbursement agreement, the developer is required to submit a credit authorization application. And um, those are reviewed and approved internally by the impact fee division. Then once those system improvements are built, they have to prove to us that they have paid the contractor, paid for the materials, and then we do inspections to uh, confirm that they're built to county standards. Um, and we do all that before we can allow the developer to begin using their credits. So as you can imagine, in the meantime, something like a Port Harbor extension takes a long time, but they've already started building their residential units. So when they pull their building permit, and they receive their occupancy, they have to pay the impact fees that are assessed at that time. And then later, once we can uh, confirm all these improvements have met county standards, then we have to refund them uh, impact fees that were assessed at the time of occupancy that they, just because of the chicken and egg, which one came first. So I don't want to say that these are common, but they are common a lot of times just because of the timing it takes to build the improvements versus when they have to pay or when they want to receive their building permits. Commissioner Servia, you pulled these two items. Do you have any questions? No, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the uh, written explanation that you gave the citizen when they asked. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. What is the pleasure of the board? Uh, motion to approve as recommended by staff. Second. 
We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Servia, second by Commissioner Bellamy. Um, we have not had public comment on this item. Well, yes, we did. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to do that again. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, it is approved unanimously. Thank you. Now, number 12. Um, Director Brewer can come down for number 12. There okay. was a question concerning an item in the budget amendment. Let's do that. Where are we, number 12? Good afternoon, Commissioners Jan Brewer, Director of Financial Management. A point of clarification, inside the budget amendment, do you are you wanting me to go through each budget amendment, or is this actually in relation to the comment from Mr. Jubilina? Uh, the yes. comment. Madam Chairman, that is correct. Yes. That's the reason I pulled it, so that the citizen could have his question answered. Right. Thank okay. Um, there is no part of the ESCO loan in the budget amendment process. This is a topic, I believe, outside of it. What Mr. Gibellina is talking about is a loan that was done in 2014 whenever the county built the ESCO chiller plant across the street. To have the ESCO chiller plant, we used a portion of it with leftover bond money from other little projects, but the remainder of it was right at um, a total. It started at 6.1. We ended up only needing 5.3 million. The finance director at that time did an interfund loan between the health insurance fund to this. It's a common practice within county governments that they loan within their own money, making sure each fund receives the exact amount of interest they would have earned as if the money was in the bank account for them. The clerk keeps up with that, posts it every year. So far to date, um, out of, it is paid back 3.9 million. You are scheduled to make a $500,000 payment in our plan budget for next year. I was hoping I was gonna bring this up next week to see if you wanna draw down the rest of it once you see where you're at for this year with the general fund. There is the opportunity, if you want to continue on, you can. As far as the ESCO project itself, it is returning the funding, and that's how we're able to make the payments back. Can I answer any other questions? Commissioner Servia? No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. I motion to approve uh, that item number 12 as recommended by staff. Second. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Servia, a second by, I heard, Commissioner Whitmore first. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> it is approved unanimously. Now, before we break for lunch, and thank you, Commissioners, for getting this done. Before we break for lunch, Commissioner Satcher, you were on the board and I missed you. Did you want to make a comment, sir? Yeah, I wanted to speak to some of the uh, citizens' comments um, regarding the emergency declaration. Um, first of all, I do think it's important that we don't just uh, dismiss what our citizens are saying. Uh, there's a lot of important things out there. Um, and right now, I mean, our governor is dealing with the fact that, uh, that big tech is only letting one version of events and one version of facts get out there. And I'm not in favor of that. I trust the people of Manatee County when you provide them uh, with the with the truth or with the facts as well as you know them for them to make good decisions um, based on their own uh, beliefs and uh, and so as far as this emer emergency declaration uh, I'm going to approve it as long as that's what gets us the funding that we need and that's going out to the communities regardless of my opinion of my views so that's why I vote to approve it however uh, just to assure citizens, I won't support anything, and I think this board has made it clear um, that further tramples rights. So I, I'm okay with the emergency declaration, but not as an excuse uh, to do something like a curfew or a mandate on masks or a vaccine mandate, nothing like that um, that I'm in favor of, and I don't believe this uh, board would be in favor of either. Uh, I am a good with providing information and letting people make the decisions um, that they feel are appropriate. Um, today, we got here, and uh, the mask thing came up, and they're talking about CDCs, and I tell you what, when I heard that the CDC recommends under these circumstances, I, just to be honest with you, uh, that was not a major concern of mine. Uh, the CDC, I do not recognize as, uh, as you know, an authority over me. However, uh, my brother and friend, um, Commissioner Bellamy, is sitting right next to me. And, uh, and he's got high-risk people at home, 
and it's a concern of his. And so out of deference to him um, and caring for him, that's why I have my mask on. Um, you know, my wife and uh, plenty of other people in the community, but my wife sp specifically, when she wears a mask, she gets a pounding migraine that can sometimes last for days. Um, and so I think that it is okay for us to say those things. It's okay for us to say that everyone in every situation may not be able to do what is generally the best thing for someone to do. Um, you have to weigh those things and make a decision uh, based on your good judgment and the situation that you're in. So I just wanted to um, put those things out there for the record. Thank you. Well said, Commissioner. Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, and I just want to echo and, and, and extend my um, sincere, warm thanks um, to my friend, um, Commissioner Satcher. Um, we did have some dialogue. Um, he did inquire um, my thoughts about him wearing a mask, and I let him know, you know, I'm healthy, but I have to go home and take care, you know, my mom and my dad, and we just don't know. And, sir, um, from my heart to yours, I really thank you for the, allowing us to hold that conversation and get on the same pages. And I think that's an example that we can lead by and make sure that we, you know, hold an open conversation and come to common ground and find a way to, to positively and professionally impact and move forward. So, again, sir, I just want to tell you thank you. You know, that being said, I'm going to comment on that. I, I think what I just heard here between the two of you is, it says it all. You know, it's not about the CDC. It's not about any of those things. It's just showing respect. Um, you know, and, and I thank you both for pointing out that this board is capable of respecting each other and moving forward and doing something because it's the right thing to do. And I thank you both for that. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, uh, it's showing respect of your person right next to you. You know, I have a husband that is uh, uh, that I need to make sure that he doesn't acquire this virus. And the CDC is what we're following per the governor's order. So to say that we don't care about what the CDC says, well, that's in the governor's order that we follow the CDC guidelines. Whether you believe the science or not, it is science. And um, so I'm not going to the, discard the CDC, sorry. Um, I think they know a little bit more about infectious disease and infection control than all of us up here, including me. Is that it? Yep. Okay. You know, we're all entitled, and, and that's what makes the world go round, and, and we all have our own opinions, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right, this, um, this meeting is in recess until 1.30. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Misty Servia, the chair of your TDC. It is February 1st, 2021, and we are going to get started with the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. And we have Pastor Kenny Tibbetts from First Baptist Church of Palmetto. Good morning. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come here today and just... Uh, Talk about this great place that you have given us. Lord, you have brought us to one of the most gorgeous pieces of land anywhere in the world. Lord, we believe that the area in Manatee County is one of the most desirable places um, anywhere in our country. So, Lord, just as we meet this morning to talk about tourism, as we meet this morning to talk about this place that you've given us, Lord, would you give us wisdom? Lord, would you give us discernment? Lord, would you help our conversation to honor you? Lord, I pray for our time together. I pray for each one involved. I pray that we would make the decisions which best honor you and which best uh, represent the citizens of Manatee County. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, good morning everyone and thank you for being here. Um, we're gonna get started today with the TDC member introductions um, and a welcome of new members, although I think our one new member is not here today, but we will announce him when the time is right. Vernon, we'll start with you, please. Uh, good morning, Vernon Desir, Manatee Memorial Hospital Foundation. <laughs> Jitan Patel, Holiday in Sarasota Bradenton Airport. Jean Brown, Mayor, City of Bradenton. Shirley Groover Bryant, Mayor of the City of Palmetto. Eric Karen, Cedar Cove Resort, Anna Maria Island. Jack Reinerson, interested citizen and formerly Commissioner of the Airport for 13 years and seven months. <laughs> Elliot Felchoni, Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thank you, everyone. And again, I'm Misty Servia, Manatee County Commissioner and your TDC Chair. I'd like to congratulate and also welcome Raul Patel, who is our newest TDC member, but unfortunately he is not here this morning, so we will see him in April. And Ed Childs, also TDC member, but unable to be here today. Okay, with that, we're going to move on to approval of the meeting minutes. And for this, I need a motion, please. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Who was the second by, please? There was we both were. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, Jaten second, yeah. and Vernon was the first. All those in favor say aye. 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 And passes unanimously. And now we'll move to public comment. If anyone from the public would like to approach the mic with public comment, please do so, and you will be given three minutes. Please give us your name. Thank you. Good day. My name is Tyler Fisher. I'm a resident of Bradenton and just looking forward to this is the first council meeting that I have attended, but looking forward to learning as much as possible. I am in um, the business of working with local governments around short term rental identification enforcement and really increasing tax collection too. Uh, locally working here with uh, local counties and cities, but also at the state level with DPPR, um, DOR and also um, kind of across the country. So really appreciate it. If anybody has any questions about what's going on, uh, I do a whole assortment of webinars and presentations, but happy to be a resource. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Anyone else? All right, not seeing anyone. We will move on to election of the TDC vice chairman for this year, 2021, and we will receive nominations. I think uh, I would nominate uh, Vernon this year's. Vernon Desir has a nomination. Any others? Second. Okay, second. <laughs> Should we close the nominations or are there others? Okay, seeing no others, Vernon, I think you have been elected. Hard Congratulations. Fought Hard fought campaign, Vernon. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> 
All right, and now we're going to move on. We have uh, Kelly Clark, our marketing and our marketing manager at the BACVB, who's going to introduce Kevin McNulty for our 2020 social media recap. Good morning. We all know that social media is an important part of our business. Never has that statement been more prevalent than this past year. Social media is one of the most powerful tools we can use during a crisis because we can get useful information out instantly with just a click of a button. During the pandemic, as the demand for visual content and travel inspiration skyrocketed, our team diligently spent time and energy curating engaging content for our audience and highlighting businesses and industry partners to help keep them open. The CVB manages, advertises, and creates content for 15 unique social media channels. And we couldn't do that alone. Together with NetWeave Social Networking, an agency right here in Palmetto, specializes in tourism, has been working collectively with us for the past seven years. They're helping us get our social media where it needs to be. They're experts in their field. And here with us online today is the president of NetWeave, Kevin McNulty, who is going to give you a little bit more of an in-depth look of how we performed this past year. So Kevin, take it away. Okay, thank you. Well, Kelly really hit all the high spots, so thank you very much for having me and have a great year. No. Um, I would like to uh, go ahead and share my screen with you so that I can uh, go through our presentation here. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you all for having me uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing me this opportunity to kind of catch you up on what we've been doing and what we look to start doing in 2021. Um, since I'm, I'm screen sharing, your screen is very small, so if anyone has a, a question at any point, please interrupt me uh, and I'd be happy to address it for you. So can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, so um, the, the uh, as we call it in the business, the too long didn't read on 2020 is uh, that despite the fact that we um, had a very challenging year, to say the least, um, we actually had a fairly remarkable year on social media. So um, one of the things that really affects um, the CVB's performance on social media is we do do a lot of social advertising and um, what you'll generally see is when uh, advertising increases, impressions increase naturally, uh, so does engagement and so does audience. Um, well, of course, this year for a good chunk of the year, we didn't advertise. We paused ads uh, when the pandemic first hit. Uh, when we were on lockdown, we, we paused all, all that advertising. And so we would have expected to see traffic really suffer as a result. But uh, despite that, we saw the total audience increase 19%, which is fairly significant. Um, that they, that not only did, whoops, not only did the, um, not only did the audience go up, um, but we saw the other performance metrics increase as well. Um, so we saw the, the number of posts we did kind of naturally went up because we were communicating more as people were searching for content as, as Kelly kind of indicated in her introduction. Um, our total impressions did go down and that's because of the advertising. Um, Ad, ad impressions are counted in total impressions. So that number includes not only the organic posts that we're doing, um, but they're also indicative of advertising. And with less advertising, we saw that go down. But despite the impressions going down, our engagement actually increased. Um, and what we expect to see is that engagements, and, or excuse me, engagements and impressions tend to track together as impressions go down, engagements go down, impressions go up, engagements go up. And what we saw here is impressions go down significantly while engagement increased. And what that generally indicates when we see that is an increase in quality or an increase in audience involvement. 
And I think a, we have a, a little of both here as we started producing more content and we went more in depth um, since social media was the only contact we had with the audience pretty much during that time. Um, so we saw uh, engagement increase uh, despite the fact that audience impressions went down. Um, we also uh, saw link clicks go down because of the decrease in advertising, but again, that improvement in engagement was significant um, given that our impressions were down by so much due to the pause in advertising. So very encouraging result. As you can see, despite the decrease in advertising uh, and the challenge of the year, we still got almost 42 and a half mil million impressions on social media. Um, an impression is anytime somebody sees any messaging with our name on it, whether it be um, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, any, any channel, these are all combined. Uh, an engagement would be anytime somebody would uh, react to uh, our content, uh, share our content, comment on our content. Um, link clicks uh, went down by about the same amount as impressions and that would be because of the advertising. Uh, because all our ads do have link clicks in them. And um, so you would expect that to track uh, as it did. One of the things we like to talk about when we talk about social media results, just to kind of give you some context. I mean, I can tell you what's normal on social media, but you'd kind of have to take my word for it. Um, but one of the things we, we look at is what we call earned media value. So let's take this 42 and a half million impressions and let's see what it would have cost us to get that many impressions if we went out and advertised like we, we normally would. Um, and, and for that, we kind of use an, an aggregate average number based on um, what we know advertising rates kind of run. Uh, this is a combination of print, outdoor, radio, TV. Um, and at an average of $6 CPM, which is cost per mill, that's 1,000 impressions. If you had gone out and bought these traditionally, you would have expected to pay just over a quarter million. Um, and what you, what you instead paid for all things combined, the advertising we did do, our services for management, everything combined, um, you only paid about 120,000, which saved you 134,000 over traditional media. Uh, so social media allows us to really punch above our weight when it comes to that uh, and to provide a good cost savings um, in exchange for getting the word out to as many people as we would have in more traditional methods for about half the price. So, that's kind of how we did in 2020. What do we expect to see going into 2021? Um, there's These are some figures that I pulled for you to kind of give you a sense of how people are using social media uh, in 2021 um, and, and mobile devices as well, which social media is very prevalent on. Um, in, now, the most recent data we have in some of these cases is 2019. Not a lot of travel surveys going on in 2020, uh, but it's still pretty endemic of uh, uh, consumer behavior. So we see 74% of people will use social media while they're traveling. Um, that's 74% of Americans uh, will use social media while they're traveling. 85% use mobile devices to book, uh, whether that be a hotel, whether that be a flight, whether that be attraction tickets, uh, tours, 85% will use mobile devices to book it, and 52% made travel plans specifically because of something they saw on social. Might have been an ad, might have been a friend recommendation, um, might have asked somebody uh, what they could do at, in destination and gotten a friend to tell them, and then they went ahead and made those plans. But something that they saw on social media, they specifically made plans based on that. So as you can see, it's an important part of the equation now. Um, most social media access is done on mobile devices. And what we're seeing is an increase in mobile device use for everything. You know, people are now using phones in lieu of computers and they have them all the time. So they're constantly accessing uh, 
their apps, their favorite social media, the internet, all on mobile devices. Uh, <clears throat> here's another um, interesting stat just now, now this is post pandemic. Um, this is change in um, sentiment as far as kind of travel destinations. Now, this isn't destination specific, but destination type. And you'll see a huge shift towards outdoor activities, activities you can do alone or in smaller groups, or you know, you can do with your family or your pod and still kind of stay isolated. So visiting cities and going on cruises has shifted way to the bottom with a negative shift in sentiment towards those kinds of destinations. Whereas outdoor destinations, camping, beach, have all increased dramatically. And I think this is one thing that really works in our destination's favor is that we had these sorts of activities. So people who may have considered maybe uh, a visit to Orlando to do a park or, or series of parks uh, may not think that's such a good idea anymore. Maybe we should just go to the beach instead. Um, and I think that really that works in our favor as far as the types of destinations we're known for and also our most popular posts on social media, uh, beaches, sunsets, uh, kayaking, hiking are always very popular posts when we do them on social media. So I think that really works to our advantage. So based on all of this, the recommendations that we're making uh, to the CVB and that we're working together with them uh, in this direction, uh, we know that um, because of budget constraints, that because of the effect that the pandemic's had on that, um, we have reduced advertising a little bit. So we've kind of recommended changing our mix um, with the reduced budget that we have. We're seeing increases in our audience and audience activity on Instagram as that key demographic kind of ages into our own key demographic as the destination. Um, Instagram was uh, a few years ago primarily um, college age, so it was a little bit young, but as years go on, those users get older and stick with the platform because that's where their fans are or their friends rather. And so we see that uh, demographic aging into a uh, more typical demographic for who visits us. So we're recommending splitting advertising a little more equitably between Facebook and Instagram. Um, and we've also seen a reduction in Twitter as a platform, as well as um, the number of people going to Twitter uh, that number has stayed stagnant for a couple of years now, um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next year or so to that. So we would recommend taking that money that we were advertising on Twitter and moving that over to the Facebook Instagram budget just to kind of bolster it a little bit, given the reductions that we're making. Um, we also were having good success in the previous year with advertising um, wedding uh, venues at the Pal Crosley. That was going very well. Pinterest is actually still quite a vital platform for that sort of thing. Um, and we had to cancel that. But I just want to encourage everybody if we, you know, if we can um, find a way to fund that, that was being very successful for us. And we'd love to start it up again if we can. Social media and how we'll distribute them via social media kind of ahead of, of maybe what we might do on other media just because it's become uh, a more important part of the mix. Also, as um, as we progress towards uh, e expansion of convention activities um, with the hotel and the convention center, as that moves forward, and we start to look at trying to um, trying to woo more of that type of activity into our destination, we recommend uh, you look at uh, adding LinkedIn uh, support uh, to the management plan where we can start connecting with uh, tour operators, event coordinators, association planners, that sort of thing. Um, those, those connections are uh, 
really made on LinkedIn being more of a business platform. Uh, we have other uh, visitor and convention bureaus in the state that we work with um, who have a little bit more emphasis on that group sales side, and we do very well supporting them on LinkedIn. So we would recommend that as well. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Did anybody have any um, questions or while I'm screen sharing, is there a, a slide you'd like me to go back to? Thanks, Kevin. I uh, really appreciate it. You know, what's exciting uh, about Kevin is he, he's literally right in our own backyard, uh, the best of the best. And he also works for at least one airport in the state of Florida, which is really important. He uh, He's always cutting edge. And uh, uh, we debate a lot uh, with our staff and him, and that's what you want uh, out of a um, – extension of your organization we definitely don't want people just to agree with whatever we want uh, so he's been great um, he's been a mentor and Anastasia Taylor the young lady who's waving there is our liaison um, and she does a lot of work in-house on social media so um, you need that connectivity that communication in your department with people like Kevin and his team so great job Kevin really appreciate it the just the, the one other thing is as we continue to, to um, be blessed with additional nonstop flights. Uh, social media is a really important tactic that we go into a new market with aside from digital advertising. So, so, so important and it showed a lot of success. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you, Kevin, very much. Very informative. Okay, thanks very much for having me. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to item number seven, which is the state of tourism update. And Miss Ann Wattin, I believe, is here. Yep. Good morning and Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Ann Wattin. I'm with Research Data Services, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit. This, these are preliminary numbers because it's still early, and we haven't seen tax collections yet. Um, but I didn't want to come and talk about November. That seems like ancient history at this point. So we have preliminary December numbers we wanted to share with you. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, thank you. Okay, so it is looking to us like um, calendar year 2020 shaped up with visitation down 11.5% and economic impact down 14% which is really an amazing performance considering everything that happened during 2020. In terms of occupancy and ADR, on the next slide, um, occupancy down 18.4%. The reason that visitors are not down as much as occupancy is because we saw a shift to shorter length of stays, which means that rooms turn over faster, um, and it takes more visitors to generate the same amount of occupancy. Um, ADR down only by 5.6%, which is actually a good number, and a 22% loss of rep par. In terms of where people are coming from, um, as we've talked about a number of times, we saw a, a huge increase um, in response to your pivoting of direction to visitors coming from local drive market and from Florida, and you can see that here. And of course, the big loss in in international travel as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, um, we added this slide, and I know that there is a lot going on, but we've been seeing something really important happening through these last few months. Um, and what we've been seeing is that right after the lockdowns happened, just as we were reopening, we were seeing that Florida was 83% of our pie in, term, in terms of the pie slice. So if you look at this graphic, um, out of state for 2019 is the gray area in the background. Florida for 2019 is that black line that you see. And the blue and the green bars, the blue bar is Florida for 2020, and the green bar is out of state for 2020. So we wanted to show the comparison between Florida and all of our out-of-state markets and this year and last year as well. 
And what we wanted to show is we went from that 83 percent in March where, and you can see how much bigger that blue, or in May, I'm sorry, 83% um, in May, you can see how much bigger that blue bar is than the green bar, to where now in December um, we are roughly 50-50. Uh, Florida was 51.8% um, and out-of-state was 49. Um, so it's a little hard to see in the overall numbers, but we wanted to show you that those out-of-state markets are starting to come back, and we are very definitely seeing them when we are surveying in market, particularly midweek, and that's an encouraging sign. We still have a long way to go because if you look at the difference between that green bar and the gray background behind it, um, there's a lot to do to get back to normal. But um, we are seeing pickup in those numbers that I think was hard to, to see, and so hopefully this, this helps to show it a little bit. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, this is the, the um, Deplain, or all airport traffic at, um, at SRQ, um, and it is starting to recover, but we had had such an amazing year in 2019 that, of course, and air travel is still um, um, concerning to a lot of potential travelers, so this still has a way to go. And we added an additional slide as well on the next slide. Um, we thought that this gave you some interesting information, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time with it because you, ha you have it in your packets. But this shows what a better position we are in versus some of the bigger markets. Um, Orlando, which is MCO, and Miami were not available yet at the time that we put this together. But you can see Tampa, um, particularly for December, and TSA is, is TSA-wide. Um, and how much better SRQ and Punta Gorda are, are performing versus the other airports. Um, and we'll summarize this. Um, we're going to keep this in our presentation here for a bit because I think it is interesting information, um, but we'll summarize it so it's not quite so overwhelming. But we wanted you to see the full flow from March through now. The TSA numbers, they just started publishing this. Um, in March, so so we won't have a full year here for another month and a half, basically. Um, okay, so in terms of December, and again, these are preliminary until we see taxes and some other secondary information. December had looked like um, it was facing a lot of challenges. Uh, we saw numbers increasing after Thanksgiving. We saw um, cold weather, particularly on weekends and particularly during the holidays. Um, we heard from properties that although November had been pretty solid, December was seeming pretty soft. But when all was said and done, it looks like December has wrapped up with visitors down 4.7% and um, economic impact down 6.3%. Looking ahead, we're hearing from properties that um, January looks like it's going to be lower than last year but higher than December, that March is starting to look like it's going to be satisfactory, but the reality of life is that um, reservation windows are still very, very short, but we are starting to see some lengthening. So we're in, with the properties we talked to in the beginning of December to collect their November occupancy, they were telling us 42% were saying that the majority of their reservations were three to seven days out. Um, that number dropped to 33% in the beginning of January when we were collecting the December data. Um, and the percent saying that their reservations were 8 to 30 days rose. It's not a huge lengthening. It seems like non-traditional lodgings are having longer reservation windows than more traditional lodgings. And it really means that nobody is telling us that they're seeing reservations more than 30 days out. It means that properties are having a really hard time knowing what season is going to look like even, even now. Um, we did, 
and this was very encouraging, have properties tell us that they were seeing reservations now from New York and from Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania um, and more traditional places that we would be expecting to see reservations coming in now instead of what we've been hearing all along, which is that they're mostly Florida and mostly local drive. We also had 40% of properties telling us that in December they had sports um, related room nights. Um, and they mentioned baseball and soccer and a number of different events at IMG and rowing specifically. Um, so in terms of occupancy, December looks like we had a 16% drop in occupancy, a 5.1% reduction in ADR for an overall 20% rev per contraction. Um, and we still have some increase in lodging units which means that there's more in the inventory to sell, which also has an impact on occupancy. Um, the Department of Business and Professional Regulations has not updated um, these numbers since the beginning of October, um, and we will call them and see, because normally they would post new numbers the beginning of each month. Um, so I'm going to, at that point, switch over real quickly to the travel sentiment study. You have the December study and the information that was provided to you. We saw a huge decrease in positivity in December. So yesterday we took a look at what the January responses looked like. Obviously we still had responses coming in over the weekend, but we, we looked at those numbers. Um, and so I want to just hit a couple of these slides and tell you the difference that we saw with people responding in January. Okay. Sure. While they're pulling that up, I wanted to speak a little bit to the comments that we were seeing, and I, I can do that without, without you having it in front of you. In December, we, we ask if you remember that one word people would say about travel. And the, the people that we could categorize as positive in December dropped to 11.3%. <clears throat> in January, it picked back up again to 23%. But what I really wanted to share with you was some of the things that I was hearing. In December, I was really surprised that more people weren't talking about the vaccine and that that gave them some hope. We heard that in January, that, that people are saying, you know, I can make it until a vaccine's available. I'm coming, or I'm going to vacation in the summer. We haven't heard that the entire time we've been doing this research, that people have very definite, you know, they're ready to get out. One person categorized themselves as a caged animal and another one as a horse at the starting gate um, who's nervous but ready. To, to, to run. So people, people are, are very, very ready to get out and, and, and move around. So if we can look at slide six. Thank you. Um, this is, as, as I've explained before, this is our index of travel readiness. We saw a huge decrease in December in what we categorize as green light travelers, people who are ready to get out and get going in the next couple of months. Um, it dropped. It had been trending um, between 30 and 37 percent ever since we added the question, and it dropped to 23.2 percent with our December respondents. It picked back up again with the people who responded in January to 28%. So that was, that was encouraging. If we can go to slide 13, also in December, and I think a big reason that we saw this, this um, drop of positivity is we saw a huge increase in the percentage of people who said that they had had to cancel travel. And we heard it in the comments as well. So I think people tried to make holiday plans that they just couldn't do and that that contributed very much to the negativity that we heard in December. And we've, we've seen some turnaround in that in January and that, that is encouraging. Um, so the one last thing that I wanted to point out is slide 18. 
And this is, we've, we've talked about this a, a, a number of times, but this is reopening status. Um, and you saw, if you look at December, so many places were experiencing lockdowns. Um, and we heard it in the comments and we continue to hear it in the comments in January that people very much think that things at destinations that they want to visit are closed. Um, we only have 14.6% who are saying that they think that things at destinations they're interested in visiting are mostly open. And what they're saying in the comments is, why should I spend the money to go on vacation if I'm not going to get that experience that I'm looking for? So, um, and you, you just talked about your social media, which is your, your chance to tell people what they are going to be able to experience when they get here, and that's really, really important. Do you have any questions? I know I covered a lot of information. Any questions from the TDC members? Jean? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you had mentioned something about the sporting events that, you know, and a lot of you travel and, and that coming in, and I've had some conversation with some of the hotel managers in the city of Bradenton, which really rely on that. Has the, the TDC done anything or CVB to, to change something that's happening with some sports? They said something has changed, some advertising. or And, again, I'm just getting into all of it, yes, so sir. trying to understand it. But that was a, a true concern of some of the managers at the hotels in the city that they need that lifeblood right now. And that's, that's, there's still a lot of youth sports traveling and playing, and we see a lot of them in downtown Bradenton. Yeah, Mayor, we're really aggressive on the sports segment right now. Uh, this county was actually the first uh, in the state of Florida to do a large uh, sports tournament, soccer, uh, at, on Labor Day as well. I think the change maybe that the industry has heard is uh, Sean Walter left for a job in Port Charlotte. Okay. Uh, but we have staff. Uh, we actually have three staffers that we've geographically allocated sports sales to. Um, that have they've already done destination sales. So we're real aggressive, um, and uh, business is starting to push uh, really hard. I think the challenge is um, uh, there's a lot of destinations that are hungry for that same business, so right. competition is really high. Uh, I'm going to read you an email uh, at the end of this meeting um, to give you a really quick recap of an event that just came into Premier as well. Uh, the other caveat is uh, the additional hotel capacity in the region that um, has we've gone from a need of hotels to borderline saturation. So that pent up demand that the mainland properties had seen two years ago, um, you need even, even that more of a push. Um, so, um, but we're on it. Um, sports segment in general for Manatee County usually brings in about 200 million to the local economy a year. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Eric. And I would just like to say that um, everything that you present is, I mean, is so accurate, at least from our end of it. Um, I, I, I sit here and I look at your numbers and your stats, and I think to myself, did I write them? <laughs> I mean, you are right on with at least what we see and what we project for the future. Um, I know it's going to look up. I know it's going to uh, get better. Um, but I just want to thank you. It's extremely accurate, and thank you for what you do. Thank you very much. M Madam Chair, if I can make one comment. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me the most was the airport. Mm -hmm. And I believe I read an email Friday that uh, deployment, visitation deployment out of SRQ from a Sarasota perspective, was higher than deployment out of Tampa International for the first time. That is really, really intriguing, okay? Uh, it is so important that uh, I wish I could take you all to a focus group in the marketplace where a lot of people in our top feeder markets don't realize that Sarasota is uh, just south of Bradenton area, okay? <laughs> Sing a song in the mirror, brainwash yourselves. We need to continue to educate our community, our marketplace that it's called the Sarasota Bradenton International Airport. Now, it's not a shallow statement. It's not about don't forget about Bradenton. Focus groups in the marketplace, when they hear of a small town airport, Panama City, Sarasota, Dothan, Alabama, that they think that there's fewer flights 
and higher prices. Okay? So when you put Sarasota Bradenton together like Raleigh Durham, trust me, uh, it'll resonate. And isn't it great that the monies that were flowing into Tampa International Airport are now flowing into our backyard? And Rick Piccolo and his team have caught fire. Um, new uh, nonstops continue to be added, uh, just as, 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 as uh, lately as two weeks ago with Peoria nonstop. So, so please, um, I've been known walking out of an uh, uh, off of an airplane, um, just kind of heckling the pilot a little bit. Um, so, um, <laughs> but it's really, really, really important, and it's tough. But, but um, please. Um, Share that amongst your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I do have one question for you, Ann, before you leave. Regarding the sentiment survey, where do you get that data? We have a – our research data services has a very large, um, very large uh, database of emails of likely Florida visitors that we have collected over a number of years. And when this all started – and when Elliot asked us to, to um, reach out and do a travel sentiment study and get some sense of what people were thinking, we took that database, we compiled it into one gigantic pile, and we subdivided it out into a number of pulses so that we could tap new, new likely Florida visitors. The people in that database are global in nature, you know, so we have – Canadian visitors in there, and we have European visitors in there, just people with an interest in visiting Florida destinations. It is not manatee-specific, um, but they are likely Florida travelers. So, so that, that's what comprises that, that database. Uh, interesting, and it's all done through email. It is all done online, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Misty. Yes. I would like to comment, having been – involved with the airport forever, <laughs> that as of the 24th of February, we get Southwest back. They're going to start with umpteen flights. I think it's nine a day. And they're going to bring an awful lot of people in here. And they're going to put the screws to some of our other carriers, of course. But they were here before. They bought out AirTran, which is one of our carriers. And then they got mad for some reason or changed their mind and pulled out. At the time, that was a blow, but it wasn't a fatal blow, but, you know, it was really a blow. And our guys have been working ever since then saying, you made a mistake, you need to come back. And they finally agreed that they made that mistake, and they're gonna, they, they first said they were going to have a couple of flights. Then they got the three. Then they got the seven. And I think now they're going to start with, like, nine flights a day on average. Now, that is a lot of seats. So you're going to see a lot of a change, don't you think? Yeah. 900,000 passengers uh, they should bring in calendar year 21. That'll be a bunch. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Thank, you, thank you for that comment. That is very important and interesting. Okay, we're going to move on to item number eight, Nathan Benderson Park update, and Elliot is going to introduce Stephen Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, one of my buddies... Um, in the back in the community uh, as as many of the TDC knows uh, Manatee County's been a big supporter of Nathan Benerson Park and a big part of the partnership is is the the unique partnership between Manatee County Sarasota County and uh, and Benerson Corporation uh, uh, with the insight and um, big partnership of Randy Benerson uh, Stephen Rodriguez uh, got to meet him years ago before he took this job now three years ago. He was with the Sports Foundation up in Tallahassee for 18 years. And to bring that skill set to our region is um, is just priceless. So Stephen and I talk more than just uh, what activities are at Nathan Benerson Park. Uh, he's a mentor. Uh, he's, um, he's a consultant. And uh, we're actually working on uh, opportunities where we can bring business to Nathan Benerson Park and this convention center um, all in one proposal. So that's how far it extends. So we thought it was a good time uh, for Stephen to come and give you all kind of a state of Nathan Benerson Park. And uh, we're preparing our two-year budget, as you all know. So we thought the timing was good. So it's um, look forward to hearing an update. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Thank you for uh, the introduction. And I wanted to add one thing that I, when I moved down here, I chose to be a Manatee County resident as well. So, um, 
you know, a couple things uh, really interested me about Nathan Benderson Park when, when I decided to leave the foundation and come down here. And one of them is that Sarasota Bradenton partnership. I think that's very important to driving the success uh, that Nathan Benderson Park has had in terms of uh, generating sport tourism and exposure uh, to our community. So oh, there's our first slide. So um, the other thing that attracted me about Nathan Benderson Park is the, the amazing opportunity uh, for immediate success because of the nature of, of the facility. And uh, moving to slide two, uh, since uh, 2014, the park has generated uh, over $185 million of economic impact from events and team training, uh, which is calculated by Visit Sarasota. And that number should have been over $200 million this year, uh, but unfortunately the pandemic hit, and uh, we're going to have to delay that, that uh, announcement until hopefully uh, later this year uh, when we'll reach over $200 million of economic impact. We've held uh, over 456 events uh, at the park, and 83 nations have been represented at competitions uh, at the park since 2014. In addition, a very important part of what happens in Nathan Benerson Park in the wintertime is our team training, which we've had uh, 276 training visits since 2014. And last year, uh, our fiscal year 2020, uh, was going to be a record-setting year uh, in terms of team training with numerous weeks in the wintertime uh, at full capacity. And if you can imagine, for those of you that have been out to Nathan Benerson Park and the size of that lake, imagine how many athletes are out there <laughs> in order to be at full capacity um, of team training. Um, unfortunately, this year, our team training uh, season uh, has... has uh, basically been uh, uh, eliminated uh, due to training teams not traveling because of the pandemic. But we feel that uh, we are well poised uh, for next winter season uh, to continue that, that continued growth and success uh, of our team training. And uh, you'll see that there's a list here of notable events that have been hosted over uh, the, this period of 2014 to present. Uh, one of the, the amazing accomplishments is hosting three consecutive years of world rowing events. Uh, I came in one month before the world rowing championships in 2017, and the following year we hosted world rowing masters regatta, and then the follow, following year after that world rowing under 23 championships. In between there, we also hosted NCAA championships, numerous U.S. Rowing Southeast Regionals and U.S. Rowing Youth Nationals. And the park isn't just a rowing facility. We also hosted several World Cup and International Triathlon uh, Union triathlons, uh, numerous dragon boat festivals, and even modern pentathlon out in the park. So it truly is a multi-sport, uh, multi-functional facility. Can we go to the next slide? So those of you that know Nathan Benderson Park were conveniently, conveniently located uh, right on the, the Sarasota and Manatee County uh, uh, borders. And, um, you know, it truly is a regional asset. We found that events held at the park on average book 40% of their room nights in Manatee County. And you look at the, the uh, room inventory in a five-mile uh, radius, we have over 500 rooms in that inventory uh, that are located in Manatee County. Uh, so it, it makes sense uh, that, that we would have that many uh, bookings in, in Manatee. And in addition, you look at the UTC district that spans over across University Parkway uh, with hundreds of retailers and restaurants for, uh, for visitors to come in and enjoy. And um, we also, during the pandemic, uh, we conducted a market research survey uh, to learn a little bit about what our park users were doing at the park. And one thing that we found is 35% of our uh, frequent park users uh, are actually Manatee County residents. So the park on a regular basis uh, serves both counties. Slide four. So though uh, there's no doubt that, that the pandemic has uh, impacted our industry 
Uh, we have continued to operate throughout, and it was interesting to listen to the social media uh, presentation uh, earlier in this meeting because when the pandemic hit and events uh, started canceling, that's one of the first things that we did at the park was we took to social media uh, to stay in tune with our visitors, with our with our clientele, and um, and many of our programs moved to virtual uh, platforms and so forth. So we can continue to, even though we didn't have visitors coming in, we can continue to serve the community and stay in touch with uh, the, our audience uh, throughout the world. Um, a couple highlights on uh, events coming up here in 2021. Uh, we have in just three weeks, uh, rowing Olympic trials will be here. And though our team training, uh, like I said before, was pretty much eliminated, if you go out to the park right now, you'll see many Olympic hopefuls, individuals out there training right now, getting ready for Olympic trials. So uh, in addition to that, we have uh, Several other events that are coming in, we have NCAAs uh, this year. We have uh, ACA, which is a, a canoe and kayak Olympic trials coming up in March. So we have another uh, U.S. Rowing Youth Nationals as well. And one of the uh, new events for us on that list that was originally planned for uh, the summer and got moved into October is the U.S. DBF, which is U.S. Dragon Boat Federation Club Crew Championships, which I'll touch on uh, the, the nature of that event and the importance of that event here on the next slide. Uh, fiscal year 2022 is going to be uh, a, an exciting time. And the one thing I wanted to highlight, which is a very important event, and you can see the logo Hi, out there. Hi, Claire. How are you doing? Is there any chance I could do <laughs> lashes late today for me? <laughs> That that wasn't part of the presentation. So. <laughs> um, one of the, the most important events uh, that we'll have that is going to be impactful for our entire region is the International Dragon Boat Federation Rural Club Crew Championships, which will be coming in the summer of 2022. This will be the first time the event has been held in the U.S., uh, and in terms of athlete participation, this is potentially the largest event that has ever been held at Nathan Benderson Park. So this event is held every two years, and it's a world championship for, uh, for clubs throughout the world that qualify into um, the world championship. And um, the, last year it was scheduled to be in France, and, in, and when it was in France, which it got canceled because of the pandemic, uh, they had over 7,000 paddlers registered uh, for that event. So we, uh, we certainly expect to exceed uh, that number uh, for a number of different reasons. A, the event historically has been uh, continuously increasing in size, uh, but also with the cancellation of the event in France, the, club, the clubs throughout the world are going to be very eager to get back into competition. So uh, this is an event that, uh, that really uh, Sarasota County and, Br and Manatee County uh, we're going to have to work together to accommodate all these uh, <laughs> athletes and visitors coming in, certainly welcome them and uh, expose our region uh, to the world and, and to this uh, great group of, of competitors. So, and we're looking forward to working with Elliot and his staff on, on this event. So, go to the next slide. So one thing in, in, uh, in regards to our partnership that's, that's very key and important in everything that we do is, is really promoting that Sarasota Bradenton brand. And you can see that throughout uh, everything that, that we do in terms of events and team training, um, any of our uh, social media, our signage and so forth throughout the park. We're always uh, putting the, the BACVB brand out there, putting the Sarasota Bradenton uh, name out there, and, and you can see that in various event logos and so forth. It's very important to us uh, to, to promote our community as a region. And one of the things that it, that it does, uh, outside of the obviously uh, the exposure for the, for the community, but it actually strengthens, strengthens us uh, when we're talking to event owners and we're out uh, looking for events to host at the park. Um, it really makes our community stronger when they see more partners together 
and uh, in, in organizations working together. So we really appreciate uh, all of your support. We appreciate Elliot and your staff's uh, friendship and, and partnership. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the TDC? I don't see any. Thank Great. you. Thank Excellent you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, it's interesting. I've never had a partner reach out to us like Stephen and the board for Sanka to make sure that they're communicating with us. Uh, we're invited to all the board meetings, uh, making sure they give us proper backup. Uh, incredible partnership and um, love, to, love seeing it continue to grow. <laughs> Yes, sir. All right, Elliot, you're doing the next one, major sports event. I, I told one journalist uh, this event literally fell out of the sky into our lap. God is good. Um, you're, the last agenda item is an event called World Golf Championships. Uh, it was created by the International Federation of PGA Tours. Uh, that is going to come to the uh, Concession Golf Club. Uh, February, literally February 22nd to the 28th. For those of you who know the concession, it was designed by Jack Nicholas and Tony Jacklin. Uh, incredible. It's been rated one of the top 100 golf courses in the country for several years, owned by an incredible entrepreneur named Bruce Cassidy. And if it wasn't for Bruce, I wouldn't be making this presentation right now. Uh, the opportunity came to us. Uh, this event is moving from Mexico. Uh, to the United States uh, due to COVID. Uh, 72 of the best PGA players in the world will be participating uh, in this event. Uh, coincidentally, uh, Paul Azinger, a longtime Bradenton resident, will be our color commentator. Gosh, is that great? He'll be able to tell the story of the Bradenton area better than somebody like me. The hospitality industry will be impacted as early as February 22nd as well. There will be about 1,000 attendees per day allowed uh, on the ground at the concession. A normal year, you would see about 12,000 people per day. Okay. Uh, television coverage for this event. Two days on the Golf Channel, February 25 and 26. Uh, PGA Live and NBC National Television the weekend 27th and 28th. That'll bring us 100 million household viewers. Uh, there's one thing about people watching it. There's a whole other thing about the demographic viewership aligns perfectly with our target market when we are courting leisure visitors. Uh, NBC will sell their platforms to the international market that will get us into 120 countries and 800 million household viewers worldwide. Some other added value is we'll have a, a digital distribution on PGA Tour Live, Simon Class on um, GolfChannel.com. There will be social media component and print articles. We're already seeing uh, marketplace impressions about this event as well. And it, we're estimated to receive about six to eight weeks uh, of marketplace media impressions for the Bradenton, Sarasota area. We will also have destination information on the World Golf Championship website. There'll be some brand awareness uh, on the course as well. And uh, the concession has also worked to get our brand elements in front of the, the players' housing um, as well. You know, the one thing neat about uh, getting a world caliber event is this will brand not only the concession uh, as a world championship golf course, but it'll brand our region as another uh, event that this region is capable of hosting. Uh, so that'll give us an opportunity for future events as well. With that, uh, Sarasota County uh, is putting equity in this event. And uh, Schroeder Manatee Lakewood Ranch is also partnering uh, in this event. So it's a great partnership. Rick Piccolo at the airport uh, is sponsoring this event as well. And to be able to gather partners uh, with 46 days notice is incredible. Um, we met the people for um, the PGA Global Golf Management because of our relationship with the LECOM uh, golf tournament that will be a week prior to this uh, at National. Uh, so relationships play a big part in this with that. 
With that, uh, I'm asking for a recommendation of 250000 uh, to put into this event, and, uh, and then we would work with the concession golf club to, uh, uh, on the deliverables for this event. Chair. Yes, Mayor. Um, I, I have to tell you, I think this is what we're here for. And I, unless there's other comments, I would like to go ahead and make the motion to recommend to the county commissioner's expenditures of up to 250000 from the tourist development tax proceeds to sponsor the World Golf Championships to be held at the Concession Golf Club on February 25th through the 28th, 2021. Second. Thank you. It's been uh, motioned by Mayor Palmetto, Shirley Bryant, and seconded by the mayor of Bradenton, Jean Brown. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Pass this unanimously. <laughs> Madam Thank you. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, the one thing I was remiss to make sure, uh, we gave uh, NBC a list of uh, areas of the county to shoot. So a team uh, of NBC will be going around uh, from, from four corners of the county. Uh, for those of you who watch sports, between hits, between commercials, it'll showcase our destination really, really well. That is actually better than a 30-second spot. So um, stay tuned. Uh, watch it live, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, I'll be able to get you all some grand passes uh, for you to come out and, and experience it. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Elliot. And congratulations on getting that organized as quickly as you did. That's amazing. And look forward for future events as well. Y yes. <laughs> yes. All right. And now we're at the uh, new and old business part of our agenda. Is there any new or old business that a TDC member would like to bring up? I would. Yes, Jack. Back to the airport. With the addition of, of Southwest coming in, they are running out of places to put airplanes. And the original plan was to have a second part of the airport turned into a place for the planes to come in and discharge passengers and everything. And they are actively looking at that now, I'm sure, because when I was on the airport authority, we weren't anywhere near the need for that. But when they, this past year, before the putting hit the fan, they were up to 2.3 million passengers, and they were using the gates up daily. With Southwest coming in, that's going to put a real strain on the daily use of all those gates. And so that may force the airport and not force it, but press it to go forward with that second air side. And that, I mean, it was designed in the original plan. So <clears throat> when you drive into the airport, you drive around, and there's this long area there. Well, originally, there was supposed to be another air side off, off from that before you first drive in. And if they put that in, believe me, it will bring in more people. And be able to handle it, too. I just thought y'all want to know that. Yes, thank you for that. And that's to the east, right? The expansion yes. would be yeah, to the east. Just to the east of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's attached right where the airport building now ends. It would just go off on an angle there. And they've already, it's already paved out there. So all they need is put a building in it and some places for airplanes to park, and they're there. Nice. It's amazing. Um, Behind the scenes, what we don't know what goes on. Uh, I spent uh, a little bit of time with Rick Piccolo and Mark Stuckey, who you've all met. Um, Mark is, and Jack knows this, Mark is probably one of the most well-educated airport executives you'll find in the United States, accredited and everything. And the amount of fuel that's trucked into that airport daily now is just unbelievable until they, they build up more uh, fuel tanks uh, on property, parking. Um, they have software now to manage the gates uh, with the flights coming in and out. When I was in Brick's office, to see every gate with a plane uh, at it was just um, really, really exciting. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jack. Madam Chair, if I may, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, congratulations uh, uh, being chair for the second year in a row. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. Look forward to working with you. The next TDC meeting is April 19th. Let's just assume it'll be here, um, unless Monica lets us know otherwise. Uh, during the meeting, I received an email that I have to share, and I'm only sharing it because it has nothing to do with me. 
but it gives you an idea. Uh, this is why I love to come to work every day. Uh, this is um, uh, the tournament promoter that just spent three weekends at Premier Sports Campus with us last week, and it said, guys, I wanted to thank you three, Tanya, Dave, and Dale, for the amazing experience you gave me and the 500 plus teams that attended these three past weekends. I've been running tournaments for 20 plus years now, over 350 events to date, and this is by far the best service, hospitality that I've ever been involved with. Your team of workers were on spot at any moment and were very personable and accommodating. Look forward to many years working together in the future. Uh, over 500 teams at Premier uh, the past three weekends and I'd go in the subway or the pizza shop and and you just see the soccer kids in there. So it, it's so much more. Uh, Mayor, thank you for bringing up the sports segment. Um, I think that there's a uh, there was a concern of Sean leaving and I haven't communicated well enough to the hospitality. Actually, staff has been telling me to do a newsletter. So what we'll do, we'll get that out. And then in April, we'll give a sports segment update. Um, so everybody knows um, how aggressive we've been and um, real happy. The Cornhole Majors is coming in the first week of March. It's so Bradenton. And then the Worlds are coming in July 25th to August 2nd. Gene knows the way I am. Uh, it is perfect. Um, so all the Cornhole events will be right in this building. And then uh, they'll have the downtown area. They, they want a, the hotels to be nice and tight. So, um, And we're looping in the DeSoto Society to volunteer. There's a fundraising component with that as well. So uh, it's great to see everybody. And thank you for the support. And I look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a comment, Elliot, uh, on the sports market. As uh, we all know that since I moved to the county back 16, 17 years ago, I, would, I, would, I was never imagining the sports market could be so huge in our county, but now we are grown to the level, and thanks to you, your team, as well as the premier team to capturing that email as the compliment from the uh, organizers. The question is that do we expect to fill up Sean's shoes pretty soon, or what do we are looking into that? Uh, we have filled it. Um, and, and I'm going to do a newsletter, uh, and you all will be privy to that. Uh, geographically, we've allocated a staff to each area. For example, we have one staff person working with the Pittsburgh Pirates, Parks and Recreation. We have a staffer liaison with IMG Academy. And, and what that means, we've optimized that entire operation where everyone is cross-trained. Uh, Anna Pohl, who's the general manager of this facility, Premier, and the Crosley, uh, is overseeing that operation. To fill out an RFP for a sports event is very similar to filling out an RFP for a corporate event or a conference. Uh, so I, I believe in my heart that we're more powerful, and Sean did a great job, and we miss him. Um, but we, uh, we have um, just as good uh, communication with the marketplace as we have. Keep in mind we have Rush York, who uh, is our national bird dog salesperson out of Indiana. We brought him in in November, and we had a two-and-a-half-day retreat with him, strategically planned, uh, and we also had him meet the players like IMG Academy, the Pittsburgh Pirates, and Premier Sports Campus. So um, uh, it's a segment that we are focused on. It's a segment that helps keep those numbers that Ann put up there. We are one of the most diverse counties in the state of Florida from a mix of visitors. Uh, without that, you're going to see big ebbs, ebbs and flows um, without that. So, of course, the convention business is the last void in our tool belt. Hopefully, we'll address that in the next six to eight months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mayor Brown. Thank you. And, and Elliot, I think that'll be important, and I appreciate you saying that, to get some information out there because, obviously, if we weren't in a pandemic, I don't know that the worry would be as much because, you know, other things would be going well, too. But I think that's a market that – We've seen get more consistent that for smaller hotels, it would be something that would keep them afloat longer because the last thing we want to see is anybody go under, you know, at this time. Yeah, Mayor, one of the challenges that we do have is 3,500 additional rooms in the region. Mm -hmm. I'm, be, I'm, I'm real candid. Uh, we had an event 
uh, a month or so ago that a lot of room nights from Premier bled into Sarasota County. Um, and not that we're being selfish, but there's times when we partner and both counties uh, are impacted like the World Golf Championships. And there's times that we try to keep uh, all the room nights in Manatee County through a third party housing. So once we got the report and it was like, uh oh, how did that happen? Uh, we addressed it quickly. So um, um, there's a lot of work to do. And um, we'll come up with a nice report uh, before the TDC meeting in April and then uh, at April so that the, the, the residents can see what we're doing related to the support segment. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments from the TDC? Um, Elliot, would you please uh, share the email with me that you read to the TDC? I'd like to share it with the county commissioners. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Okay, cool. Thank you. We are back for the afternoon session. We have a 1.30 time certain uh, the report on 9th Avenue Northwest. It is item number 40. Yes, ma'am, Madam Hi, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Chad Butzel from our Public Works Department, the director, it will be stepping up. And also to my right, um, this is Scott May. He's our county engineer, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Good afternoon, Madam, sorry, Madam Commission and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Scott May. I am the Engineering Services Deputy Director and uh, County Engineer. Basically, uh, with Sia retiring, I've now taken that over. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce, we're going to be doing a presentation. We have brought Kimley Horn on board, who will be doing the, pr the uh, presentation. And this is for the 9th Avenue Northwest, which is from a little bit east of 75th all the way to 99th at the Robinson Preserve entrance. Um, we were looking at moving forward with this back in December. Uh, and after some input from the board and the commissioners and uh, the public, we've taken a look back at what options can we look at to uh, still achieve the goals with uh, minimizing costs while we're looking at that. And then Kimley Horn will be presenting that. Okay, great. And Thank we'll you. be glad to answer any questions afterward. All right. Thank you. Wonderful. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thanks for having us. Jared Schneider with Kimley Horn, as Scott mentioned. Um, so what we're going to talk quickly about today is how we applied complete street principles to the, the corridor and then some of the outreach that we had as well as the, the concepts. So this is about a, a mile and a half section, as Scott mentioned, from 99th Street to 75th Street. We split the corridor into to four different pieces, segment A, B, C, and D, just because of the different character in the area. So what do we mean about, about complete streets? What we did in the past when we were doing roadway design is really we seek to maximize auto traffic. And that's, that's changed over the years. And, and I'm excited to you know, mention that Mantee County staff's really been doing a lot with complete streets over the years. So there's some complete street standards. And you know, these type of opportunities don't come up very often. So this is an opportunity to look at this corridor. And what complete street seeks to do is, is look at different types of projects, drainage, um, you know, mo mobility improvements. And, and do it all at the same time. And you know, we got a picture on the bottom left there of it looks like a downtown. That's, that's not what we're trying to do here. Complete Streets really looks at the surrounding context. So 9th Avenue Northwest, we know, is not a downtown area. But again, looking at how do we plan for different, different users, not just cars. So I'm going to walk through kind of three items we heard as we started this process last year. Um, creating safer streets, drainage, and multimodal connectivity were three items that came up. This map I'm showing before you is the crashes that occurred in 2015 to 2019. Um, so from a safety aspect, that's something that we heard as we, as we jumped into this project. This was something that came up um, over and over again. And, and we talked about there's 16 crashes in that time frame and, and one, one death. There was also... Um, Joey, who, you know, the Peace Walker, as he's known, was, was killed, but it's not, that's not included in these numbers. Um, a number, number of other things that we heard was the narrowness of the roadway on the west side of the corridor. That came up time and time again. You know, the second item, drainage, that's, that's come up uh, the map before you. The red is the lower-lying areas. Um, so on the west side of the, the corridor, as you get to Robinson Preserve. So we did kind of with this conceptual phase... Uh, conceptual drainage analysis. We looked at the data, went out there with, with staff and walked the corridor and did that field review and created the drainage report. And what we were trying to do is come up with different options to convey water. Um, we looked at the water quality approach and it, really that segment A, which is again on that west side, we looked at how do we convey that out, out of there. The third item is the multimodal connectivity. And, and this is one I, f I feel pretty passionate about. One thing we looked at is overall, how do we connect um, the, the trail network came up. So that's something that's in the Metropolitan Planning Organization's plan. Sarasota Mantee NPO is connecting uh, the trails in the area. So this map before you in, in red, we're showing the existing sidewalks. So there's currently some gaps on the south side of the corridor as, as well as the, the west side of the corridor. So how do we create this um, 
you know, more natural connection. And again, we were looking at you know, how do we, how do we provide for, for all users? So a lot of what we've heard are from the bicyclists having uh, bike lanes, but there's also bike, casual bike riders like children. Um, so we're looking at how do we provide um, it, items for everyone. Also, there's trucks on the west side that we've heard quite a bit about. So to, to roll into the kind of the outreach, we had, uh, this is, um, we're really happy with Manatee County staff. We, this is when COVID was starting, we went out and, and did kind of a, um, created a website and we posted a survey online, had over 800 letters go out to folks around the corridor. Um, two, over 200 responded. And some of the biggest issues we heard were sidewalk gaps, connectivity, the absence of bike lanes and the, the narrowness of the roadway, particularly on that, that west side. Speeding came up as, as well. So those were some of the top, top issues. And the, the chart we're just basically showing, it's, it's kind of a weighted average. So one of the things we tried to do is create um, 10 options for folks to rank, but then we also try to keep open responses so folks could respond if they had other issues that they were seeing out there that weren't on the list. We also provided some concepts, and that was just to really kind of gauge and get some, some feedback and input, and today we'll, we'll present some other options as well. But again, we were just trying to get some feedback, and then we had kind of the open responses. And it, you know what I thought was kind of neat is we got 25 pages of, of responses, so that, that was really, really great to get a lot of comments back. And a lot of times when you're getting into these roadway design projects, you don't have that kind of feedback before you go into it. So this is a good jumping off, jumping off point. This slide kind of summarizes some of the similar things. Sidewalks, multi-use trails came up. You know, a lot of folks talked about uh, they were in favor of, of lighting, but then also being careful on that. And that went back to the rural character of, of not overdoing it, um, not, not lighting up the sky. A lot of good comments about um, kind of how you can see the stars out there. And the same thing with the landscaping. Some folks liked it, some didn't. Uh, a lot of folks talked about doing more native landscaping. Um, and there was a lot of comments on the dedicated on-street bike lanes. That's something that came up quite a bit. So now I'm gonna transition. I'm gonna get into kind of the proposed concepts and opportunities. And I'll note there's three different options. And we have three different options for each segment, segment A, B, and C. This wasn't meant to be a menu approach where we would apply one option um, on one segment and then change it up. Um, so where I go through the minimalist, it was really kind of consistently throughout the whole corridor. Uh, so the minimalist approach is, is really what can we do with you know, less resources, just fix some of the issues, and then it, they start to build up, enhances stepping it up a little bit, and then complete streets are the kind of the full options. So some of the things, again, on, on segment A, we talked about uh, you know, that opportunity of this is a crown jewel for, for Manatee County, that trail connection to Robinson Preserve. This is the corridor that people are using to get there. We talked about the open drainage uh, being, being an issue. That came up. Some people liked it. Some people didn't. And then the narrowness of the roadway. So this is how it looks today. We've got kind of the open swale drainage. And this is looking east. And we've got nine foot travel lanes. This is not the way we would design roadways today. Um, typically in this context, and again, we were, this is really our first opportunity to apply Manatee County's complete street standards. And that's where we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 11 foot travel lanes in this area. Now that being said, we heard in the comments, you don't wanna to go too wide because then you encourage speeding. So there's, there's a balance there. So we looked at this minimalist approach and this came from feedback we received after the kind of the outreach session. And I'll kind of point you towards the right where we've got the improvements. As I go through the concepts, we'll build on that so you can see kind of the, the changes because some of, some of them are subtle. So what we've got here are widening the roadway and I don't know if you can see my cursor, yes, great. This is the existing roadway today in black. And then what we did was widen the roadway to provide just a little bit more cushion as folks are driving through there with trucks. And I know we've got Orbins and other things in there. And then we created the trail on the north. Um, one thing I'll note is we are getting into right away. So that, that's something with some of the previous options we really tried to get away from not having to go acquire right away. Uh, it's really something that we heard when we jumped on this project was let's get this done as fast as possible because of the safety issue. We're also talking about redoing the ditches for grading hydraulics to convey the water to Robinson's Preserve. So that's, that's the minimalist improvements. And then enhance, we're stepping it up just a little bit. You'll see kind of how this changes here. We're talking about doing additional drainage improvements. And, and what we mean by that is 
um, raising the roadway um, for the submerged roadway conditions, and then redoing the swales slightly to convey to Robinson's Preserve. And then we looked at just some key lighting, uh, or lighting at key intersections. Again, this enhanced improvement option, that's we're showing in this gray area where we, we would need to require we would require some right-of-way acquisition on the north side. This is the full kind of complete streets improvement. And again, I'll just kind of note, we're showing what's, what's changed. We're now closing the drainage. Uh, we're doing a sidewalk to connect one of the few gaps on the north side. Uh, we, we showed kind of a roadway reconstruction, raising the roadway for submerged conditions. And then we've got the trail on the south side and then full lighting along the corridor. Again, that's, that's something I know as it moves to design that's gonna to need to be talked about because there are concerns about lighting it up too much. But these are kind of pedestrian scale lighting. We also talked about how this is really kind of a shotgun and approach here. It's, it's a straight shot and that's why a lot of people speed. So we looked at some concepts of doing three mini roundabouts in certain locations. And so that's, that's an option as well. So now I'm gonna to transition to segment B, and again, that's kind of in that, that middle section. You got Palma Solo Community Church, you've got Hawthorne Park on, on the left there. So we, some of the issues we saw are the landscaping utilities are close to the roadway. You, you do have some existing landscaping that would need to be you know, kind of looked at in, in the design, and then obviously the, the cemetery is something we were really trying to, you know, we were avoiding. So this is what it looks like today. You got Palma Solo on the left, um, and this is kind of 14 pretty wide lanes. We wouldn't, again, design it this way if we were starting over. Usually we're looking at a 10 or 11 foot in this section. You do have some narrow kind of four foot bike lanes, but it's a, it's a lot of pavement that's out there today. So one of the minimalist approaches we looked at is really just kind of hashing out using the pavement that's out there. And, and I'll note this red kind of dashing on the left and the right you'll see that's, that's kind of what's uh, out there today. So using that pavement, let me go back, apologize. So using that pavement, we could do a kind of a 10 foot trail and then stripe it what, with what we call flex post. And there's just one kind of gap there on the north by, by the cemetery. Again, we're, we're avoiding that. So that's, that's an option, but we did not pursue that just because we fell from a safety aspect. Um, more and more DOTs trying to do raised trails and, and, and then from the safety aspect, you could also have cars come in here. Um, obviously you could look at the intersections, but you could have cars come in here and then the maintenance as well. So we did not pursue that. We did something similar where we raised the trail on the north side with the minimalist and, and basically just used the same pavement that's out there, but ate into it on the north side and, and started to get into those kind of narrower conditions to, to just slow people down a little bit. And then we've got the bike lanes in there as well. The enhanced, really not a lot of difference from the minimalist. We just, again, with all the enhanced, we're lighting at key intersections to provide a little bit more lighting. On segment B, as when we get into the complete streets improvement, now we're, we're changing this a little bit. We've got 11 foot travel lanes. We're, we've got the sidewalk on the north. Um, again, trying to stay consistent with what we showed on segment A, and then we did full pedestrian scale lighting along the corridor and enhanced landscaping. This is something that came up again if, and something that could be looked at further. We talked a lot with staff about doing native kind of plantings and keeping consistent with what's out there with Robinson Preserve. You know, is this a gateway into Robinson Preserve? So I, I know there's, there's oftentimes concerns with landscaping, but could we do kind of more native plantings? And that's something staff was, some staff were, were really we we're going back and forth and talking about, which is a good, good thing. And also having the landscaping as an edge is something we were trying to do on this co concept to slow speeds down. So now I'm gonna to transition to segment C. What we're getting into is, is kind of towards the 75th Street area, to, uh, all the way on the, the left to 82nd. We looked at doing some raised intersections to kind of slow speeds down there at 83rd is one that we showed and then doing a, a pedestrian scale crossing for, for the kids that are trying to go to the middle school, and then you've got the, the park there as well. So those were some recommendations we had in this area. This is what segment C looks like, looking east towards 75th Street, and you've got a lot of kind of pavement out there again, 13, 14 foot travel lanes with 
four foot bike lanes. So we're looking at ways that we can kind of just tame that down a little bit. So the minimalist, that's where we could use again in the red dashing. That's using the pavement that's out there, resurfacing it, and, and then just restriping it. So narrowing the lanes down, but doing wider bike lanes. And that's something DOT is using kind of a standard seven foot bike lane today. So that's, that's where we apply that and that matches up with the earth standards as well. And then we've got the, the trail on the north side, the 10 foot trail. So jumping up in enhance, you'll know that not a lot of difference there. That's just lighting at key intersections. So the enhance is, is the same as the minimalist approach. This full complete streets, this is where we're showing um, a wider sidewalk on the north and then the, the trail on the south. And then we've got the crossing in there with, with landscape medians. And, and this could be kind of low-lying shrubs, something that doesn't really um, get in the way from the the site of vision. And then we've got um, kind of landscaping on the edge, and that's something, again, where we thought Florida native landscaping could be an option here. <coughs> Segment Ds, really, we're not gonna go into a bunch of options. That's um, creating a, a sidewalk connection on the south side as you get into 75th Street. So I know we went over a lot there. This is kind of a culmination, a summary of, of the different options. And, and what we did is we kind of combined the minimalist, and then we had the enhanced, and then the complete streets. And again, it just kind of builds off, off of each other. You know, the minimalist, if you do nothing else, some slight widening, some curb adjustments for a trail um, to provide options for you know, kids, and, and, and then cyclists could ride on street um, with, the little, with the widening. Minimal drainage improvements, so, you know, the trade-off there is you're not fixing necessarily all the drainage issues. Um, the vehicular safety, minor improvements. And then we start to step it up with the enhanced, where you get, you raise the roadway, you address some of the, the drainage issues that are out there. Um, you know, with mitigating the submerged roadway, you include shoulders and some piping. And <coughs> we looked at kind of moderate improvements from the vehicular safety standpoint. Um, and then there's the lighting at the key intersections. The complete streets builds on even further, and there's you know there's things you could talk we could talk about in there, but there's a full road reconstruction, again raising the roadway. We kind of showed those improvements of doing the sidewalk on the north, and then the trail on the south. And again, we were trying to do the trail on the south to mitigate tearing up the sidewalk on the north. And then what we're talking about is pedestrian scale lighting throughout the corridor and key intersections, and then the landscaping adjacent to the roadway and, and along some sections of the median. We also include, and this is where there's options within here, is um, side friction. So we did some raised intersections that we talked about and some deflected intersections. Um, the the trade-off here is, again, when we built this concept, the complete streets, we were really focused on, on avoiding right away. So we said none anticipated this point. Uh, as you can see, the costs ramp up. So, you know, again, we were looking at for the complete streets just when we got onto this project, getting it done as fast as possible. There's some footnotes I want to point to down there at the bottom. The, the minimalist includes drainage to Robinson Preserve. Uh, we, did not, we did not include the mini roundabouts that we kind of presented that option. But those are around 150 to 250 um, typically. And then, um, you know, I will note too, the CIP, the original project, was budgeted for 11.4, so we were... We were fitting all of these options, going from the minimalist all the way to the enhanced the complete street within that, in, within that range. Again, I know that's a lot of information today. We're just we're here to kind of get, get your input, um, kind of get our path forward to selecting kind of a design, finalizing the scope for that, and then beginning the engineering design of 9th Avenue Northwest. Improvements is scheduled for 2021, early 2022. So with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Thanks very much. Commissioner Servio. Yes, thank you. Great presentation, great visuals. I appreciate that. Um, you know, retrofitting these types of streets is so difficult when we're trying to create complete streets. I, I totally understand it's easier when we're just building a new street. And so I have some questions. The, the different um, scenarios that you provided, the A, B, and C, do they truly build upon one another so that if, if we did option B, 
but in a couple years wanted to do option C, there would be no redo or tear out. Mm -hmm. It would just be adding additional things. Is that basically true? I know the roundabouts would be a different scenario. The, the minimalists and enhance are building up of each other. The, the complete street would be a little bit different because the trail's on the, the other side. And uh, yeah, Commissioner Servia, you're absolutely right. The kind of the, the roundabout, many roundabouts would build on top of each other as well. Okay, and I really like the 10 foot wide lanes. Is that a new standard? Have we gone from 12 to 10? Uh, I have to take that real quick. Sure. Um, we, we have the complete streets that has been adopted for the standards and everything. And with that, it's basically looking at a holistic approach mm -hmm. for neighborhoods and all of that. And so, yes, we have went down as low as 10 feet now for lanes to help slow traffic, you know, based upon what you're looking at. Now, a thoroughfare, we wouldn't look at a 10 foot lane, but neighborhoods and things where you want to slow it down a little bit, 10 foot seems to do that job better. And I generally like that. I just, I ask, I want to ask a question, like if you had a school bus go down that roadway and I'm thinking of a larger vehicle with the side mirrors, mm -hmm. is there any problem if they were, if you had two of them at the exact same time passing, would there be a conflict? There shouldn't be a conflict, but depending on, of course, putting the caveat there, depending on where they're driving at in the road. Right. Uh, if they're right. like right up against the center line equivalent and the bus is right up against the center line, then of course there's that potential. But if you drive like normal, they're 10 foot wide. They're, you know, if you look at a lot of parking lots, they're nine foot wide, mm -hmm. yeah. um, sometimes 10. So when you get a 10, you feel like you got all that luxury in there. Yeah. But when you're driving, it does slow it down. But no, it wouldn't create a problem for that. Yeah, it, it is a really good shift because when people see a wider lane, they move faster. I used to live on a street that was 50 feet wide mm -hmm. um, uh, in pavement, pavement, and it was wider than an I-75 lane, and people sped like it was too. Um, okay, let me ask you about the raised intersections. Mm -hmm. Can you have, that's a collector road, is it not? Mm -hmm. Is it a collector? Yeah, that's a collector roadway. So yeah. can you have the raised intersections on a collector? I think about public safety vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is is there a conflict or does it work? Yeah, it, it's, it's worked in other areas. It's very gradual, kind of just enough to slow you down. It, it's not like the, the speed bumps that you see out there that are pretty rough on them. Yeah, they're usually designed for kind of EMS and fire trucks to get through there. Okay, okay. Um, and is is there an option to use just a different um, material or color? Like sometimes you see a brick pattern at those intersections or where walkways would naturally be. And I think that that visual kind of triggers the driver to slow down a little bit. Um, or they can even feel the difference in the pavement versus the bricks in that example. Mm -hmm. Is that um, a tool that you think we could use as well? At, Yes. Yeah, there's certainly different pavement styles. There's obviously different costs with that. Color, I think you hit on, is a great way to, to do that. So there's some that'll just paint the pavement or, yeah, different different patterns, like you said, have been used all over. And the open ditch drainage. So if, if, we, um, if we eliminated that in favor of piping it for drainage, then we gain uh, that, that right-of-way that can be used and I'm sure there's a cost analysis. You know, if we if we leave it open, um, it's going to cost X dollars to have the drainage and acquire more right of way, versus if we mm -hmm. do the piping of the ditch and then put a, a trailer or walkway on top, it's going to cost X amount, and then we can make a decision. Is that accurate? You guys could do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Whitmore. Um, the 10-foot lanes, we did them on 301 over the years, and I've seen them other where it's like a multi-use almost where golf carts, bicycles, people, and it makes it a lot more safer. My question, oh, and you mentioned the bricks. That's what we did before I came on, but it already been approved. Cortez Road and the Cortez Bridge, Jane Monahaman and all of them had suggested that, and they've been miserable ever since because the noise, anytime you go over it. And we haven't done anything about it, but for years we've been getting complaints about that. So the faster you go, the more noise, as you know. But um, my question mainly was the lighting, because that is a passive road. I mean, you're going to a preserve. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to look like a big city. Um, is there special lighting that you can 
I know there must be, like I know in the islands they have turtle lighting where it's just direct down. Uh, and you mentioned pedestrian lighting on the total complete side, but you really could do that everywhere, right? I mean, I, I just remember Rainy Phillips and the group came before when Steve was on the board, um, almost had gotten hit on their bicycles a few times and they came before the board and pleaded to us um, with another, with a pedestrian um, multi-use multi path and lighting that would help. So thoughts about that? Because I, I would want it to be more, you know, stay um, passive. Not a, a big street like you see on University mm -hmm. Parkway or, you know, with all the lights. It, that's not the character of that area. Yeah, that's something that came across in the, the comments quite a bit, too, and, and keeping that character. There's the way ways you can do with the pedestrian scale lighting, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. Commissioner, just to kind of scale downward. Mm -hmm. um, definitely something that would need to be looked at. And then uh, the LED lighting is a lot, lot different nowadays. That's a lot. It's not quite that bright effect, so that's something that's used quite a bit as well. And 17th Avenue, which we're not talking about today, has the exact same issues, except they got more residential. Hmm. And that'd be a lot more right away we'd have to acquire. So anyway, um, I'm not sure, you know, uh, where it's going. But this is just a presentation, right, with suggestions from us and then direction. Okay. Well, we, we'd like to try to have direction to start getting the EOR on board, the engineer record to start looking at the design of that so that we can try to get this moving forward and get this project. And is the completed. money fully funded in the CIP already? It was an IST uh, infrastructure Good. sales tax okay. project. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a great presentation. I was trying to go back and compare it to the one that we were going to hear in November, right as we came on. And then this is the, the revised one. And uh, I, I think it's great. You know, I, I've been saying, you know, we need to focus on non-road infrastructure at, at some point in time. We're just getting too big to only focus on figuring out how to widen roads all day long. Uh, and, and Robbins Observe is pretty much the the crown jewel of our, our outside active environment here in Manatee County. And, you know, this road leading up to it leaves something to be desired. We want people, you know, ideally to have much longer trails and, and systems to be able to get to someplace like Robbins Observe and, and not risk their lives trying to try to bike down this road just to get to where we want them to go, which is Robbins Observe. We want it more inviting. Uh, so I think this is great. But uh, just from a direction standpoint, me personally, you know, this isn't the kind of road you want to get somebody through faster. You want to get them through it safer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where my focus would be on it. You know, I like the roundabouts. I like the, the traffic calming aspects of it. There shouldn't be a, a speedway. There shouldn't be, you know, how wide can we make this and, and how fast can we get people to Robinson Observe? This is supposed to be, you know, a place where we have wider trail systems and uh, ways of people to bike and run and, and do more multimodal kind of non-vehicular uh, transportation down this road. So, so I like it. I, I think all three options are great. Obviously, the devil's in the details from a cost standpoint. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what the next step is if you're just looking for direction because they all kind of did the same thing. They, they all kept the, the lanes narrower so you're not turning this into a 50-mile-an-hour speedway. Um, I, I do like the, the roundabouts or, or any other system that, to keep people – because, you know, to your point, this is as straight as, as you can get on a road. Mm -hmm. If you left those roundabouts out – people are, are just going to blow down this road, especially at night, especially if you're not putting lights on there. But, uh, you know, I, I do like the, the big trails. I think this is this is great. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what we come up with, and I think it's going to be money well spent because, you know, it incorporates Robinson Preserve. Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. It's very good. I, I've been getting into the weeds a bit with uh, residents as well as Chad on this one um, sort of holds a special place for me. I grew up down here. Uh, I spent a large portion of my childhood playing down at the end of this road. Um, and the county built Robinson Preserve, which for which we're very grateful. As a result of that, we have this added traffic coming down this road. So, you know, this is something that um, sort of an issue that the county created, you know, all positives, but, you know, there's always uh, repercussions for everything you do, right? Um, so, We've created these sort of safety issues down there. Um, timing is obviously essential in this one. I do favor the narrow lanes in an effort to sort of calm traffic. Mm -hmm. um, this road, not that I'm telling you that I personally know this, but 
this road is a bit of a drag strip, especially <laughs> at night. Um, <laughs> um, so, but it is, it really is. It's straight, it's wide open. It, it's a bit of a drag strip. People fly up and down this road. Uh, I also, I do want to maintain the rural, the rural sort of character down there at the end of the road, uh, down towards the end by Geraldson's and uh, by Robinson. So I tend to favor the more minimalist approach, not that one entirely, but I like the idea of keeping open drainage on the south side of the road. Um, and I like the, I love the idea of the multi-use trail on the north side running ultimately from 99th all the way um, up to 75th Street. And elevated um, intersections, I, I like that because I'm not a big fan of actual speed bumps or speed speed tables. I'm not a fan of those at all. Um, I feel like I pay taxes so that the government can build obstacles that tear up my car as I drive down the road. <laughs> um, so I, I like the elevated intersections. I prefer the elevated intersections over that. Um, and uh, I'm not I, with Carol Whitmore. On I was you know right there with you. The bricks ultimately are just going to make noise, and it's oh. pretty heavily residential down there. Uh, about the time we get the bricks in, I'm going to get flooded with emails, and I'll call you like 30 days later to tear the bricks out. So I'm thinking the bricks are not the way to go. Uh, but it's a great project. It's needed. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Commissioner Johnson, who put an awful lot of work yes, uh, in did. with residents um, and did a lot to uh, you know achieve the funding for this project. Mm -hmm. So I, I favor more the minimalist approach. I would like some some lighting down there at the end, though, but I also don't want to make it look like you know, an annex of Sarasota International Airport either, yeah. um, right. because there is a rural field Subtle. down there that we want to maintain. So thank Subtle. you. If I can, real quick, Commissioner. Um, you know, we had the the general, the minimalist, and we had the enhanced, which one of the big things I want to point out is that I, there is some road surcharging that does occur out there, oh. and that's kind of where, you know, with the enhanced, we can raise that road up a little bit. So it's a minimal amount of work still, but at least you're taking care of like during a rain event where it might overtop the road temporarily. Sure. I think the objective here is we're trying to achieve safety. We're trying to achieve some tra achieve some traffic calming. Uh, it would be nice to achieve some aesthetics. Um, but when I first came, when I first walked into this, it was like thirteen and a half million dollars for a little over a third of a mile, and that's not going to fly. Um, right. Even if it's in my district, that's that's still a bit much. And I also worry that some of the the landscaping. We have issues on Manatee Avenue with maintaining the landscaping right. and the medians. I, I doubt it's going to be a top priority down 9th Avenue Northwest to maintain yeah. the medians. And I just, it's going to look great for the first summer. And then, and then after that, where are we going to be, right? So I don't, I don't want, you know, weeds in the middle of 9th Avenue. Um, so, you know, a, a minimalist of upkeep would be nice as well. Yeah, just to reiterate, the, the enhanced doesn't add the landscaping and all that in. It was mostly just making a safer path where... And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, where we were raising it up so that they weren't at the same elevation sure. of that and then looking well, at some of the road overtopping, but I don't think we were doing any landscaping No, there's no landscaping in the enhanced. Okay, if we're, if we're simply raising it for safety, I'm, I'm all for that. I don't want to get into... It, it seemed that when we started enclosing the drainage on both sides of the road, we, we started to acquire right-of-way. The price started going through the roof, and it, yeah. it was enclosing the drainage on both sides, and it was the right-of-way acquisition that we're having that effect. Right. And, the, and that's the only, only addition with enhance is the right-of-way acquisition that would right. need to be... Okay. But, you know, it, we are looking at down at right at the entrance, we would probably have to pipe that end area yeah. in only because of the existing homes and where they're located at with the driveways. On both sides of the road? No, we're only looking at on the north side. Okay, of the, the, road. Side, right. the south yep, would stay completely. Ba we're basically not touching the south side of the road with that. Correct. That's, that's what I favor. So, okay. okay. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. I have a question on the drainage and those of us that go down it. On the north, the south side, which you're talking about, you're going to leave open. It's always flush to the road and green because of the runoff. We got Orbans and all that around there. Um, now, the the enhanced one, uh, you're going to uh, leave the south side open, so you'll still have that. And is that going to be able to compensate all that extra drainage if you're piping in the north side? Um, with the changes that we're making, it's minimal amount. There is basically a zero offset on that. I don't think it can handle a minimal amount. It's almost flush to the road, but that's why you're probably living. Yeah. Yeah. We're not putting it. We're actually putting less pavement, or we're putting the like a half a foot more, I think it is, yeah, onto the south side. On the north side, we north would be regrading like the half. ditch and making it a little bit larger. The only area in that segment that we were talking about is just the, the last two homes right at 99th, mm -hmm. where we wouldn't have that ability 
because of the way the existing uh, house is and the drives and things like that where we would need to pipe that piece. Is that the Bystrom's? I think it may be, but uh, it's, um, I just want to make sure that we're not going to put any more drainage if we're raising the road to go into the residential area. No. Yeah. Okay. With the engineering, you can assure. Yeah, I, I support the minimalist or the, you know, we'll look at the enhanced, but yeah, one of the two, but not the complete, not the main one. He's saying he's raising the road elevation, but, but the, the permeability right. aspect yeah. isn't really differing by much it's at all. It's just right? that it's flush with the road now, and I understand why you you're raising it. You see that? It's not a regular day. It's flush. Because right. yeah. when the tides are up, it goes up. Right. Yeah, that's and that's what we were trying to do with enhanced is to kind of improve the situation now. It's not to the level of, of the full complete street. Um, but yeah, we're looking at kind of conveying that to Robinson Preserve and right. making it a little bit better. So the, the north side, the south side will be um, swale drainage and the north side will be piped. Correct. No, just just in front of the two homes. Just for, Oh, got it. The okay. rest of it would still be a swale all the way to Hawthorne Park. Right, okay, I know where it's It's just yeah. a matter of where those two are with the existing homes that are there. We didn't see a way that we could do swale system with the existing location of the homes and with the uh, drive approaches Thanks. and such. Okay, yeah, it gets I'm, into a right-of-way issue. I'm next, and I don't really have a question. I've been listening to everything that's been said. I, for one, will go with uh, the recommendation of the district commissioner. You know, you've talked to the residents in the area. You know what they're looking for. I know that Commissioner Johnson started this, this process when he was on board, and I know he worked very hard to get this moving forward. So I'll go with his recommendations, me personally. Um, I don't see any other... Commissioners on the board, anyone else have anything they want to say? No, we don't have it. It's not there. Um, is there anyone from the public that would like to make a public comment on this? If so, please come down and state your name, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you, George. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioners. Joe McClash. Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you. Back. Happy New Year. And uh, I've been living out in Northwest Bradenton since 1980. I'm not sure if you were born yet there or not, Kevin. But oh, he was born. I think you were. <laughs> so I got a, a quick presentation, and let me say I appreciate um, staffs. Um, uh, willingness to meet on site and talk about these issues and I think it, it created a better presentation I met with the county administrator out there as well as some commissioners um, so I'm favoring the minimalistic type of approach but more of a hybrid and so if you want to pull up this slide all right control room I guess you have to switch it back there Charles wake up you get All right. All right. So the minimalistic, of course, saves millions of dollars, you know, and I appreciate those comments. Um, the safety issue, really, that you have no sidewalk, you know, you've seen this from the consultant from 99th Street to Hawthorne. On the bottom right is a little dog leg of a sidewalk after you get to the west side of Hawthorne. It actually jogs out there at the current time. Duncan's Farm Site, Jubilee Farms. Mm -hmm. He has an approved site plan that actually required a sidewalk and also landscaping. So one of the things I feel is that you might be able to negotiate some right away and do it right out there and then maybe just waive his landscape buffer or whatever you have to do or, or uh, deal with that at a later time. But there is a site plan. This is the sidewalk of how it looks. It's really nice, like you're saying, Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. We want to keep that characteristic. Now, this sidewalk is actually on Hawthorne Park's property, from what I understand, so they maintain it. This is that dog leg coming to 9th Avenue, so you have a ditch uh, that you have to cross over about 20 feet. This is the area along um, uh, the cemetery area. So when Pat Neal actually built Azalea Park, he was supposed to do a sidewalk, but because the cemetery was there, oh. he did not want to disturb the grave sites. So staff's recommendation of pushing the road um, a little bit narrower and, and putting the sidewalk there, it's just a no-brainer and something we could do right away. Um, all right. This is the um, 
area right there at, um, get my bearings again, I think this is um, 75th to 71st Street. You didn't have that in the presentation, but I thought it was going to be discussed today, but you already have a sidewalk there. Um, so the needed sidewalk is about 1,700 feet from Hawthorne to 99th Street with the one ditch crossing. We already showed you that to the right. You can see the ditch that you have to cross, not a major. This is the piping that you were talking about at 99th Street, the gate there, mm -hmm. um, uh, right before you get to 99th. So that would be what staff was talking about, the only ditch and needed. <laughs> this is the um, 400 feet of sidewalk next to the cemetery that would, uh, we were talking about. And, you know, staff already, you know, reduced the lane widths down to 10 feet apiece, and so it really helps. Um, just if you allow me a little extra time, Madam Chairman, I want to go into the roundabouts, the mini roundabouts. I'm not sure if Another we really Another minute, Joe. Tried them? Another minute, minute okay. please. Thank so you. So this is what the roundabouts, um, if you scaled them out, would look like. And I think you could probably put it in a minimalistic project and get rid of the speed bumps. I'm glad you're not a fan of speed bumps. If I was ever in an ambulance riding from my house, I would just be horrific, horrified as far as going over one. They lower um, speeds and... One thing the county's not doing is doing an analysis uh, before speed tables, uh, what the speed was and afterwards. So the savings um, is millions of dollars. I think you could probably get the cost down to about a little bit over a million dollars, include your sidewalks and widen, um, you know, things that are necessary, but it certainly doesn't need to be the gigantic project it started out to be. I was in sticker shock. So thanks for your time. and. You know, I, I would like to see something come back a little bit more of a modified with this roundabouts, mini roundabouts in front of um, those three locations. Your three roundabouts were Catalina, Azalea, and what was the third? Um, the, the other one's by uh, Pine Meadows. Oh, right. And then Azalea, and then Hawthorne, I yep. believe they already were planning. Yeah. And there's enough room to do it with inside the existing right-of-ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're looking at the cost figures because you really could – not that I'm an expert how you should do it, but you, you could actually pour the, the pay, concrete right over the pavement like DOT does where you see them doing that on 301. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the cost estimates are estimates based upon fitting it in the existing right-of-way right. until you get out there and you know the specifics of what's there, which like Hawthorne Park has a drainage structure that's right there at the entrance. So taking a look at whether those things may have to be rearranged or or modify we don't know yet because we don't have the true survey on it so we're doing this off of aerials and such and once we get to the point of getting into the details which is what we're trying to get into sure. those costs might be able to go down what is those. what are the aesthetics of a roundabout I mean it's, it's obviously it's elevated but what what is inside the circle well there's lots of different things in there um, you know the one thing we would probably want to shy away from would be anything that would be a higher type planting or anything like that because you need to have the visual for the safety and everything. Um, I've seen, you know, somewhere they do low, low ground cover, grass only. I've seen uh, imprinted con colored concrete where they do right. that in there, um, you know, so that basically it's a low maintenance, but it gives you a little bit of a visual okay. uh, beautification to it. To basically, I've, I think we've even seen some astroturf in some areas where they basically put the fake grass down. And, Fancy. and I think it's important that they're mountable just in case you do have those buses that you need to go over it. So just doing concrete would be fine. And I agree with you, Commissioner, as far as the maintenance issues, the plantings. Right now we're not maintaining the existing sidewalks where the branches are too low to ride a bike right. underneath. I'm sure you've seen that before. Yeah. And then I don't also, have much of an issue with it, but some... I <laughs> wasn't, wasn't going to go there. But uh, <laughs> the other issue is that Hawthorne Park, you've had an ongoing issue of sediment in the pipes there. Mm -hmm. So my fear is that once you pipe in more, you're going to have more sediment and more pipes, and it takes them almost a week to clean out what's just a little bit is there. So and it's also better for the environment. Leave the ditches. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. It's good seeing you, sir. Any other comments? Thanks, Debbie. Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. So this is my old stomping grounds too. You know, um, I, I kinda, I'm a little jealous because every time, you know, I, I had already left King Middle whenever they rebuilt King Middle. We used <laughs> our, our students to help build uh, Manatee High. Never got to, 
enjoy it. So I kind of still wish I was in that area. I feel like I'd have a little bit better representation. But um, at any rate, um, love the idea of raised uh, walks, raised um, um, intersections. Hate roundabouts. Absolutely detest roundabouts. Anybody gone down Honoré? Mm -hmm. Anybody? I have. Okay, really, really awful. They look pretty when they're built. That's about the only thing we like about them. So not really a fan of roundabouts. Um, and, and I'm curious, I, I like the minimalistic, but I think it just doesn't meet our needs. I think the enhanced meets our needs and our future needs because we can add to it. Um, so I'd like you guys to consider, you know, possibly doing a little more than just the minimalistic approach for this particular roadway. Um, also, um, how many people are using this area? I haven't heard about it yet for the recreational aspect of it. Because the, my theory is, is, I know there's a lot of homes, like I said, I've lived there. I lived there for over 23 years, walking to Stewart Elementary in 1985. So um, I, I'm just curious. I know there's a lot of people that live there, but how many people are actually using this roadway for the recreational aspect of it? I'd like to know that because I think that is an important um, a, important factor to consider when deciding whether we're doing a minimal, minimalistic approach <coughs> or the enhanced approach. But love the idea of raids roads. Um, of course, the bricks, uh, you guys, I think, have already dis discussed the bricks are not going to be. But when we seen bricks on First Street, we also seen a lot of bricks come up off of First Street. And what was put in, in its place? Asphalt. So if we're just going to be, you know, if we can't maintain the brick, there's no need to have it. Um, so just something for you guys to take into consideration. I think that's all of my um, talking points on this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? like to come forward Seth are there any phone calls yes, madam chair 628 628 please press star six to unmute if I'm not mistaken hello hi this is Caroline um, um, oh. you guys spoke with me earlier I'm a designer and I hey. I, I think the gentlemen all the gentlemen that put on their um, their um, presentations as they're impressive um, so I, I only speak from a global perspective of how it looks um, <clears throat> because you guys want to attract, continue to attract the, uh, the snowbirds and the tourists and also make it look vintage like what the houses are. There's houses from the 1800s and the graveyard. And so to me, the amber lights that are existing there, because I've been photographing that area because I'm into architecture, that's my... My, my field in lighting architecture is keep the vintage light, but put the, um, have them amber and ambient glows. So you can have LED and ambient glows. And then if you guys want existing lights for biking, have it be solar. You guys need um, to consider solar not only will be cheaper in the long run, but it's also in line with an environmental preserve. So I think solar lighting, definitely, there's so many choices out there um, for solar ambient lighting, for additional lighting, as well as um, uh, pavers. So pavers in the road, if you made that one road, and it, this is a global perspective of the whole look of it, and this would be cement pavers. And they would be cement pavers with those vintage lights. And all of a sudden, you'd have this, like, beautiful-looking street that um, you'd have for years that tourists would use and neighbors and everybody. Um, but solar and, and pavers are eco-friendly as the drainage would go in and, and, and frankly, sidewalks just don't go along with nature preserves because there's nowhere for anything to drain. And LEED certified grants are available for that, by the way. Oh, That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other calls, Seth? No, that's all, Madam Chair. I can't see you. I hate not being able to What's see you. Again? Madam Chair, I'd like to make the motion when the time is right. Uh, I will definitely call on you. We've got a few other commissioners, however. Um, we're going to go ahead and close public comment. Commissioner Servia. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. And I know our staff is looking for direction. And so I just wanted to say that I support the district commissioner's ideas. 
Um, thank you, Kevin, for knowing what the people in your district want. And yes, I will support what he's looking for. I do hope you take the time to meet with uh, Commissioner McClash on his ideas since he is a longtime resident out there and um, understands these things probably better than uh, most of us because uh, he did it for so long. So I appreciate him being here too. Uh, but I just want you to know that that's where I am. I, I support what the district commissioner would like to do. Um, let's see, Commissioner Cruz. <clears throat> Yeah, I was just real quick responding to, to Andra about the number of people who use that road. That's a, that's a, a good point. Um, but, but I would argue this. The, the question isn't always just how many people do actively use the road, but how many people could actively use the road. Uh, it, it is a pretty dangerous place. The sidewalks are narrow. They're, they're not all connected. Um, the reality is with 75th and El Conquistador, the ability to come off the, the beach there's a lot of opportunity for people to take 75th down to 9th and then take that all the way into Robinson Preserve. I think it's underutilized. I think if you provide the proper framework and safety for people, you, you'll see a, a substantial increase in activity and use on that road. Uh, let's see, Commissioner, hold on just a second. Whitmore? Commissioner Whitmore. <laughs> um, Good the last time I looked at numbers, it was a few years ago, I think Robinson's uh, receives about 20,000 people a month at the preserve just on its own, let alone whatever's coming down with all the new developments that they've built down on Ninth. Um, also, for those of you that grew up there, Lads and Lassies, which is the church where the graveyard is, my, you did. my daughter went there too, and that was like 30, 34 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, that was the daycare for everybody. So yeah, that's... Um, that road is a special one. I drove it every day for years. But anyway, it's about 20000 a month years ago, and I know we've increased. We've got the, the nest now and everything else, so I'm sure it's even a lot more just for that one recreational area. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, staff, for doing a great job, and uh, Commissioner McClash for coming. Um, I'm probably going to be – I'll say that I'll follow the district uh, commissioner's uh, lead on this uh, with the caveat that uh, I think it would be a good idea to look for any cost savings because this is uh, serious, you know, a serious uh, outlay of, of capital that we're talking about. Um, and we've got extenuating circumstances as far as being in Robinson Preserve um, or right outside of it that we're using to justify that. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to be excited about that. We should look for any ways that might be uh, that uh, – that Mike could offset that. So I'll follow that and, uh, and because I think that's important uh, as far as uh, respecting the district commissioner and uh, I'll sow that, or that's a church term. Sorry, I'll use the church term. <laughs> you sow and you reap. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's important to listen to the district com commissioner when they know their, di their, uh, their district and I think that'll be important going forward as well. Madam Chair. Um, Chad, or I'm sorry, are you? Well, I have the church behind me. Now is the time to act, I think. <laughs> well, you, yes, you should. Yeah. Yes. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, go I ahead, sir. To. I just have a couple quick questions for Chad. One was uh, we discussed we were going to close the drainage on the north side. Is that correct? Because I got a little confused there at the end along Hawthorne and right Duncan's property there. Are we mm -hmm. we're closing well, Jer the drainage Jer there? Jared will keep me straight. Uh, as far as depending on your options, your minimalist and your enhanced does not. It okay. only encloses like the wet, very westerly oh, 400 feet or of something. Of the north side, down there by small, like by Mad Mark's place. And, mm -hmm. and what's Correct. The, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, only in and, the and I'm fine with that. It maintains the, the character. Only in the street version does right. the uh, north side ditch get. Sure. And I'm fine with that. It maintains the character and it's in line with what Commissioner Satcher was just saying. We're trying to you know, keep the, the cost down as much as possible. So the whole side isn't getting down the north? Correct, except for the very last two houses on the Understood north side that. at the end. Okay. So, and the south side will be, remain open as well. We're going to widen. Uh, is it possible to go to 10 and a half on the lanes, or does it have to be 10? I just, because I was just looking, and an F-350 is <laughs> like nine feet wide with from mirror to mirror. <laughs> 
So, uh, no. The question, and there, that's all I have, is notes of clarification. Let's uh, start potentially with the 10 foot. 10 foot is definitely, 10 and 10 is right. definitely head to head, 20. the smallest you would ever want to go. Right. Uh, I know, especially out here on Business 41, uh, where we squeezed in the extra right turn lane, it is very tight. My buses do lose a mirror here and there. Uh, okay. that, I mean, that just, just plane to plane. It's very safe for the vehicles. It's a mirror issue, mm -hmm. uh, it is what it is. I so, like my mirrors. So having a uh, having that is definitely doable. It changes. I doubt the numbers would change significantly, but it's one of those things where uh, it's just a tweaking a number on the design. Okay. Uh, very doable. I'm gonna so then I'm gonna throw some specifics in with my my motion here. So I would like to make a motion that we use the minimalist approach, ten and a half foot lanes. Uh, a multi-use trail, which is part of that that plan from 99th to 75th. Um, appropriate lighting. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that you have to use solar-powered mood lighting or whatever the caller was talking about. Um, I just mean, you know, we don't want to overlight oh. something and lose its rural characteristics. You know what low I mean? Intensity. Inter low intensity. How's that? Um, let's see here. Raised intersections, no bricks, and three roundabouts at Catalina, Pine Meadows, and Hawthorne. So uh, that was Vicky. Did you grab that? Uh, every uh, ten and a half foot lanes, appropriate low intensity lighting, raised intersections, no bricks, and three roundabouts at Catalina, Catalina, Pine Meadows, Hawthorne Park. Pine Meadows. Thank you. Second. Did uh, the raised there. intersections at separate, uh, obviously at different locations than the roundabouts? Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to leave that. To your it's discretion. Design, okay. To your discretion, correct. As well as, you know, I, I kind of like what Joe was saying about the roundabouts just doing, like, um, bricks or, and the roundabout. No one's driving over top of the middle of the roundabout, right? Or if it, uh, who knows? You know, now, the, uh, that was a comment I wanted to follow up on because there was a discussion of landscaping. With this being many roundabouts, the, uh, you essentially want to do as minimal as possible within here to maintain your vehicle, pedestrian, and uh, bicycle yes. visibility because correct. it's not – a roundabout where you're driving around for a long time where you get the chance to refine people. This, you need to know who's coming at you because you interact with them very quickly. Looking for minimal maintenance. What about none? Uh, or zero maintenance would be great. Stamped concrete is wonderful on our side, usually. Perfect. Let's go with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, a second by myself. Um, uh, yes, sir. Comment. Just to one cl clarification I'd like to have with the minimalist approach that didn't raise the road down at segment C for road overtopping. Right. Do you want to pursue that or would you like to leave it at the I'm same? I'm sorry, repeat that? With the minimalist approach that we had presented, we didn't, we weren't raising the road to eliminate the road overtopping during rain events. Did you want us to pursue that as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should. You need to amend your motion. Thank you. I will amend my motion to include raising the road in segment A, correct? To bring it back. Yeah. Correct. So Thank you. Kind of almost be. Second goes along with that. All right. We have a motion to approve. All in favor say wait, aye. Wait. Wait. Commissioner wait. Servia. I was just saying, are we at the are we at the enhanced version with almost. those changes? That is that is one aspect of the yes. enhanced version. Correct. For what for segment A? That's only. it's pretty much the enhanced version for well, the I thought project. you were enclosing the ditches. I thought you were enclosing the drainage. only the two properties at the far western end where those two homes are. Okay, I thought enhanced so it's the was first closing the whole no. thing. No, it, in the uh, minimalist and the enhanced, we were all, we were leaving it open except for those two homes at the far western end. The two homes. The south side stays completely open. The north side, it's only the two homes on the far western edge at by ninety nine. It does flood down there. If I don't raise that, I'll get House. you know lynched. Right. So yes, you will. we're gonna have to yeah. And then we had key lighting areas. Now, did you want lighting throughout the whole project? I, I was leaving that to the discretion of So thank you. Uh, the clarity of what we talked about, we talked about a key intersection. So that's <coughs> roadway lighting only at the busier intersections. The other lighting was probably more trail related. It's not something the county has done a heck of a lot of. It's almost be uh, an experiment, but it's that low intensity mm -hmm. things okay. just for users of, uh, of the multi-use 
trail. So that is definitely something that would bring down the ambient lighting. No, no night sky, night shine as far as lighting up the whole road. The, the, we're talking about just the key intersections, very likely the ones with the roundabouts. Correct. Yeah. Then one last clarification for the, so we make sure we have the correct appropriation. Um, in segment B, we were talking about the option minimalist was just using the pavement and putting the delineators to separate out for the multi-use path with the roadway. And the enhanced was we were going to move the curb line and then raise that area so it was safer for bicyclists and them so that they were a little bit ele elevated differently. That's just in segment B. That's in segment B. Chad, can you give me a Here. ballpark price on that? I got to go back to the slideshow. I'm sorry. That's, I mean, it's going to be a significant amount of money. We'll, we can take a minute. No, you need to get a second B. B? B. It's along the uh, <laughs> lads and lads. So the, the enhanced uh, B section is about 870000 That's That's uh, about a 60000 jump from the minimalist to but be able to do that. It's, right. I'm sorry, repeat that. How much of a jump? The, 68. Take this off. Sure. Yeah, the enhanced would be 870 in that that segment B, and that's a $60,000 increase from the, the minimalist. Okay, my opinion, that's $60,000 well spent. Commissioner right. Servia, what are your thoughts on that? Enhanced really is closer to what yes, you're... Sir. Can y'all hit your buttons, please, so we can We're keep not. some order? I'm sorry. I, I okay. was dialoguing with commissioners. Yeah, I'm dialogue? fine with that. I just Servia. need to be able to keep some order here. Okay. Getting those eyes again. I have permission to dialogue with you, Commissioner Servia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or just hit your button. Until it comes I to me. dialogue. I'm just I'm just responding to Kevin. I want to support whatever the commissioner wants. If it were me, yeah, flooding roads is never a good thing. So right. Well, you're a planner, and so you know. I think it's worth. The I money. defer to you on this. Well, point. that's yeah, that's an engineering issue. So, but yeah, I I would go for it. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. We will we will go enhanced on B. You might enhanced. need to. I need a second. Amend your motion. I need again. to amend my motion to go enhanced. Excuse me, on segment B. And I need a second from second. Commissioner Ball. Do you have that? Yeah. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? It is approved unanimously. What's the timeline? Timeline? So the reason we keep pushing the concept was uh, this is our first yeah, project where we really had an opportunity to have community involvement and have, make a real impact. Then we... Uh, uh, needed to feel the flavor of the neighborhood and the new board, so we've actually lost a little bit of time here. But we've selected our designer through an RFP, but we haven't given them their assignment. We were waiting for the determination of this scope. So uh, that contract, with, they will be finishing up and be bringing to you on the very next or the next board meeting to approve that uh, design contract, and we'll move absolutely as quick as we can. One of the first things that always happens with any of these projects is the title search and the... Uh, uh, survey that goes forth if there are any portions of this uh, that we already have land for that maybe make some of the uh, sidewalks or things go in especially the infill piece that's the main part uh, the very west end if for some reason we're either able to get it or we already have it we're willing to uh, move quicker on that and pull it forward as far as waiting for the rest of the project so I, I don't have a, a thing. Typical design uh, is a 12-month process, and, and so early next year I would expect us to be constructing. I know that's what you asked in the first place. Right, and that's... I gave you a Charlie Hunsicker answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, Chad oh, told Chad. me that. Chad had told me that in the last week or so, that, um, or the last two weeks, that he thought a year and change maybe before we could put a shovel in the ground. Okay, well, it's better than 20 years. All right, thank you. Thank and commissioners, you. I just want to say it's not that I'm trying to give anybody a hard time, but I've gotten Bloody. explicit instructions from the county attorney's office that I need to make sure that I keep us uh, in line in case th they need a transcript for any lawsuits. So just following orders. So we are your cats and you are it's, her. It's Madam hard. Chair, uh, excuse me. I'm on the board. I see that. Just a minute. Respectfully, I mean, First. The, the, the chair is correct. I have asked that we, you know, try to be careful about keeping the discussion orderly for the clerk to keep track of a complex motion like that with all that stuff going back and forth. It's a lot easier for her to do that and get it right if we just, you know, follow the, the order of discussion. 
Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Clay. Chair. Commissioner Whitmore. In all fairness, if we needed to clarify the motion at the end, we would have. I mean, we would have to make it clear like we always have done in the past. If the commissioner right next to me wants to ask me something, I'm going to answer. So just, I'm, this I'm isn't just kindergarten. Going, commissioner, I'm only going by the rules and regulations. Well, the that rules you and regulations on. haven't been up here for nine years that you've been here, eight. So That's not I'm going to continue doing my job. And you did a great job. Yes, I, sir. I, I apologize. And if you have no request permission to dialogue, no, you did ask us for that in a previous meeting. So yeah. As I said, it's not that I care. But we're just trying to keep the order for the transcript. That's it. I don't think that's too much to ask. But thank you, Commissioner. I do appreciate it. Makes my job a little easier. All right. We're going to move ahead now to number 38, Adoption and Execution of Manatee County's 2021 Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Project Priorities. Whew. What a title. Yeah. Thank you. Mark. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye, buddy. But thank you. Yeah, good. good. Yes, afternoon. sir, Mr. Mr. Clark Davis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this item is for uh, part of an important annual process that we undertake. It is for adoption of what we call our MPO project priorities. These are projects for which we will be requesting funding in the next work program that the Florida Department of Transportation puts together. Uh, the work program is the state's analog to our capital improvement program, and it's structured very similarly. It's a five-year uh, rolling block of capital improvements, and each year they ask the local governments and their MPOs for uh, priorities for a subset of the funding. It's not all of the state funding. They've got some stuff set up that they take care of themselves. <clears throat> but they do want um, priorities for the, the funds that are prioritized by MPOs and for certain types of state grants. The funding, um, this process is about 18 months. So right now, uh, you've probably seen uh, a draft tentative work program and a change report or summary of changes. That is for the work program that will go into effect this summer. You set priorities for it this time last year. So this one is setting priorities for a program that will go into effect in summer of 2022. The funding for any project that successfully competes for funding is very likely going to be towards the end of that program. So we're talking about money that's about six or seven years away, a very limited subset of the, of the state and federal funds. There's completely separate process for our county uh, capital improvement program, and that's uh, things that we'll be talking to the board about in a series of work sessions that are coming up, I think, starting next week and then continuing in the summer. So uh, that is a preface all of this uh, to provide some context and, and focus on the specific item that we're looking at. There is a list of 14 projects that is in your um, agenda material for today. I have all of those on a single map where I can point to it if we need to talk about specific ones. But just focusing on the top of that list, the highest priorities of this commission for the last couple of years have been replacement of the DeSoto Bridge and to look at um, options for what's been called a Bradenton Palmetto Connector that came out of a study called the Conge uh, Central Manatee Network Alternatives Analysis. And so what's being looked at there currently is a large project development environmental program that covers potential crossings from a, maybe as far west as the Green Bridge, but for sure starting at the DeSoto Bridge and going out almost to the interstate. And it, so included in that is the DeSoto Bridge itself. And coming out of that PD&E, they'll have subsequent additional PD&E studies for the DeSoto Bridge replacement and potentially another bridge. That's, that is your highest priority is to look at those crossings. Second is the 15th Street East corridor from Talavast to um, 1st Street or 41 and 301 there uh, near the DeSoto Mall. That project has funding for the central sections of it. Um, if you have your packets in front of you, uh, you'll see that it's broken into five pieces. Those middle ones from two, um, 2A to, through 2C are, are the middle pieces, and it covers from just north of Bowley's Creek to north of State Road 70. That leaves you the north section 
yet to be funded in the program in the south section. We've kept them all here uh, for sake of completeness and because some of the construction funding is only in a draft program right now. It's not adopted yet. And so we, so th we may be able to pull some of those off next year once the adopted program is in place. Your next priority is advanced traffic management system improvements. This is for the county signal system. This is, um, this is a variety of improvements, but they're aimed at either replacing or upgrading a, in, in general signal communications and, and signal detection and monitoring equipment throughout the county helps the signal system uh, continue to run efficiently and where we don't have those systems in place already to uh, help them run more efficiently. Um, the next project is, um, and I'm at number five on the list, is 9th Street West. This is for the section of 9th Street on the west side of DeSoto Mall. This is to uh, install a sidewalk in that area. Uh, the next three projects are a variety of US 41 projects. You'll see that a lot of what's remaining on this list is for the US 41 corridor, starting at the county line and going up to the city limits. Uh, US 41 and Cortez are two of our worst performing roads in Manatee County with respect to safety. Um, and they have their own sets of congestion issues. And so it is very common to find US 41 projects. It's a state highway um, and therefore eligible for both state and federal funds. And so it's common for it to be on this list uh, as a priority in various forms, almost always aimed at providing a safer environment. But sometimes we can make operational improvements at the same time. There's not a lot of room to add more lanes out there, however, so they, we you tend not to see major capacity improvements on that corridor. There is another sidewalk project down at number 11. It's for US 301 in the Ellington area. This will complete some sidewalk gaps between Ellington, Gillette Road, and uh, 50th on the west side of the interchange. There's a sidewalk project for Morgan Johnson Road. Um, the Willow Ellington Trail as a component of the Sun Trail system uh, is on the list. Um, and then finally, 44th Avenue is on the list um, for consistency with our legislative funding request last year. We may be at a point where we can uh, remove this from the list if we, if we are, are starting to find all the funding in place, but we've kept it here for some consistency. It wasn't on the list at the time we presented it to the board last year, but there was a mid-year adjustment to include it, and so uh, I've presented it again here. And I just realized I skipped a project up at number um, four, four. We have Moccasin Walla Road. Moccasin Walla Road is a project that we had submitted as, as a potential candidate for two different state grants. One's called the Transportation Regional Incentive Program. The other's called the County Incentive Grant Program. Uh, they are each funded with state dollars, uh, and they require a dollar for dollar match. Um, this is in their system as a, an ask for a, a, a very large amount of money. It's like $30 million. It's not practical. And so what you will see, uh, and I'm working with staff on this, is to come back with this in segments. Segment one, the, near the east end, um, is either fully funded or already has so much state money on it that we need to fund the balance a another way already. So we need to break the other two pieces, segments two and three, into two separate projects and correctly show the match on it. Uh, staff believe it's appropriate to keep Mox and Walla Road on the list, but some of the details that support it and the way it gets presented in the MPO reports is going to get modified um, before uh, the, those of you that sit on the MPO board see it at that level. Um, so that is very quick overview of the project list and some of the key projects on it. Um, I am here to ask for your approval of it today. This will be presented to the MPO board at their meeting on February 22nd, so it's just two weeks away before the these get commingled with the, the projects from other jurisdictions and um, adopted as priority so they can transmit it to the state. Um, Clark, I'm, I'm the only one on the board. That's amazing. Um, just out of curiosity, and I know you just went over it, but when we were in the MPO meeting, this was a big topic uh, on the trip funds for Marcus and Wallow. So before it goes to, before you take it back to the MPO, you are going to change that $30 million figure and you're going to put it in segments. Isn't that what you just said? I want to make sure I understood. Yeah, we... Because it's not going to get anywhere as it is with $30 million. Yeah, $30 million is more money than 
they've literally ever had for a single project on the trip right. list. That's, yeah. um, and even if they had that amount of money, there's still a dollar for dollar match requirement. So 15 right. of the 30 million would have to come from uh, non-state money of some sort. So the request doesn't make sense the way it is. Um, it was, I think, a, a, a genuine attempt by staff to put together the right project and the right money, right. but we needed to present it a little bit different. And so I'll be working with them and make sure that we get the ask refined uh, before we take it. Uh, well, we'll need to resubmit it to the MPO, but we'll work with them to get that cleaned up so it right. looks right when we have our negotiations with our regional partners. We'll need to talk to Charlotte Punagorda again and the Polk TPO. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure, because, you know, because we got, as you know, it, it didn't get any traction at all the other day. That's why I was asking. Commissioner Servi, I was hoping I was going to see you on the board. Yes, um, thank you. And one of the things I've learned as a member of the MPO is it's really important to have a list and ask for money for improvements because if you don't ask it doesn't happen i do have a question about morgan johnson road that's eligible the sidewalk project is eligible for dot funding yeah the it, it's you call it fdot funding but to get underneath the hood a little bit it's federal money in this particular case so uh, when we put this list together there are some projects most of them that will be will be making federal funding requests and it is what this the fdot to this day still calls surface transportation program money that's just general highway money they sometimes put it in other sub categories underneath that at the mpo level but that's the the main source but there's also a group called transportation alternatives they've been called transportation enhancement and special enhancement and things like that in the past if you've been around this for a very long time but they're for sidewalk improvements and they can be done on any federal aid eligible roadway and that includes um, urban collectors and arterials even if they're not on the state highway system and morgan johnson fits in that bucket so um, okay. so it's, it's, it's for a portion of the federal money that they're that morgan makes morgan johnson eligible in this case Okay, and so um, you've heard me talk about my need for 63rd Avenue East to have that segment improved. Um, is it a possibility to get that segment on this list as well, or no? Um, I would need to check and see what the assumptions were in the long-range transportation plan. Uh, my understanding is that um, Mr. Batso and, and Ms. Brewer have been looking at a way to introduce that project into our capital improvement program. It was one, I, th I think, that was even considered for the list of adjustments you'd reviewed earlier today, but it, it's just taking a little bit longer to get some of the stuff together, but I think you'll see that come into our own CIP rather than be funded through the work program okay, process. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, out. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, so just out of curiosity, number three, uh, what's the capital outlay on that, of the advanced traffic management system? Would that be significantly lower than some of these road projects? I wonder if we could sneak that in and all get to work and play faster. The list is a, a little bit awkward because it presents everything in a priority order. You know, the, the the order we reckon that they're most eligible for funds, but um, one of those s buckets of federal money that I was talking about a minute ago is a separate set aside for advanced traffic management system and TISMO. So in a way, even though it's third on the list, it's at the top All of right. the, the portion that gets funded with that kind of money. And there's a, it varies from year to year, but I'd say it's one or $2 million, maybe some years it's, it's Heav more heavily weighted towards Sarasota, who's the other county in our MPO area, or and the others more towards Manatee County. Great, I love hearing that. So, yeah, let's let's beat Sarasota out and get that. <laughs> um, love you, Sarasota. And then this does not uh, this doesn't affect anything as far as uh, rumblings I'm hearing about I-75 or close to the Ellington Outlet Mall. Any of that is not a part of this. We're not saying put that off. Correct. Um, Correct. So um, when I said earlier that the money we're talking about prioritizing here is a subset of the toll money, we, as a local government or through our MPO, can certainly voice our support for some of these other projects, but the state already has charted their course forward for what they call the Strategic Intermodal System. You'll hear SIS. Um, there's a lot of acronyms and uh, abbreviations in, in this work, and so you'll hear also 
state highway system, SHS, which is all the state roads, but for this purpose, it's the strategic intermodal system, and that's all of the interstates. It's a portion of uh, US 41 that serves the port. It's a portion of University Parkway, and it's a portion of State Road 70. But the I-75 at 301 interchange is fully funded in the program already. I think they finally got a design build contract in place, but I'm not sure what their schedule is for starting construction yet. Okay, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have some happy and upset voters. Um, and then uh, Erie obviously is in our CIP and doesn't need to be a part of this for the same reason, correct? Um, we have Pardon? all of the funding in place for Erie North South. We still are, are um, looking at our funding options to complete Erie East West. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't have anyone else on the board, so I'm gonna go ahead and open this to public comment. I do have a someone signed up, Glenn Jubilina. I'm assuming he's no longer here. Glenn Jubilina. No, he's not here, but he might be on the phone. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone from the audience here that would like to come forward on this item? All right, do we have anyone on the phone? There are no calls at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. I do miss seeing you, though. All right, then I'll close public comment. Uh, let's see, what is the action? Okay, we do have uh, an action. What is the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve the staff recommended stipulation. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Servia, a second by Commissioner, Commissioner Satcher. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? It is approved unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Thank you for your time this afternoon. All right, number 39, Impact Fees Annual Review. Madam Administrator, I'm Thank assuming you. there she is. Oh, John Osborne, oh, yes, too. Yes, Nicole's coming up, and John's going to take over. Okay. Thank you. That was last time. Good afternoon, Commissioners. For the record, Nicole Knapp, Impact Fee Administrator. Um, today we're here to provide you an update on our Impact Fee Annual Review. At least once a year during the fiscal uh, year, the staffs prepare and present an annual report to the board. The report shall document impact fee collections, expenditures by type of infrastructure and benefit districts. So as you'll see in your agenda packet, you have um, impact fee reports for fiscal year 2018, 2019, and 2020. The reports for 2018 and 2019 are based on audited financial numbers. However, the fiscal year 2020 is an unaudited version. Uh, it's draft and it's subject to chain based on final audited numbers. Once that <clears throat> fiscal year 2020 has been audited, we'll return and share that report with you. But given the timing of the impact fee update study that will be coming before you in a couple months, we figured it was better to provide you with the draft of the fiscal year 2020 now rather than holding off until the audit's complete and the report's finalized. Um, each report provides a historical summary from the inception of the status of impact fees in each district and identifies all relative financial information. On each individual impact fee assessed district, there's a summary of uh, funding received, funding spent to date, and remaining budgeted by unspent project expenses. In addition, the CIP for the following five years has been taken into consideration. Uh, with projected revenues and for projects which were approved within the adopted CIP, which are relative as to the date of the report. Um, the re resulting amount is the unobligated remaining impact fees for each district, and we have identified the remaining credits which have been established to date of the report. Uh, going forward, this report, uh, when we bring it before you, um, may be more appropriate with the review of the CIP. However, we're playing a little catch up on a, um, a newly established reporting requirement by the clerk's office. Uh, so we thought it was best to play catch up now versus later. Um, today, we're seeking no action um, and we're providing this for informational purposes only. That concludes my report. Mm. Oh, short and sweet. Commissioners, any questions? Wow, okay. I do have a question, uh, just one. 
I can't remember if I'm correct or not, so I need you to help me with this. Parks, their, their impact fees, those can be spent anywhere in the county or are they per district as well? I can't remember. I know we had had that discussion before, but I just can't recall. Um, if John's going to answer that for you there. <laughs> John's probably. <laughs> uh, and Madam yes, Chair, um, parks are, they don't have a specific district. They used to. Um, many years back, they had specific districts. We updated the impact fee study in 2015. Uh, they was limited at that point to un unincorporated county, though. Um, the cities don't pay into our impact fee system or pay for capital improvements, obviously, for county parks inside cities. GT Bray is a good example. Uh, however, when we look at the new study, we bring it back again, you'll see some potential changes in that. We do need the ability to use some impact fees inside county parks that are located in the cities, GT Bray, for capacity adding growth. It seems a little odd that we uh, restrict um, some of our bigger parks and that use of that funding source because they receive kids playing there in GT Bray just like they, well, they come from all over. They don't come from just the city. So we're looking to the board and uh, with the impact fee update to make that change. Um, so you wouldn't, it wouldn't be something where you have that restriction that's in place now. Uh, we'd be able to sort of take the handcuffs, handcuffs off, so to speak. Yeah. And the only reason I'm asking is because I know how the others are done. I just couldn't remember mm -hmm. parks. But, um, you know, obviously the majority of the impact fees I know right now come from North County and from um, District 5. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am looking at the aquatic center in Lakewood Ranch at Premier that needs to be done. And I knew that uh, I had been told that we had enough money and impact fees to build the pool. I just wanted to make sure that we're not spending them. Uh, that's why I'm asking. And that'll be a great conversation yes, for our will. capital Trust improvements me. planning effort. Yeah, okay. So I'm assuming that the money isn't being taken away at this point. Can you tell me that? or is uh, Right now, the, of course, the, the adopted CIP it has uh, the monies that were, that were projected planned to be spent. However, the good news is there are more revenues than we projected in impact fees. Growth has continued right. beyond our projections. Correct. So there are some extra monies. Enough to build an aquatic center? I don't know yet, but we'll have to take a look at that. Over time, there certainly could be planned out and well, to build an aquatic center. We need to ranch. look at that because I know we've yes, taken money away from mm -hmm. parks, uh, you know, impact fees before and, and infrastructure sales tax money. So, you know, we can't keep taking away the money that we need for amenities in the areas where the impact fees are being paid. That's why I brought it up. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. I look forward to the conversation in the very near future. Uh, no other comments, commissioners? All right, we'll move to public comment. Is there anyone from the public that would like to discuss the impact fees, the review? Yes, ma'am, just, you know the drill. Yeah, State your name yes. in three minutes. Thank you. Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. So my uh, comment's gonna be really simple. I don't even think I'm gonna make it to the three minutes. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not um, a supporter of impact fees. I mean, and we just heard that we've been collecting plenty of impact fees. So it is my suggestion that we start spending some of the money that we've collected instead of having our hands out to the taxpayers and asking them to pay for more. Um, a lot of people, and, and out of this whole thing, even with uh, the gentleman that was just here, I still don't hear anything for parish. I mean, parish is our primary, I mean, am I, am I mistaken? It, I mean, that's where our growth is at right now. Am I not, am I right correct about that? Anyways, Part of it. Um, I'm not hearing a whole lot of stuff going on in that area, and that's a little concerning for me, especially when we have a new project going out there that might be um, putting additional stress on Erie Road. So, um, I've gotten a lot of comments from citizens here that there's not enough sidewalks there for the students that, if I get this correctly, uh, I hope I, I have this correctly. So if there's not sidewalks, the students can't walk to school even if it's in a couple blocks. They have to literally have a bus pick them up to take them to school. That's what I heard. If that's not true, please let me know. If that is true, then we need to get some sidewalks out and perish. Sorry, that needs to be a top priority. Our children can need to come first. So um, with that, I will let you guys do your thing, but I'm not going to support 
um, any impact fee increases. I'm not asking for a decrease. I think everything just needs to be status quo until we have a first year under our belt. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Seth, anyone on the phone? Okay. We'll close public comment. Commissioner Whitmore. Impact fees are paid by builders new growth, not by taxpayers. Uh, that's why you're seeing the west part of town tired unless there's new redevelopment in there and the older parts of town. I'm, who talked? Am I still on the floor? Yeah, okay. Commissioner Whitmore, please continue. Thank you. Okay, well, and, and for an example of South County and West County, we don't receive as much um, impact fees because there's no new growth out there. New development pays impact fees, not taxpayers. Okay. Commissioner Bellamy? Yeah, I, I think I'll just wait into Commissioner comments. I'm, I want to hear more about the comment as far as students cannot walk to school if the sidewalks are not built. And I'm, the reason why I'm concerned about that, because we haven't had sidewalks in District 2 all my life. We're starting to do it now. Right. And I walk to school every day um, to Lincoln and things like that. So I, I just want to know, did, is that a new rule that we came up with? Is that something from the school district? That's I'm going to uh, rely on Deputy County Administrator John Osborne for that one. So, uh, Commissioner, a couple things. Um, as examples, the new Parish High School. What we've asked uh, school board staff, uh, their leadership in the future, is to give us a full five-year CIP length, time, length of time before they plan on building another new school in the county. They, the high school was... Uh, fast-tracked, which is great for the high school and for us and our kids. However, we didn't have a full five-year CIP time frame to address a lot of the infrastructure needs in that area. Look at Fort Hamer Extension. We borrowed money from the school board to build the road. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still catching up in the sidewalk realm as well. Uh, we have to go, sidewalks are nothing different than building and designing and then a little <coughs> tiny road. The same permitting, the same design work, not to buy the property, all the same things are exactly the same. It's just a smaller little road. Um, however, we do get a list from the school board every year where they would like to see new sidewalks or sidewalks replaced or having you know infrastructure issues. So we do that every year and we add those to the CIP. So that's a nutshell how sidewalks get built for schools. There is one that's been a long-term uh, project to get it from Harrison Ranch along Erie Road to the high school. And that took some time to secure that property from that property owner. But we did, I believe, Chad, finally get that squared away. Chad, you want to comment, too? No, that's uh, easement is being, easement agreement is, I uh, believe, in the county attorney's office being reviewed. That's the FPL to get us a, a massive sidewalk extension along Erie Road. The thing that I was walking up to comment on was... It's a, cross, it's a hybrid uh, issue from the school board when the commissioner mentioned that, or someone mentioned that you have to be bused. If a child has a hazardous walking condition somewhere between their home and the school, that is where the school board uses that they must be bused. If they're inside the two mile walking distance, but they have a hazardous walking condition somewhere in their route and they are an elementary or middle school mm -hmm. uh, child, the school board is supposed to deal with busing. It's a, it, uh, there is a standard, it's a form, it's as ob objective as you can get, but there is some subjectivity to it that you evaluate the condition. It is performed by the school district upon the conditions of our rights of ways. So we're not totally removed from it, but it's a, it's a rule and a requirement of the school board. Uh, that's how we kind of get in the middle on that one. Okay, if you can, uh, Commissioner Bellamy, Commissioner, uh, Attorney, would like to say something on Yeah, that. I just would. I, the, my recollection is exactly what Chad is saying. There is a statute, I believe, that says that if they're within two miles of a school, they're not supposed to provide busing service except under certain conditions, and it is within the discretion of the school board. So they don't necessarily have to bus them if there's no sidewalks. There are many examples throughout the state where they do not. But they can. They can. It's just that their, their default is if they're, a kid is within two miles of the school, they walk. All right, that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To, that also drives some of our decisions about intersections and crossing guards and so forth, because there are places where they're going to have to walk because they're within that proximity to a school. Commissioner Bellamy, did you want to? Yeah, I, I, I can't. I can't let this one. I can't let this one go. 
um, because we're, we're talking about um, sidewalks and we're, we're talking about safety. And two and a half years ago, we, we, we had a kid that got killed um, because of lighting and because of trying, there, there were no sidewalks. And I wrote down here, I said I was gonna wait to commission comments, but I'm gonna go ahead now. And I, I like the fact that we all unanimously agreed to support um, Commissioner uh, Kevin Van Osterbridge on the the Ninth Avenue um, Northwest initiative when you're talking about um, sidewalks and upgrade. So I don't know whether I need to ask for a time certain at 1.30 to make sure it's clear of my concerns of the safety for Second Avenue um, as it relates to youth um, walking to um, to, to Lincoln um, Lincoln Middle School because there are no sidewalks and I think within the first month I was here I put in for them and, and I'm not necessarily sure where we are with that. Um, we have kids in my district, whether it be Somerset um, or whether it be in Palmetto that walk to school and a lot of those areas, they are very unsafe. They are, they, they are very, very unsafe. And I've always asked to say, let's be proactive instead of reactive as far as how we take and look at this to make sure that we're addressing the needs countywide. And just, just listening to this right now as far as someone saying that youth cannot um, walk within the two miles, um, the school district conveniently relies on that and people um, in my community walk to school every day. And there are, I see a lot of kids at risk. Yes, you do have crossing guards. There are some um, at 17 and um, 41, but there are not any at 26 and 41, which is where the kid actually got, got killed at. Um, so there, there's a lot of issues and a lot of concerns that I would kind of want to look at a little bit differently when we start talking about safety as it, as it connects to District um, 2. I just got a little concerned about that statement as far as youth um, not being able to walk, but I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr. Attorney, that it's a statute from the school district, so it has nothing to do with the county. I'm trying to find it. I'm right, it's been but a long time. E e even if it is, I, I still think the school district and us as um, county commissioners has a responsibility to make our um, youth and individuals or pedestrians as at all as safe as possible while they're walking. And I have a concern with that in District 2, and I'm gonna keep mentioning it, but I'm gonna do it the right way, though. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, you're next. Thank you, thank you. I was, I was actually gonna address something that Commissioner Whitmore said, but she left, so I'll, I'll wait. Um, but uh, to Commissioner Bellamy, when I was on the campaign trail and we met, um, I asked about concerns and priorities in your district and sidewalks and street lighting were it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was pretty much it. Uh, you know, you also cited, you know, educational in, in your district as well, which isn't necessarily the priority of this board to tackle. Um, but if, if you, I, I'm open to, if you want to bring us, uh, whether it be a quick workshop, I'll be quick, but, but no, you know, no, it's no, okay. No. okay. <laughs> I'll say, uh, if you want to bring us a list of priorities, because th there is a budget, an ongoing budget for sidewalks and and that sort of thing. So if you want to bring us a list of streets that you feel are a higher priority and we want to vote to push those to the top of the list, or if there's projects that you want to allocate separate funds for, um, I'm, I'm totally open to that. And I would think you'd have support on this board for that as well. I think everyone knows your, a lot of your district is underserved. And the only other thing I was going to point out was, uh, now that Commissioner Whitmore is back, I was I just going to, okay. Um, <laughs> there's a mic but, um, for speaker. I was going to say that she, she said that uh, taxpayers don't pay impact fees that uh, developers do, but um, well, the only way we get money is right. from taxpayers, right? And so anyone who pays money to us, it's just a philosophical thing, it's and it fee. just sort of sticks to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so taxpayers, everyone that's paying is a taxpayer, and ultimately, of course, the, the cost of that gets passed down um, to, the buyer. to the buyer, right? And we have an affordable housing um, crisis in this town, and, and here we are looking at options of... of increasing the cost and the affordability of homes. So anyway, it's all taxpayer money. That's my point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate your comments, uh, Commissioner Bellamy. Um, I think that this is important. Uh, we do need to take that seriously. Um, I, I will say, and maybe I should have started with this, um, there's some references that I believe are going to, yeah, because we were talking about Parish uh, Community High School. Erie Road there is, I mean, it is straight. There's nothing on it, and people travel fast on it, and the grass is high on each side like you're in the country. Um, so, and that's why they bus people from there. I don't think that's acceptable. 
And I also don't think it's acceptable um, that a child lost his life on the way to school. Um, so uh, without, a, without an option to walk on a sidewalk. So I get really excited thinking about what we could do as a board going forward is if we could become the board uh, that put uh, child safety first and this community uh, first and not, um, if we put that first and uh, fund that as quickly as possible or as we can, um, obviously we have constraints, but uh, priorities tend to get done. You know, if something's really a priority and everyone agrees to it, then they, they tend to get uh, get taken seriously and, and uh, we see progress. So I'd like to see progress for Erie. I'd like to see progress um, in District 2 um, and anywhere. There could be a place that I don't even know, but if children are... Uh, are right now currently either forced or should be walking to school in a route where they're not able to uh, stay out of traffic. Uh, that seems pretty uh, primary to our concern, and uh, and I appreciate uh, staff doing a good job uh, getting these things moving uh, quickly, and I've seen them do that in the past and look forward to seeing it in the future. Commissioner Bellamy, did you have anything to add, sir? Yes. Okay, yes. go ahead. Um, I, I, have, I have presented a list. Um, of priorities um, as far as um, areas in District 2, and they included sidewalks um, as it connected to Lincoln um, Middle School, as well as on 26th Street. Um, I can't think of the, um, the private school out there um, as you head toward Cortez, but I also put that one as one of... Right, uh, right, right uh, Broach, as, um, as, um, as well as... Um, on 26 as it connects to Cortez, and the reason why is because we have a lot of youth um, walking, biking for um, in that particular area. And I told a story a while back about the elderly lady, uh, quadriplegic, quadriplegic, that actually fell on, in her wheelchair because there was no sidewalk. Um, so as far as the list, I do know that it's out there. Um, I can bring it back up uh, again, but I like where we are. Um, with the commissioners as far as identifying district priorities when it comes to road sidewalks and safety so we can make sure that um, these things are addressed. So thank you for your support, both of you. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, uh, 53rd and um, 41, a few years ago, a lady uh, was in an electric wheelchair and tipped over into the road. And do you think anybody would stop? <laughs> so I got out there and had to hold traffic. Finally, some guys came and helped me put her on the sidewalk. It's that's another story. But from what I understand, uh, Commissioner Bellany is saying that um, he has uh, kids that are walking um, for ages now with safety issues and hasn't been able to get sidewalks. That's what he's saying. It's not, yeah, that it's not the bus ride. Uh, and if they if there's safety issues, that then we need to push the school board to give them an off, uh, a, you know, bus to get a, uh, on their way to school. But I want to um, clarify um, what uh, Commissioner Van Ostenberg said. You're right. Impact fees are fees on a new home when you build, and we all know it gets passed on to the citizen that buys the house. I, when, I got, when I heard the comments, I got the impression that it was like me paying for impact fees, which I'm not. I pay property taxes. And, and thank you for clarifying. I didn't know that. And Kevin has the philosophy of all fees are taxes, and that's fine. Um, but we've always, you know, I, the impact fees are for new development, and people have to pay for that in every house that they buy or whatever they get. So, and that's fine. I understand where he's coming from. He said that from day one. Okay. Commissioner Servia. Great discussion, and we will all duke it out at the CIP sidewalks. meeting. I wait till we do <laughs> Yeah. See who gets I do sidewalks. Believe that's true. <laughs> but Commissioner Bellamy and uh, and District Two and District Four, mm -hmm. we need sidewalks, you guys, oh, I know um, you and have for a long time. Um, I, I could I could debate the impact fee uh, tax issue, but I'm not going to do it. Well, it's for another time. But it's <laughs> it's a good discussion. Thanks. Isn't it great how we all have different opinions? I can be super fast and tell you that 17th Avenue from the Braden and Country Club all the way down basically to the Red Barn, no right? No Mayor sidewalk. Brown is here right now. And there's no sidewalk on it. It runs through both of our districts and through his city. So that's a discussion for another day. But since he's here, I thought I'd bring it up. Road, though. Okay, so we're going to go back at this point. We're done with the impact fee review.
Uh, we are going to go back to item 37. It is done except I do need a motion to uh, bring forward those items. What is the pleasure of the board? I thought it was 38. Item 37. Oh, no, 38, isn't it? It's 37. Okay. Item 37 that you Thank discussed you. before lunch regarding Canal Road, State Road 70, and GT Bray improvements, and Clemens Aquatic. Oh, these are pulled. Yeah, we need a, we need a motion uh, no, no, for no, those to come forward. No, 37. Charlie was. wasn't done. Charlie told me he was fine. Do you want to come up, Charlie? Yeah, he's you can if bad. you want to. He's never going to deny it. It's <laughs> Although he told me he was finished. Well, he didn't need to come back. There is a motion in the agenda package. That's what I've been saying. There is a motion that we're going to need. Charlie, well, go ma ahead. Madam Chair, as you recall, the uh, three items included uh, the dive well, the Coach Clemens pump room, mm -hmm. which simply by testing the ground around it, we recognize that there's a water leak into the soil and that's all we have to go from, but we need to move forward with a full investigation of that site uh, because it is a leak of substantial uh, amount and we have to address it. And then the decking of the GT Bray and around the dive well in the main pool, if anybody's had a household crack in their deck around their pool, well, imagine that times uh, the size of this building. And uh, we've got a significant issue there that we need to find where those voids are being created ostensibly by another water leak in the 40-year-old piping that we have there. And so each one of those were recommendations to be funded out of our reserves. Uh, I believe that you'll hear from uh, Jan Brewer that uh, those reserves are capable of, of covering all three projects. We already did. To proceed simultaneously without the necessity to stage one in front of the other. And we're ready to go with um, your recommendation on all three. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. So I've already, I believe, opened... I think I opened this to public comment, did I not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Okay, we just need a motion to finish this up. What is the pleasure of the board? I'm on the board, but I'm waiting. Go ahead. Okay, I move. Thank you for that. Though. I move to bring forward the following capital improvement plan quarterly adjustments as requested by staff. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Servia, a second by Commissioner Cruz. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, it is approved unanimously. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, moving right along, we're going to go down to there's nothing on the agenda from a commissioner. So we're going to go to Commissioner Comments. Uh, commissioner Servia, would you like to go first today? Oh, certainly. Let me get my list. I knew, I knew. <laughs> See? That's what that was. I knew. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a few things. Thank you very much. I'll start with, uh, if you remember, the board voted to um, have me write a letter to ask the state uh, of Florida Health Department to consider the comments from Dr. Smith that we received on the Bayshore High study. I have drafted that letter for signature uh, by the chairman, and I believe it's been delivered to you, Vanessa. Is that true? Have you seen it? I've not seen it. Okay, well, it's been given to Vita, okay. so maybe you should check with her, but I have drafted it. It wasn't on my desk as of yesterday afternoon when I left. Okay. Anyway. Um, I've, in the letter that I um, drafted, I also um, attached the report that we received and the email, um, just to make sure that there's no stone left unturned, you know, that everything has been considered. I think it's really important, so um, please look for that. Um, also, at that same meeting, uh, Commissioner Baugh, Chairman Baugh, asked me to take the lead on the Pelican issue at the Skyway. So I did uh, make contact with C Kathleen Peters, I believe is her name, a commissioner from Pinellas, a former state representative. Oh, that's good. Um, yes, we had a very good talk and coordinated together. Um, I've also worked with uh, Will Robinson and Jim Boyd talked to both of them. Will Robinson was already briefed on this issue, and he forwarded his written notes to me from that briefing. And so what it looks like is that Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife is already on the issue. Um, I think that we can go ahead and send a letter 
um, if you would like to, but I do believe it's in the works of being addressed. And what I saw from the meeting that, uh, that Representative Will Robinson sent to me is that uh, they need to hire a full-time staff member. They did have a staff member, by the way, out there that was in charge of unhooking these pelicans uh, and setting them free, and then that staff member left, and they were unable to fill the position. But... Yeah, $13 an hour. Yeah, that, that they do the same thing in Naples is what I learned. Yeah, City Pier. So, out there. Um, so I do believe we're, we're on the way quickly to having that issue resolved. Um, this week I attended the required AHAC meeting um, for our, uh, they're responsible for all the ship funding in the state. They've been around since the 1980s. Uh, many of you probably have heard of them. And uh, it was a good meeting, good contacts throughout the state of other commissioners uh, who are on the committee. Um, I want to thank Lacey Pritchard and the Building and Development Services Department because um, she gave me a, a little walkthrough of the digital plan room. And if you guys haven't done that, you should. It is a really amazing system that we have in Acela. It's such a time saver. It, it's it's a game changer, as she said. It is a game changer. Um, I want to thank Code Enforcement. Code Enforcement was out at Picktown Estates this, this week. I'm sorry, last week on Thursday. And I, I did an inventory of some problems in that area and gave it to them. And within two days, they were out there addressing them. So thank you very, very much, Code Enforcement. Um, thank you for the plexiglass and for the adjustments that you made uh, midday today. And I know you're still in the process of refining it, but it's really nice to be able to sit up here and be safe and speak without a mask. So I do appreciate that. Um, and then finally, I have a resident um, who lives in the Cascades. He's also on my Citizens Coalition on Growth. His name is Alan Goldsmith. I spent some time talking to him this week. He had some suggestions about things to uh, improve our our COVID protocol and the vaccine distribution, but he had a really great idea that I wanna share with all of you. And that is, he said, there are so many retired people that relocate to Manatee County and they all have had careers and expertise in a variety of fields. And so if we could start a registry of those people who are interested you know, what their background is. Maybe it's IT or maybe it's archaeology or whatever the, the field of expertise is. And then in the event that we have something that comes up that we could use a short-term committee to evaluate and brainstorm some ideas, we would quickly have access to those people who want to serve and that would help Manatee County. So I really liked that idea. I thought I'd throw that out there for you guys to consider. And that is all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bellamy. Yes, I have a, um, a, a one, one or two things. Um, I've already spoke on the um, the Second Avenue, the road issue. I, I do want to make sure it's clear where we are as it relates to Canal Road and 301. When I went home for lunch today, I saw a, another accident, and I think that's probably my fourth one within the last maybe um, five or six months. And um, I do want to know where we are uh, with that and how quick we can get that light up there because that's starting to become a very, very um, dangerous um, intersection. So I want to make sure I brought that to, um, to, to the board's attention. So, so since we're talking about public safety, thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Satcher. I'd like to defer for now. You want to defer. Okay. Um, Commissioner Whitmore. Um, yes, I've got quite a few things. Do you want anybody else to go ahead of me? No, you go ahead. Okay. I'm good. I, and I appreciate to be able to make all my comments, too. Um, first of all, I did notify Mike Gore about 6.30 this morning and Sherry um, due to the breach of the water issue um, that happened north of us with the, uh, the person hacking in the water system to try to poison their water system. I thought it would be best because I, we actually did receive an email today from someone if we could get a, um, a statement from Mike on what, what we're doing as safety precautions, because um, this is really important. This all started in nine um, years ago when, um, the, when we did the ultra microfiltration system that we sent gazillions on for any kind of bacterias or, you know, any kind of um, 
interruption into our water system. So I would like to, um, if it's all right, have Mike just give us an update since I'm sure you're aware of what happened and what we're doing in Manatee County. Okay, yes, of course. And thanks for responding so early to support. I didn't think you were gonna. That's okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, as 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 Ms. Whitmore said, she asked me this morning to talk about this. It was kind of like breaking news. Uh, so I thought I'd bring the board up to speed a little bit. Uh, City of Oldsmar, my staff is familiar with that treatment process up there. Some of the folks up there, as far as I know, they haven't spoke to nobody. But much like... Uh, any water treatment plan or any large industrial operation, you have what we call a SCADA system that protects that. And you'll hear SCADA referred to quite a bit as you sit on this board and, and different things we do in the utility. You'll, you'll see a change order coming in front of you in the next meeting or two uh, for the system that we're putting in at the dam. We have a current system that is very aged. Uh, with the membrane project we're doing, we chose to upgrade that. Uh, so that SCADA system stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Uh, data acquisition being the key there. Uh, the system gathers data, it communicates data, it presents data, and then it controls data. Uh, a system that large, you need that in the water treatment process. All four of our water treatment plants run like that. Our, our gas co uh, collection system works like that. Our uh, generator system works like that off a of SCADA system. The idea of the SCADA system years back was to protect you from human failure and mechanical failure. Uh, obviously, as we went through life, uh, cyber attacks have become more and more steady, so that's a big, that's a big part of SCADA now. SCADA allows us a lot of alarms. Everything in the system is monitored within parameters. If those parameters are exceeded either way, the, uh, the system will let the operator know. There's, there's operators at the water treatment plant 24-7 monitoring the system along with what they see with alarms. Uh, the, the takeaway from what happened in Oldsmar yesterday is the system worked. And, that, and that's what you need to feel safe with. Uh, in, in risk and assessment, uh, risk and resiliency assessments that staff go to, they, they actually tell us that the small plants like you've seen yesterday, the smaller cities is who usually is the target. Uh, water obviously has been a high value target since the beginning of time. If you can poison somebody's water system, you got them. Yeah. So, so it's it's noted. It's it's something we steadily watch. We're upgrading the system to the tune of about six point eight million dollars just for the SCADA system. Uh, it was old, redundant. Uh, needed to do this upgrade. It's an expensive uh, investment, but it's a necessary investment. So, I, I hope I've answered a little bit and gave you a little snugger feeling about what we do. Yeah, and I think uh, in the future when, if we're hearing stuff, maybe individual calls to commissioners, I don't, a lot of stuff on public record if you want, about if anything's being breached. I mean, I know, you know, like a lot of people asked me what was going on, and you have, you're, you're saying the system worked, and that's what we need to hear to tell our citizenry that the same system they have up there, we have, they were warned, and that's what would happen in our that's, that's what happened, yes, ma'am. And I know you have a whole science department there uh, in your water treatment plant. So, okay, so we're on top of it, and you're okay. We're on top of it. Okay. We'd like to think we were. Thank you. Very good. Okay, I got a few more things. Uh, my next one is, as we all know, uh, Tuesday, we, uh, the administrator, I don't know where she is. She's, is she coming back? Does anybody know? No? Oh, she's coming back. Oh, yes. okay. Um, brought us a, uh, a drawing, and we also got today talking points regarding the Bishop Animal Center. And um, I had to go for x-rays yesterday, so I uh, called and asked if I could have a tour. I thought there were dogs or animals in there, and there aren't yet. I guess they're waiting for a CO from Bradenton or something. So, But I, I did uh, go around and look at it, and it was fantastic. But um, what I wanted to know is our attorney, is there something that our attorney's looking at to see what's been proposed to us? I know we have talking points. I don't know 
what our attorney's plans are, or our administrator, because she's not here. Madam so, Chair, somebody... I'm sorry. Take this thing off. No. Madam Chair, Commissioner Whitmore, my understanding is that a, a request for legal services is forthcoming. As of the, the last time I looked, we hadn't received it yet, but I, we're supposed to get it today. So once have I have to have it, action, we're okay. Then we don't have to have I'll an action. I'll have to look at it, and I'll let you know if we do need action. But we'll, I, don't know what, I, I don't know what she's going to submit. I don't think there's a written contract yet. Not to my knowledge. Yeah. Okay, so um, do you have to wait till there's a written contract, or you, you, you meet with them and talk about it? I'll have to see what the RLS says in terms okay. of where we are in the negotiations. I'll report back to the board if there's direction that I need from the board to proceed, and I'll, I'll ask for that at the right time. Okay. Can you keep us up uh, of course. on what's going on individually if you have to? Yes, okay. And while we're on that issue, I've had many, 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 many people ask me about the Lena shelter. And as far as I'm considered, we're still on track for that. Uh, I've heard some comments today that... Um, Actually, uh, I got two people approached me this week, Friday and then Saturday, there was a, somebody that made calls around a poll that went around. And uh, the, the poll's comments were, what are your, um, they asked about each individual commissioner, what were your thoughts on that commissioner? And then would you spend taxpayers' money on a new shelter? And then um, what are your thoughts on the private sector running the county like a business? So I've had uh, one lady kind of ask the guy where, who was paying his bill, and th it was a kid that she said, and he said he didn't know, but I've heard from two people, um, if anybody else had gotten any calls from citizens or talked to anybody, two people told me there's a poll going around. So my commitment still is to look at the Lena Road Shelter. Uh, we have, this has been in our plans, and I know there's some people that are adamantly against it up here, and, um, I'm going to continue moving forward just like 100,000 people in this community want it. If this thing with Bishop goes through, that's great. And in the backup that we were given by Bishop Talking Points, it said the new county Bishop shelter can be one of a series of shelters in the county as may be necessary based on the need of the county. We need a shelter out east. Uh, the current shelter that I went and looked at, the new one, has runs for about 60, 67 dogs. We have 120, 130 sometimes over at the shelter. Right now we have 67, but we have a pipe break, so we're getting people to foster about 30 or so of them. So um, my intent is to keep moving forward with that. I just want to make sure everybody knows where I stand on it. And also, um, the other thing I was brought to my attention a couple days ago, um, I was here on Friday, and I saw a physician that I know for many years since the day he moved into the county was in the waiting room. But um, I get, Blake, I, I, I know we're going to be talking about this in the future. And we also got an email from the Medical Society today, and I assume that's why Valerie's here. And um, the Blake, Memo Blake Medical had approached me May 22nd of 2019 and asked if he could meet with me about this um, elder gray criteria. It's a program that they use at trauma centers. Sarasota Memorial uses it. Sarasota Memorial's ER has more ER beds than all three hospitals we have in Manatee County. So they're able to do something like this. But what it is, it's a program where you look at certain diagnoses like fall with a laceration, a stroke, fractured hip, you know, um, break it, broken bones. And um, they go to the trauma center and there is some studies that, it, um, but I've heard that it's not concrete that the outcomes are better. So Blake approached me and asked me what I thought about it. Well, work in the medical world doing billing for my husband. I asked the administrator, I said, well, I happen to know that the, the diagnosis is that are, would be diverted from everywhere, all the other hospitals in the county that go to Blake are the highest paying diagnosis that you can get paid on by Medicare. Fractured hips, major lacerations, strokes, um, uh, um, brain bleeds from, you know, car accidents, stuff like that. Those are your highest paid. So I, I told the administrator that. I said, well, I understand why you want it, but um, I think that this should be a community effort. So he didn't hear from me, and he wrote me back and asked me what my thoughts were. In the meantime, I had met with Paul DeSecco then. Um, Karen Stewart was there, or I think I copied them, John Osborne, and Jake was part of it. And um, Randy Kieran asked me um, 
what was going on, how did I feel about it, come to find out Randy had met with e, um, EMS before. And they more or less told him the same thing. And what I told him after much, much discussion, it's recommended that this should be a community decision um, with you and the other hospitals. And I said, I'd be glad to set something up where we could talk as a community and um, get some input. And he wrote me back and said, no, thank you. So now I know he's been approached by us again, and I heard the physicians heard about it, and they're in uproar. There's many physicians that don't go to Blake. There's many physicians don't go to Manatee. Um, and to me, this is a community effort, and we shouldn't be deciding on the life or death of who goes where. Uh, I, didn't, I told them I did not want to get involved with the EMS's decisions because they have protocols. And going across town, no matter where you are, if you're on the west side or the east side, you go to the closest hospital. That's what saves your life. So I see that, um, I'm not sure what's really going on. I just saw um, that Commissioner Ball did send an email that she was doing fact finding. I wanna no let you know that I did hear about this in 2019 and per our professionals, which was our medical director of, of EMS and EMS, uh, I was gonna follow their lead as they're the professionals in it, but, but Blake Medical chose not to um, go that route, they didn't want to. I saw that I have a meeting with um, Blake tomorrow at 10, so I guess I'll be talking to them also. And who I met with was Dr. Silverstein. I still, I don't know if he's still the medical director. No, Rubenstein, sorry. Um, but that's who I met with, Randy Kieran and Dr. Rubenstein, the medical director at that time in 2019. So that's where I've been involved and I wiped my hands of it because this is a protocol for public safety EMS they need to work that out. And I, I don't think county government should get in the middle of that. That's all. Um, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say uh, today, thank all of you and say that today was a great day for District 3. Mm -hmm. Ninth Avenue uh, road and <coughs> sidewalk improvements as well as lighting. Uh, and we got a new pool for swim lessons as well. So mm -hmm. thank you to all of you for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on is sort of an email came through not long ago and it sort of s sparked a memory from the campaign trail. Uh, there's a guy named Rodney Jones who, I, he's a community activist and, mm -hmm. and I know oftentimes he's really brash in his delivery. Um, but if you listen, a lot of times his, he makes sense and so he does, there are facts in there. Uh, you just have to sort of sort through some of his shouting sometimes. Um, and he and I don't agree on everything, but I always listen to folks even when I don't agree with them. Uh, one of the things that he brought up is that 100% of the department heads here at this county, as well as the deputy administrators and the administrators, everybody is, I mean, we're lily white. Uh, there is literally no diversity uh, at the highest level of, of management here. Um, and I, listen, I would never want a person to receive a job or a promotion strictly based on their skin color. I uh, you know, I'll be clear about that. Mm -hmm. But it it's sort of seems when you look at that flow chart, it's sort of painfully obvious that the county is not affording enough opportunity to minorities um, to reach the higher levels of management. Uh, and I'm not advocating to replace any department heads or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Um, we have really strong people in a lot of these positions. But what I'm hoping for is that this commission will make this issue a priority moving forward. Um, and I wanna be sure that our new administrator makes this a higher priority than the current administration has. You know, basically, and without getting too into the weeds on it, the county government should reflect the constituents, the citizens that it serves, um, really in, in just about every aspect. And right now we don't. Uh, so all I'm asking for is for everybody when, when you're looking, you know, talking to potential new administrators, uh, going through that process, just, you know, in your mind, keep this, you know, this subject in your head that is as new department heads over the years come in that um, every opportunity is afforded um, to all possible candidates who could fit the bill and properly represent our community. That's, that's all I'm going for. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amen. I go along with that. Uh, Commissioner Bellamy, did you have a comment you want to make? Yeah, I want to make a comment on that um, because I actually responded to everybody um, to, to his email. Um, and for, uh, for clarity, I had already met with the county administrator and HR 
um, director as it relates to um, <coughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion. And and thank you for bringing it forward. To be to be honest with you, but more important uh, and more important, as we read the um, proclamation this morning, I saw something different within my commission and colleagues, and it was very appreciative because you all opened your arms and extended an invitation um, to our NAACP uh, president as well as the Minnesota um, Black Chamber um, president, CEO, and founder. That, that being said, with the conversation that I've had with the county administrator as far as how we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we do have an employee here now um, currently that, that's part of his job description. Um, as I discuss with them, it is my strong um, recommendation that that has a separate entity as far as how that is addressed. From what I understand, the, the county is in the process of looking for a DEI, which is the terminology, a DEI consultant. Um, because once we take and we look at the data, like that was brought forward um, from, from Mr. Jones, and we see... Um, those areas that we could potentially address or we feel that we need to address, we still would need a strategy on how we're going to do that. Um, we still would need to take and make sure we hear from, hear from the community as far as how that needs to, how that needs to be addressed. And in my, in my mindset, it's, it's just like we always say, how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's one bite at a time. We, we do know that there's some work that needs to be done in this area. In my opinion, it's a lot of work. Um, how that work is done, I think we start with the consultant. Um, I think from this commission, we, we identify, um, maybe not necessarily develop a specific department, but one individual um, of color, or that's from a minority um, descent, to make sure that they are on the ground working and, and addressing these issues strategically and specifically. With the intent, with the intent to, to hear from the community, but more importantly, that doesn't look good as far as when you look at those numbers where it's 12 to 0 or 13 to 0 or anything like that. And it's, it's, it's very, very um, alarming for us to be that way in Manatee County. But I think we look at the data and we identify how we're going to move the needle as, as far as going out in recruitment. And obviously, if you want to recruit, if you want to recruit minority, you go, minorities, you go to the HBCUs because that's where the minorities are and you find ways to bring them back. I think the internship program is great here. And, and I've asked for the county administrator to consider looking at some of the HBCUs and making sure that we have minority representation um, in the internship program. Mr. Clark is a great example on what that, that intern program can bring to Manatee County. And I tell you, there's some talent out there all right, and with, within the minority pool. And there's some opportunity out there where we can bring diversity to our county and look at this from a different approach. Thanks for bringing it forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and just to be clear again, I'm not saying that, you know, we should put in like a quota system or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I look at the chart and I thought, damn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, not not one person with a good tan, you know. Um, and that's that's pretty glaring. There's not even a redhead on the list, you know. I mean, you got to have something a little different. A ginger. Um, that's not good, right? That's not but, good, Kevin. That's not good. But Kevin. I mean, there's there's not, that's not good. there's not any any sort of, you know, it looked like a family photo almost. Very low pass. Can I um, can Very low I, pass. Can I comment, on Madam Chair? Yes, please. <laughs> um, I was Kevin. Hoping you would. Yeah, Kevin. <laughs> I, I, I I caution myself on that that some of that terminology, but I, I think where 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 we are is as this commission. As this commission, we have the opportunity to say this is where we are and where we want to go. Sure. And whether it's from, I agree with you, I understand what you're saying about a, about a, a, a quote or anything like that, but it does need to be a difference. Mm -hmm. And right. if it's zero percent now and, and, we, and we give another percentage, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can only come up. And, it, and, and it, I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of times um, from where I sit, we laugh to quit from crying, to be honest with you because some of the sad things that we experience and some of the things that we have endured. However, this is an opportunity, just as I said to Mr. Jones, for us to unite and for us to communicate and for us to move the needle. But in order for us to move the needle, it's quite clear where we are, but where do we want to go? I think that discussion is more important than anything. Yeah, it's just, it's a land of opportunity. And I just, I look at it and I think, it doesn't seem like we're really affording a, a fair opportunity across the board here when I, when I look at 13 to zero or 15 to zero, whatever it is. So anyway. Thank you, Commissioner. Anything else, sir? 
I, I'm on the board. Uh, you're on the board. Just be paid. So you're done, Commissioner Van Osten Ridge. Okay, Commissioner Whitmore. Jesus Christ. Um, we have Jerry Lopez. It's um, MIT grad that um, many master's degrees. Uh, she's, a, a, and I can't remember her name, Reggie. It was uh, Rodney was our personnel director, Kim, but mm -hmm. our friend before her, and her sister works here in planning from Palmas. Oh, anyway, my God. Did what? The fact that it takes us no, much no, no, no. It, it was only a, like four or five years ago, but I mean, I know. Stephanie's sister. Yeah. yeah Stephanie's sister. <laughs> Stephanie Dale. Moreland. Dale. Yes. Dale. Dale. Dale was our personnel director, and she worked her way up. But yeah, I 100% agree we do. Um, but uh, I do remember um, Dale. Yeah. And she left, she retired. She'd been here 30 years. Commish or Commissioner Cruz, do you have anything, sir? Me? <laughs> no, just a, a couple of quick things. Um, one, just to kind of go along with what uh, Commissioner uh, Survey said, uh, relative to the webinar that, that she just attended. Mm -hmm. uh, people always ask about how they can, they can help. In fact, we talked about this earlier, people saying they'd want to get involved with affordable housing, things like that. Uh, we do have three applications open, or three positions open for application on the Affordable Housing Board for Manatee County right now. Uh, one of them specific to the Planning Commission, so unless you're one of seven people watching this, then it's not relevant to you. <laughs> but uh, the other two positions, one is for a professional in real estate. The other one was my old seat. Um, I had to step down so we didn't have two commissioners on the, the board. So that's uh, literally open to anybody who lives in unincorporated Manatee County. Applications are due on the 19th. So I believe that's next Friday. So if you are interested in getting involved, it, it's a great group. There's some great professionals in affordable housing and out of affordable housing on that group. Um, it, it's very dynamic, good discussions. Um, it's not like some of the advisory boards, which are a little quieter. Or they only meet every now and then. This is this is a, an active group that's making big proposals in Manatee County. So if you're interested, take a look on our website, uh, if it's working, uh, mymanatee.org, and uh, you can apply for that. Uh, second thing on a board I am on still uh, we just had our first Peace River uh, Water Authority meeting, and I know we've been trying to kind of keep each other in the loop. This is more of a meet and greet and update, mainly for my sake, since I think I'm the only new person on that board. Uh, it, it, it consists of Manatee County, Sarasota County, DeSoto County, and Charlotte County, one commissioner from each, uh, each county, and, and we all work together on, on the Water Authority. And people have asked me, and honestly I asked myself, you know, what are we doing there? Because we, we do have our dam, which we just uh, discussed. But it, based on projections, we're going to start needing to use some of that water starting in 2035 is the current project, projection. It was 37. It's mo since moved up. So it, it's an important board because we, we do need to keep track of our, our water supply and make sure it's, it's adequate in the future. Uh, one of the things we're going to be working on this year is how to start making that connection from the, the main hub in Arcadia up through Sarasota to connect to the, the pipes we already have coming down because we, we currently sell water to Sarasota so that we can start getting in the loop there for when it comes up. So uh, that's one of the main things we'll be doing this year. Uh, the only other thing I was gonna mention is I've been finalizing going through all my orientations with departments. I did meet with Jan and the, the finance department. We talked about a lot of uh, potential big ideas in terms of moving some of the stuff in Manatee County forward, kind of putting some of the stuff on steroids and kind of just like pushing it uh, much quicker. One of them has to do with local vendor preferences and how we're going to handle that going forward to, to try to kind of keep some of our tax dollars locally uh, or at least in a, a smaller pool of local. And uh, that's something they're looking into and I'm continuing to speak with them on. The other thing is relative to bonds. We, we always talk about bonding roads and, and doing things on a, a bigger basis here. Uh, so just to let everyone know, I'm putting a, a lot of effort into this and pointing on meeting with some of our, our bankers and, and with the finance department again and just starting to at least get something right now. It's a lot of arbitrary throwing out. I think we can bond a lot or we can only bond a little or it's going to be 1% or 2% or 5 Nobody actually has real information, so I'm just trying to put some of this information together so we can we can have bigger discussion, whether it be on a work session or on a, a board meeting, uh, with a little bit more concrete information in terms of what we could theoretically do to start moving some of this forward because, as we're all saying here, th there's a lot of stuff we need done. And... You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you look around Manatee County, there's like 50 number one priorities, depending on who you ask, whether it's sidewalks or streetlights or it's major roads or widening or, 
you know, one of the things on that list we just went through in terms of priorities was the, the, the rails and trails, and, and mm -hmm. that's something I care about a lot. But, you know, while it's on that list, it's third from the bottom. So there's a lot of number one priorities, and the more we can get some of those number one priorities all up to the top simultaneously, uh, I think the better our quality of life will be in the long run, at least to start catching us up a little. So, you know, that's some of the things I talked about with the finance department. And uh, as I gather more information, I'll let everyone know, and hopefully we can come up with a little bit more of a concrete plan with specific information, not hypothetical information moving forward. That's it. All right, guys, I'm doing an email here that's, I'm dying to tell you guys about it. It just came up this afternoon, so. You can mention it to me, my attorney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what, why not? Um, I've got a few things. Um, Misty has, I just received this letter that Misty was talking about for Bayshore with the cancer cluster. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that probably, Misty, it would be best for you to read it to the board because they haven't seen it, I haven't read it. So why don't you go ahead and read it to the board and let them decide if they want it uh, as is. Oh, is that what we normally yeah, do? Yeah, I think that's the best thing to yeah, do. Yeah, okay. we never saw it. You know, everybody yeah. knows what's in it. Saw it, yeah. Best thing to do. Okay. Then, I haven't either. All right. It's dated February 9th today. I don't like that. I don't either. <laughs> you don't stop. February. We're not tired. It's We're getting a little tired. It's addressed to Keisha Reed, PhD, Director of Public Health Research, Division of Community Health Promotion, the Florida Department of Health, 4052 Bald Cypress Way, BIN 824. Tallahassee, Florida, 32399, the Florida Department of Health. The regarding is Bayshore High Cancer Cluster Study, additional information. Dear Dr. Reed, I understand that you are the lead contact for the Florida Department of Health regarding the Bayshore High Cancer Cluster Study in Manatee County. Thank you for the work that you and your staff did on, on the recent analysis where you did not find evidence to support a cancer cluster. Our board received an email on January 25th, 2021, and a report dated April 24th, 2017, from Richard Smith, Professor of Statistics and Biostatistics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Smith has been a pro bono consultant on this matter and has analyzed data received from former Bayshore High student Cheryl Hosa. I am including his report and email. Mr. Smith writes, quotations, I have analyzed the data compiled by Ms. Hosa on cancer cases among former students and employees of Bayshore High School, and I believe they contain overwhelming evidence of a cancer cluster at this location, specifically of leukemia, but possibly affecting other cancers as well. Commissioner Misty Servia represents the Bayshore area and has pressed for analytical conclusions for her Bayshore High constituents. Many alumni believe there is a connection between contaminated water from the site that once housed Riverside products and the incidences of cancer. Our board asks that you please re review Mr. Smith's report and inform us if there is anything mentioned that has not been considered in the state's analysis that should be. In addition, just a moment. in addition to cancer questions, Commissioner Servia has pushed for birth defects to be analyzed as many former students wonder if there is a correlation. Please also let us know if this is something that the state can evaluate. We greatly appreciate your time and efforts on behalf of the Bayshore High alumni and community. Sincerely, Vanessa Baugh, Chairman. All commissioners are copied. Dr. Richard Smith, Professor is also copied and the attachments are included. Sounds good. That's it. Um, Misty, do you wanna, has the county attorney looked at that at all? Do you no, um, no. I, uh, it's okay. I don't think that's a okay. yeah, that's fine. matter. I don't need to review that from a legal standpoint. I, I heard what you said, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, on top of that, I just uh, sent all the commissioners um, a sample resolution, if you will, for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. There is a Senate bill that has been filed, Senate Bill 62, um, trying to um, remove the planning councils out of the Florida statutes. So 
Nick, did you want to come forward and say anything on that and give us a little bit of background and then I can take it from there. Madam Chairman, may I ask a... Oh. Sure. I press my button. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> on, are we finished with the Bayshore High letter? Did you want a motion from the board it's since you yeah. had me read it? Or no? We'll make a motion. Let's All make right. a motion. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion, since it's my letter, that the, the chairman of the board sign the letter sent with the attachments to the Florida Department of Health. I'll second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Servia, second by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Before we vote, is there anyone from the public that would like to come forward? Not seeing anyone, and we have no one on, on the telephone either. I'll close public comment. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? It is approved unanimously. Okay. Good catch. Thank you. Commissioner Satcher, did you have anything you wanted to add, by the way? You're on the board. Uh, it wasn't on that topic. It was part of Commissioner comments. Would you prefer me to do it now or late? Well, I know, he did, didn't he? You go ahead. Okay. Hold up, Nick. Hold up. Sorry, Nick. I apologize. Well, my nose. Um, I just wanted to uh, relate. Uh, excited about what's gone on here today. Um, excited about uh, seeing good, good changes here in Manatee County. Um, but I wanted to tell a story of, you know, I haven't been here long, but the most significant thing I believe I've been a very tiny part of uh, since I've been a commissioner, uh, is that a Manatee County deputy, um, first name April, I won't say her last name, um, but she was she was run over, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and should have died, but she survived by the grace of God, and um, Sheriff Wells uh, did a public announcement about it, very upset about it. Um, I got contact through my wife. My wife uh, is friends with her. Um, not close friends, but more than acquaintances, and uh, that she was in the hospital. And she was at Blake, and I happened to have the number of the CEO for uh, Blake, for uh, Randy Curran. And I just sent him a text. All I said, it was, uh, all I said was, you know, there's a, a Manatee deputy that was run over at your hospital. And, um, and, to know and by in the morning, even that night, um, just how much uh, care had been taken of that deputy. Uh, it just, it was so significant. Um, just the most fulfilling thing I've been able to be a part of so far. Um, so to see, you know, what a great job the, the sheriff's office does, the deputies do, putting their life on the line, um, and then the job that uh, Randy did, and the entire hospital there at Blake. So I just wanted to recount that story. Good. Thank you, James. Good story. All right. Uh, getting back to the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, um, Nick, why don't you go ahead, and then I'll fill in. Thank you, Chairman Bach. Commissioners, Nick Azera, Information Outreach Manager, and your legis State Legislative Affairs Coordinator. Um, Commissioner Baugh, actually, Chair Baugh, came to me yesterday afternoon, asked uh, if I was aware of a bill that had just passed one of uh, Senate committee and uh, was scheduled to go uh, before the Senate Judiciary next, although no, not calendared yet. And that was uh, regarding the proposed um, dissolve, dissolvement of the Regional Planning Councils. And uh, we exchanged uh, a little update on that. You know, these are updates that we get periodically from FAC and from our state lobbyists. Try not to inundate you with updates, but definitely provide you with weekly re reports to that effect. And, and so those, uh, that bill just passed out of committee. Commissioner Brock brought it to my attention and said uh, you, the board, may want to take a more active position on it. You know, it, with thousands of bills that, that get filed every year, we try to um, monitor the ones that would impact local government or any of your priorities most closely. And um, so, again, Chair Bob brought this to my attention. And and now is kind of the time. There's one more committee week after this week remaining uh, before the legislative begin legislative session begins early part of March. And uh, so if the board wanted to take a position on this bill, um, now is probably the time to do that. Uh, I mentioned in the email summary to you yesterday that there is no House Companion at this time. And um, I spoke to our lobbyist, Martha uh, Edenfield, 
<clears throat> after you and I spoke, Chair Baugh, and she said that, you know, this comes from uh, a, a freshman senator who had filed a lot of legislation and there was no discussion yet of it being taken up in the House. That said, you know, you pointed out that some other counties uh, who are members of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council were starting to um, consider resolutions opposed to that legislation. So now's the time. If uh, it's not on our board's priority list, if you wanted to take a position on it, uh, we could get a, either a letter prepared um, to Senator Boyd, who is on the next uh, committee Fish of reference, uh, and, or, um, or to bring a resolution back before the board at your next, uh, next opportunity for, for voting. Thanks, Nick. It, it's um, it's a little bit more serious, really. This um, this has come up before in the Senate, and it was Senate leadership that asked Senator Bradley to carry this bill on the Senate side. Right now, no, there is no uh, um, there's no bill on the House side, but it's too soon to really know whether or not that might come about. The MPOAC, which is the advisory council for the MPOs uh, in the state of Florida voted in their meeting that I was at, um, I guess it's been two weeks ago now, uh, to also send a letter to the Senate. It, the, many people are concerned about this and a lot of people don't realize that the, um, the regional planning councils also in some counties have people that sit on the boards of the MPOs. So this affects a lot more than just, um, you know, what you might think, you know, everybody's heard, well, they used to do DRIs. Well, that is so outdated, and they're doing so much more now than ever before. Um, you know, it's like anything else. There's some planning councils that don't do a lot. That is not ours. Ours is very active. Uh, we've had a lot of things that uh, we have brought forward. Manatee County is very involved with our planning council on resiliency. I know that Misty was at um, a, a day seminar. Actually, it was two days. Uh, last, Not last year, year before. I went to that as well. So there's a lot of work that they do, and uh, you know it does help. So all of the counties that are members of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council are going to their boards asking them to either do a, a proclamation, a resolution, um, or a letter uh, showing support to keep the, the Regional Planning Councils. Um, I think it's a good thing, and, and this is just a sample of what they gave me yesterday in the meeting. Everybody took this. I just wanted to bring it up today to give you an idea. This was coming, and the next meeting that we have, I will, uh, with your permission, bring something a little bit more concrete for us to look at that is really more per Manatee County. Um, but we need to be involved, and we need to keep this. This is not... Uh, you know, the same thing as, as what Reggie has had conversation with us about with T-Barta. This is a whole different ball game. So uh, this is something that we need to step up and, and, and support our planning council in this regard. Also, since we're talking about the planning council, I'll let you know that yesterday I was voted in as their secretary and treasurer of their executive board. So, um, you know, they're very busy. They have a lot that they're doing right now. So just wanted to bring this up for discussion. Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, for bringing it up. I also saw it referenced in the MPOAC um, letter that we all received. And so I'm happy that we're talking about it. It may be a little premature right now. I understand it's just getting formed, but it is very important what the Regional Planning Council does to serve Manatee County. It's a very important um, group of people, and so I agree. We should keep our eyes on it and be ready to, I would support writing a letter uh, in favor of maintaining our regional planning councils. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. I, um, you know, for those of us that serve on the MPO, we realize the importance of this organization. Um, you know, and, and obviously the MPOAC is the advisory council for the MPOs. They're writing a letter. Um, and by the way, I did send all of you, I copied you the newsletter that we're going to be getting, I think it's going to come out like once a week oh, for now, nice. letting us know anything transportation-wise that's going on in Tallahassee. So that will also be helpful. Um, on that note, you know, the MPOAC, uh, in their meeting, um, they asked me if I would be their at-large member on their executive board. So it seems like my year is going to be extremely busy. But a good one. The more that we can get involved and have Manatee County involved in transportation issues, 
the better it is for this county, and we certainly have a lot of um, needs. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I won't bring anything else up. Uh, do we need to? Um... Madam Chair, Commissioners, I do need a few minutes of the board's time this evening to talk about the county administrator's position and ask for some direction on some things, but I think that the clerk could use a recess for a few minutes first. This okay. could take a little while, and we haven't had one since we came back from lunch. So respectfully, so I'd ask, she's not here, ask okay. for a break. Ten minutes. All right, we'll take a 10-minute recess. Thank you. Thank you.
must be a reason why John. All right, let's go ahead and uh, finish up the meeting. Attorney Clegg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we turn to the um, county administrator position, Commissioner Whitmore, about 10 minutes ago, I got my daily list of RLSs that came in today, and we did receive an RLS today on the Bishop cool. Shelter donation. So I will look at that as soon as I can and let all of you know how we intend to handle it. Thank so, you. So once again, um, I do need to um, take some time with the board this evening uh, to discuss the county administrator position and to ask for direction from the board on a couple of points. As the board is well aware, next Wednesday you are scheduled to meet to consider whether to terminate Ms. Corrier's relationship with the county as county administrator. And while the outcome of that meeting is not preordained, as the attorney for this board and for the county, I do feel that I have a responsibility to have some mechanism in place to assure that if the board makes that decision, that the county government continues to function. And I think it's important for the public to understand that the county administrator position is really essential to that. There really has to be somebody in that position. One need only look at Florida Statute 12574 and our own code section 2-223, which mirrors that statute. Those lay out the powers and duties of the county administrator, and there is a wide range of decisions and functions that are assigned to the county administrator in our codes, our procedures, our agreements, and the many directions that come from this board to staff. We're talking about everything from preparing and submitting a budget to the board, filling vacant <coughs> positions. We have some significant vacancies coming up. Assuring that staff responds to board direction, managing the county's finances, and assuring that essential public services are provided to people in this county every day. And just as a corporation cannot function without a CEO to make executive decisions on a daily basis. A county that is structured the way ours is cannot function without someone designated to fill the role of county administrator to make executive decisions. I do want to distinguish between the decision to find a permanent county administrator as opposed to somebody to serve as an acting county administrator in the short term. I'm not talking about the decision long term for a permanent administrator, but whom do we put in the, the spot if Ms. Corrier leaves? The decision to find a permanent administrator is a longer term decision, and it may require, given some of the discussion I've heard from the board, revisiting the qualifications for that position, and those are adopted by ordinance and set forth in the county code. So today, we're simply talking about who takes the position as acting county administrator while the board goes through that process. And I use the term acting because that is how both the statutes and our code describe it. It is interchangeable with interim. It means someone temporarily taking the position while the board makes the longer term decision of who is the permanent new administrator. We've had some difficulty identifying somebody within the county who is prepared to step into the position of acting county administrator. So there has been some discussion about who on the outside may be available to step into the role with the right experience. And as I indicated to each of you in briefings, with the chair's permission, I have had discussions with former Sarasota County Commissioner Charles Hines, who was willing to step into that role. He does have, in my view, the requisite experience to keep the county running and to help the board to formulate its process for the longer term decision of hiring a permanent county administrator. Now, I will be very candid with you. I recognize it is not my role as the county attorney to pick an administrator or even an acting county administrator. But some effort went into identifying Mr. Hines as someone who could keep the organization stable while the board embarks on this larger decision-making process. And I do feel it's my responsibility to at least bring that option to you, which is what I'm doing today. 
If it is not him, then if the board has another choice, and again, we are not talking about a permanent county administrator, but just an acting county administrator for the temporary period while you make that long return decision, I will need to know pretty quickly whom you want me to negotiate with as a board. Now, before I ask you to make a decision on that, I do want to inform you that this morning I did receive an email through Ms. Corrier from her counsel indicating that they are willing to um, and requesting that we negotiate an agreement with her for an amicable separation from the county. This would require a written amendment to her existing contract, either a supplement or amendment to set forth the terms of her departure, and it would avoid the need for a meeting where the board takes a vote to terminate her. While I am confident that something like that can be crafted and brought back to the board for consideration, it is unlikely we could do that by next Wednesday, and they have asked that we postpone that decision to allow the time to negotiate that separation agreement, which I will tell you as an attorney representing the board, I think is reasonable because we need to lay out those terms and then I would like the chance to talk to each of you about it individually before you have to make a decision about it. What was it? So that is another decision point. I should also mention that Mr. Hines reached out to me today by email and said he is comfortable that if the board does decide to direct me to negotiate with him, that he would come around and meet with each of you first before I were to ask you to make a, take a vote on any contract to bring him in as acting county administrator. So those are the decision points that are in front of us today. I'm not sure if you would like me to provide you with recommended motions. I'm prepared to do so if you'd like to talk about it first. I, I'm I think certainly comfortable this board with needs that. to have a discussion on That's this. Fine. And um, Commissioner Whitmore, you can start, and then Commissioner Van Ostenbridge is next. Well, I know Commissioner Hines, and um, he's a businessman, but also an attorney. So, uh, of course, I know there's four votes to um, not uh, to um, release her for contract. So. I guess we have to be realistic about this, but um, I'm still hoping common sense will prevail and that won't happen, but then I wouldn't understand why she'd want to stay. Um, negotiating a separation agreement, I think it's only fair after 30 years. And it probably took her a while to come to that, uh, to decide, because I think she really wanted to stay here for the citizens of Manatee County. She doesn't care about anything else. So um, that's something that, um, totally I would support that's the least that's due to her um, I would uh, with the with what's gone transpired on the board and not me but I think it should uh, the, the um, if you have to have a commissioner I think it should either be Bellamy or Serbia because I'm too you know you know how I feel and I don't want to uh, be any projections of being um, biased on anything, so I don't want to be involved with it, but I do think, in all fairness with respect to her, from comments that have been made about her, I think it should be somebody that's more neutral. So, and, um, but, so, if we're gonna, if you need time to negotiation, negotiate a separation agreement, she would stay until we vote, we sign that, and then Commissioner Hines would um, come uh, and temporarily, and then we'll start on probably a nationwide search. And we have to do an ordinance to change the criteria if we decide that, correct? And then we do a nationwide search? That is one way that the board could choose to proceed, yes. Mm -hmm. There's more than one way that the board could do this. Commissioner Hines has been through multiple administrator hires in Sarasota County, so he has shared some thoughts with right. me about the different ways this could be approached. But honestly, I think it's better he talk directly to each of you right. about that than for me to try to sort of channel his thoughts to the board. I don't and think that's appropriate. He has been through multiple hires before in the county in really rough times a few years back. He's very professional. I've, I've been on a few boards that he's been on through the years, but we've been at meetings with Sarasota County Commissioners. I did not realize he was an attorney, so to me that's a plus. Um, and uh, he's never been a person to be um, very con confrontational and um, always willing to work with others. I've heard that others 
people in the community want would be interested in in that position and I don't the ones that I've heard I don't support them so and, and I never even would have thought of Commissioner Hines so um, temporarily I'll live with it if I have to which I'm sure with the votes we'd have to so that's Madam all. Chair could I just respond to one Please. remark from Commissioner, Commissioner Whitmore I think it's best in terms of you know if the board wants me to negotiate a separation agreement with Ms. Corey. I think that should be handled between the attorneys. I'm, I'm not perfect. asking for oh, a commissioner to be appointed to, to I, I will come around and talk to each yeah. of you about it at the appropriate time. So you all have equal opportunity okay. to give me your thoughts about it. I remember it. with Ed, we all had to I understand remember, that, but and I Larry had to be a, involved, I think. I, okay. I, I have a little bit of a different approach to okay. that, and particularly under these circumstances. Good, thanks. Anything else, Commissioner Whitmore? No, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Um, so I've I've even said to Miss Corrier, I think she's given much to this county. She's been here over 30 years, and I believe she's due a severance. Uh, my question to the county attorney would be: Did Miss Corrier's attorney propose any sort of preliminary terms? Not as yet, no, sir. Do we need, as a board, to set some sort of parameters? For you as you enter into negotiations it's hard with sunshine obviously I, I think I'd rather at this point given where we are let them take the mm -hmm. provide the first draft and lay those out sure and then I will come around and talk to each of you and I will keep each of you informed <coughs> okay. um, I don't know Heinz I'll, I'll reach out to him um, but I, I you know I propose the idea of Scott hopes I like him very much he's very well qual very qualified um, um, and has experience here in Manatee County. And he does have a master's in epidemiology and we are in an epidemic. Um, so he is also as a doctorate in business administration. Um, but I guess my point would be, I, you know, I'll talk to Heinz, I'll keep an open mind with Heinz, but I, I think we have people here in Manatee County who could serve in that role. Uh, but obviously and discussion for the board. Respectfully, Commissioner, I don't disagree. I feel like we're under some significant time pressure, though, to get somebody in sure. quickly that, that the board is comfortable with. And sure. I am no. concerned about the organization and keeping and, you all on and, an even that keel. Spirit, right, and in that spirit, not to be competitive, I'm just in that spirit, um, I think that Hopes is somebody that we're all familiar with. So anyway, sure. that's all. And I, I do appreciate you taking the initiative, though. I Thank have no you, issues sir. with that at all. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, just uh, since you've dealt with, with the attorneys on this, what would you think would be a reason? Well, I know this is so up in the air. I've, I've <coughs> dealt with attorneys that have resolved something in five minutes and attorneys that it's five years later. W what do you anticipate relative to a sufficient amount of time where nobody feels like they're, they're under pressure because we don't have to keep coming back and pushing this every other week? Very fair question. I've told Ms. Corrier that I think you all would expect to have something back to you by the 23rd which is They're expected to come back to us by yes, the so that wouldn't be a finality that's just the first round no that would I, I would endeavor to bring you an agreement that can be approved on the 23rd and I think they're okay with that now I can't speak for how long it would take to bring Mr. Hines assuming he's okay with the board assuming. there may be a, a carryover where you either decide to ask Ms. Corrier to stay for another week or two or I think Karen Stewart would be willing to do it on a very short-term basis, but and, I don't want to speak for her, but yeah. very short-term. If, if we had a comfort level that that the acting administrator was coming in, uh, I think okay, I Okay, yeah, because I, I don't know Charles either. It, it sounds like he's, he's more than qualified, especially when we're talking about an interim position. It sounds yes, like he, he checks all the boxes, but yeah, it is an important position. It, yes. I, I should probably at least see him face to face once. I heard he's a red. He's a redhead. It's another box. <laughs> yeah, he, he does check off that redhead problem we had over here. And that that is his intention as well as mine that you would see him and have a chance to talk to okay, him. Okay, absolutely. Because just, just yes, like sir. just like Commissioner Van Osterbridge had a name in his mind, I had a name in my <coughs> mind. But I'm bouncing voicemails back and forth, so I, I'm not going to say who that is. But you know, I, I, I'm comfortable with anyone that the collective board's okay with. But I do think for this position, everyone should at least have an opportunity to meet. Maybe there's a day where our calendars just happen to be clear, mm -hmm. where he can just come in and, and do what we sometimes do, you know, whether it's briefings, whatever. You can even just leave him in a conference room and people cycle in every 30 minutes just so there's some comfort level. Yes, sir. We're showing the people of Manatee County we're at least doing and some diligence here. All I would ask for today is authority to begin negotiating with him with the understanding that it, that's got a, that process has to play out and the board has to have that opportunity to meet and talk with him. Understood. And relative to, I know this is slightly <coughs> uh, 
off topic, but not exactly. Uh, we have Deputy Administrator uh, Osborne leaving as well on the 16th. Yes. I know the County Administrator has, has certain roles, uh, presumably <coughs> John does as well. Uh, we're going to need to start considering that position uh, fairly quickly. That is correct. And you and I spoke about this. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. That is correct. All right, mm -hmm. so that, that's, is that a topic for another day, or is that a... I'm going to bring it up okay. when I speak. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, just, just to, I know everyone wants to talk, but just to get the ball rolling, I mean, I, I made the original motion. I, I would make a motion to extend the, the termination period or for discussion of the termination of uh, County Administrator Corey and for the sake of just some cushion, you know, to February 26th. You know, and hopefully okay. we, we target February 23rd, or do you just want to target February 23rd because we have a meeting there? The 26th is fine, and if if you, if you would, I'm just making a motion. You can I'll if you would, would 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 add to that and direction to the county attorneys, the county attorney to negotiate a separation agreement with her. Just to add, if you could just incorporate yeah. that into your motion, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I would make a motion that we we extend the discussion of termination of county administrator Corrier to no later than Friday, February 26th, and authorize the county attorney to begin negotiations of a separation agreement with current county attorney. Our county minister. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a motion by Commissioner Cruz, second by Commissioner Whitmore. Is there anyone from the public that would like to come and speak on this issue before we vote? Okay. <laughs> you get the message? Go ahead, Seth. Our first caller is 605 605. Please press star six to unmute. <laughs> caller, please state Andrew your name for the record. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Griffin, Manatee County. Um, uh, so, uh, so extending the, so she's going to be here until the 26th. Okay. And there's no possibility of having her removed before then. Um, if we find, you know, you guys can negotiate. I don't understand because negotiated negotiations can come after she's left her office. It doesn't need to come before if I'm understanding correctly, as far as Charlie D. Hines, um, I'm more inclined for an attorney because I come from a law background and I think attorneys handle themselves in a more ethical manner than most. Um, I also like the idea that he is an outsider, um, would like to get more information. I love the idea that George brought up to stick him in a room, but it's not just there. I mean, there's a lot of community members here involved and would love to hear from him, you know, in the, in a public forum. So we get to meet him and get to know who he is as well, because I think there's a major disconnect in our administration that does not look at the public <clears throat> in the same light uh, as they should. So I would really like uh, for the public to meet him. Uh, I'm looking him up information about him right now. He seems like a stand-up guy. I just don't know anything about him. And, and why I appreciate all the members of the board being there, it's not just all about you guys, it's about the public as well. We have to be comfortable with who's in that position um, because of the situation that just happened, because of the lack of trust and respect that we have for our county administrator currently. So I would hope that maybe you include the public in, in this as well. Um, I'm an outspoken person about inclusion, not exclusion. Um, and, um, you know, I hope the county the best luck. I hope Sherry the best luck. Um, I, I think she's doing the right thing by, um, um, negotiating her, her, um, exit. And, uh, I think she's, it's helping her as well as the people here, which shows a little bit of respect. You know, she gets a little bit of my respect in, in that respect. So uh, I'm done with my com comments, but I would like to meet, um, uh, Mr. Hines as well. And I think there's other people in this community that would as well. So hopefully you guys take that con that uh, consideration. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and let commissioners speak before we actually vote. Commissioner Bellamy, you're next, sir. He's got one more call. Oh, do you? I'm sorry, Seth. Go sorry, ahead. Sorry, Madam Chair. Yes, 675. 675 is next. Please press star six. Go ahead, caller. Yes. Yes, Corey, uh, Corey Holmes, Manatee County native. Uh, it's important to, okay, so this name, Mr. Hines, comes from out of nowhere. I think it's important to say how we came to understanding that Mr. Hines had an interest. And why would you say that because it comes from the, the attorney's office, 
that it gets a priority over what one commissioner on the board may be referencing. So I think it would be fair to say, let's look at both and put them in a room and hear conversation. Uh, you're, you're totally shutting out the public regarding this decision. And we're, and, and, and if you go forward with the way you're going now, I'm, I'm going to be in support of keeping Sherry. Because you're defeating the purpose. You're setting out the community. So I think if you want to do this right and get it right this time, you need to include the public. And we don't need to extend it. Let the attorneys do their negotiations. Stick farm. You don't fire somebody and say, okay, now you get to renegotiate when you leave. That's just crazy. I have nothing else. Anyone else? Up? Yes, Madam Chair. 445. 445. Please press star six to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, caller. Glenn, go ahead. Glenn, for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Jablina, for the record. Here's my thoughts on this. I know Mr. Hines. I've, I've met him in his office in Sarasota. I've, I've talked to him in front of commissions meetings. Uh, he's a fine gentleman. But let me, let me proffer this. It'll be a long day, but I, I'm with Corey. The public needs to be engaged. We have a workshop next Tuesday. Let's schedule uh, Mr. Hines for after the workshop, maybe perhaps late afternoon, early evening, if folks want to come in and, and chat with him. We should have an opportunity to ask questions of him as well. And as far as uh, Attorney Clegg start negotiations, there's nothing to negotiate. We have an existing contract. It's click and play. Here's the deal. Take it or leave it. So this back and forth for a week and negotiate this, forget about it. We have a contract in place. Don't reinvent the wheel. Here's the benefits and pay we gave Sherry. We're extending that to you. Take it or leave it. Anytime you get into negotiations when you already have an existing contract is absolutely a waste of taxpayers' money. He wants that job more than, than, than we want to give it to him. So I will tell you that. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is that every board member should be able to bring a person forward and should be vetted by not only the board. Uh, personally, I think Sherry should vet them too, but the public should have an opportunity to, to uh, vet these, uh, these positions as well. I mean, we're, we're paying his salary or her salary. You guys aren't making, you guys aren't writing the checks. We're writing the checks, the public. So we have an opportunity to redress whoever it may be. And quite frankly, I wouldn't stop with Mr. Hines. We need to get more people in and, and take the cream of the crop. You don't know who's out there. I don't know how Fred reached out magically and, and sought him out, but that's not his job. His job is to is click and play the contract. So I feel uncomfortable that he's bringing someone into the, into the uh, arena without letting the public know. I think if another commissioner brought him into the arena, I'd have more respect for that. But for, for a county attorney to go out and start solicitating, I have a problem with that. I, re I really do. Uh, so let's bring him in next, next Tuesday after the uh, board workshop. Let's ask him a few questions. And if we can line up any more uh, nominees from the other uh, seven commissioners, let's, let's, uh, let's do that as well. Give everybody out there, have a forum, ask them questions and make a decision from there. So uh, I think my time is about up. Yep, okay, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Do we have another caller? Yes, Madam Chair, 408, 408, please press star six. Hi, Carol Feltz here, Mayaka City. Thank you very much, commissioners. Um, and I'd like to express appreciation to a 30-year employee. I think she's made the right decision. I think that she's going to have a wonderful severance package according to her contract, uh, which I agree with Mr. Gibellina. Um, we are to execute things, not renegotiate them. Um, I think that there are wonderful opportunities out there for her. I also feel a little bit uh, considering the, the the situations that we have that you cannot do any better at this point to display transparency, accountability, and responsibility than to open this position up. 
and let, as Mr. Gibellina say, the public. This needs to be out there in the public. Um, I'm uncomfortable, frankly, with both candidates that have been suggested. We certainly do not need to bribe anybody to come to Florida, even if it is to take on this mess. Um, and I think we have a wealth of candidates out there. Um, uh, conversely, we may just have a wealth of candidates within Manatee County itself. Um, some of the things that Mr. Bellamy talked about and uh, Mr. Van Ostenbridge talked about was the diversity in our uh, county positions. Well, I find a little error with diversity there, too, in that how many county employees do we have that don't even live in Manatee County or haven't been here for very long? And I think we have to look at our own resources for someone who has a familiarity but not a bias with the history of this area, how we got to where we're at right now. Yes, there's always the suspect of ties that bind from the past, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a – those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I think that we have to look at the resources we have in Manatee County. And if we don't have citizens in this county that could run this county, then are we saying that, that we are not bringing people up with information and intelligence and motivation to want to get involved? So whether it's an outside search or whether it is someone, we need that public involvement more than ever now, which would – give our Board of Commissioners a lot more integrity than we've shown in the past to the public, which is a perception, but it is incredible opportunity. And my feelings with, with our leading county administrator is that in business, people change jobs all the time. It's a way of growth and development. Thank we you. have made, made much. Carol, much I hate to ask you, but you need to finish basis, up, please. And it doesn't need to be. I'm done, and thank you very much, Vanessa. Great thank job. Thank you for running. calling, thank Carol. You. Thank you. Any other callers, Seth? That's all we have, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, next is Commissioner Bellamy. Well, um, I, I think in some of the interpretations, um, the things that I'm hearing, we're kind of putting the, the cart before the horse in some of this. Um, I, I understand with the extension on, the fe on February um, the 26th to allow the attorneys um, to hold to hold those necessary conversations as we, as the county, attempt to, um, you know, to, to reach the point of transition when it comes to um, the county administrator. I mean, I was still caught on whether or not she's being terminated with cause or without cause, but it seems like if there's some negotiations that's taking place between attorneys or about to take place between attorneys, I think that's a step um, to make sure that we don't have a, 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 a a big uproar with our county, you know, one side's going one way and one side's going another. And now we have, you know, a lot of emotions and things like that. So if that's an opportunity for the attorneys um, to hold those conversations to kind of avoid that, um, I, I, I applaud um, that, that effort. And um, based on, you know, one of the names that, that came out there, um, I've been very silent with some of the things that took place for the school district of Manatee County. Um, and the impact that it's had on my district. Um, th therefore, I, I don't think I can support that individual because of the things that, and how it impacted um, the community that I, that I, that I, assert, that I serve. Um, nothing against that individual, um, but um, we, we have always found ourselves looking at the conduct and the things that take place at the school, at the school district and stated like, man, we don't want none of that over this way. And, and now we are in a situation where um, one of those individuals' um, name have come up. Um, I, I would be reluctant to um, supporting that name just, just because of some of the things that took place and how it impacted individuals in my, in my district, um, more specifically how it related to um, LMA and all the um, unfortunate things that took place with that. And they're still ongoing to this point right now. Um, but I do think what the intent from the county attorney was is to bring forth, or not necessarily um, bring forth, but we're, we're looking for a neutral person with government experience that can support 
the interim role until we say we're going to um, do that search and identify the criteria for that search. Um, and I'm sure everybody have a name except me. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a name. I just know that someone coming from the school district of Manatee County, I can't necessarily <laughs> you know, go with that at this particular point. But I'm sure everybody's going to bring a name. And the more names come up, you know what? The long it's going to take. And, and if we're going to set a date for February, 20, for February 26, I understand everything that the public is saying that they want to have a voice and they should have a voice. But if we take nine names or five, or set, let's say we take seven names, that's, that's going to be seven different days or different opportunities where we have to have those 30 minute meetings and extend it, which is why a neutral person, a neutral person like Mr. Like, like Mr. Hines may be the step that we need to take because truthfully, past that decision is what our, what our real goal is. Our real goal is to say what's next as far as the county, as far as the county administrator. And um, if Mr. Hines can, and I, and I and trust and, and support a lot of things that Mr. Clegg do and say, but if Mr. Hines can, so if he's already experienced three, or, or what you say, multiple hires of county administrator, that's experience none of us have at this particular point right here. I, well, I, I can't speak for you all. I don't have that experience. And for, for him to have the attorney background and has already sat where we sit, as far as being a county um, commissioner, gives us an opportunity to have someone that's a little bit more seasoned, that's a little bit more seasoned, and that understands this particular process a little bit, little bit better. Um, and I know the, the the county attorney is looking for um, looking looking for direction on, on on the next steps with that. And I'm sure that everybody has their thoughts, but I, I'm prepared to make a motion in, in support of Mr. Of Mr. Hines, so we can take that short term. Concern that we have and start moving on it and go from Reggie, there. Reggie, we already have point, a motion point, on. I, I get that. Before, I get so that. I'm That's sorry. why I say. Well, it could come after, Madam Chair. It can come after. I can. I can stand down uh, until oh, then. Oh, you're right. You're right. Got I'll it. stand down until then. Okay, honey. Thank you, Commissioner Satcher. So I would like to see us uh, set some parameters um, within for in other set up parameters for the county attorney to work within during this time and for each of us. Um, I don't believe that that needs to be one person, one name, and one date. Um, so I would like to see. Here's the, here's what I propose. I propose each commissioner be able to uh, put forward a name and not be held to vote for that person. Uh, later, so someone could put, say Hines, and then once they see another com uh, commissioner proposed a different name, and then we get to vote um, later to see which one of those people we would like to do. I'd like to empower the, uh, the the county attorney to negotiate with each one of them, and we're not looking for someone difficult. So if someone needs three, four weeks to decide whether they want to come work here, that might not be the person we're looking for. Um, they need to say this is a reasonable salary for this position. Um, this is a re reasonable uh, benefit package for this position. Uh, the county uh, board is going to vote as to which person they'd like to go between these. If every one of us said a different name, it'd be seven. If, if uh, four of us say the same name, and then you, know, you see the math. And uh, then if they turn that down, that's fine. That's not our person. Um, I think that that's uh, reasonable. I think we have a meeting on Tuesday. Uh, that we could add this to just that, uh, just a vote, which one of these three people, and uh, make the vote, make the decision, but make a good decision. Commissioner Servia. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to Bill Clegg. I really appreciate uh, what you have brought forward because uh, this is crisis prevention mm -hmm. during a very difficult time. So I, I really appreciate your work. Um, you. The time frame is short, you guys. If this extension is approved as the motion uh, reads right now, we've got about two weeks. Um, I am somebody who will always want to engage the public in almost everything that we do because I think that's how we come to better decisions. But this is, we're talking about an interim 
position. This is creating a bridge so that we can avoid a train wreck or being eaten by alligators. Say it however you want. We have to have somebody in a very short order to keep this county moving seamlessly and keep serving our citizens. Okay, so it's a critical time. We've got to move swiftly. I do not believe there is time for multiple nominations. Um, I like Charles Hines. Uh, I've met Commissioner Hines. Here's what I like about him. He's level-headed. He's smart. He's an attorney. He's gone through the appointment of three, or the hiring of three county administrators while he sat on the Sarasota County Commission. He's very business-minded, and he has the government experience on, on how you've got to negotiate through, um, through government. He's ready to start, and he's not interested in the job. And so for all of those reasons, I think that he is the perfect person to come in for a few months to carry us through a process where we can select a county administrator. And when we do that, be clear that I want the public involved. I want as much public participation as we can get when we go to that final person. But there's no time to do it now. Those are my comments. All right. Um, if I may ask, um, Kevin, KVO, have you already spoken on this issue? I have not. Well, okay. I did. I spoke yeah, earlier. Yeah, All right. I haven't spoken. So I'm. if you don't mind, I'll go next, Kevin, and then and then you come up. Oh, I thought my light's off. Um, <laughs> you're on there. Okay. Well. Well, it's not your turn yet. You have other I know. You've got two in front of you. It says what number you are on there. It doesn't. Um, it's broken. That's why I keep doing it. It's broken? So, yeah, I just see it flashing, but I don't know what number I am. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, it's, it will be me, Kevin, uh, Commissioner Cruz, and then and you. Okay, so I'm number three or number four? Three. Okay. Well, four, because I'm butting in, because I haven't spoken yet. Um, funny enough, I just found a poll on the Florida politics that was posted up in Tallahassee. It's very interesting. I, I sent it to all of you. I don't know if y'all have all seen it. I just sent it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's got some very interesting information on it that, I mean, we're going to have to think about. 54% of Manatee County vo voters favor hiring more county employees who worked in the private sector. Uh, while 33% prefer those with primarily government experience. I mean, it, it goes into a lot of different uh, things here. It looks like it was probably, no one called me, but then again, it looks like it was probably um, pretty extensive in, in the questions that were asked. That's what I brought up um, so at any rate, I sent it to all of you so you could see it. And Carol, thank you for bringing it up because I had not seen it yet. I haven't either. Um, but anyway, I, I sent it to you, so you all have it. Uh, I am not in favor of this motion, and I'm going to tell you why. You know, we've been here, done this before. And it is just, it is continuing to leave us where we are today. As much as I, you know, there's part of me that, that agrees with this change. There's a part of me that doesn't. And at the same time, what I do agree with, however, is that the county needs to stop uh, going through this and our, our, our staff needs to understand what we're doing. They need to understand that they're okay. I think there's a lot of things involved here. So uh, I do not like continuing it for over a week. If you wanted to continue, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I know we had the 17th down. I understand from speaking with the county attorney that he might need a little more time to try and get this done, but to extend it over a, a week um, it just seems like, you know, I feel like deja vu, been here before, done this before. I don't think it's healthy for our county administrator today. I don't think it's, it's, it's healthy for staff. I don't think it's healthy for the residents of Manatee County, and I certainly don't feel that it's healthy for this board as a whole. Uh, I can understand, like I said, extending it somewhat, but not nine days. Um, so I'm not in favor of that. As far as Charlie Hines, I, I know Mr. Hines. He and I have served together on several boards. I think Commissioner Whitmore, you've served with him as well. WCIND, yeah. I think Commissioner Servi, I think you have as well. Uh, I know him from the, my time in the private sector. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, he um, he's certainly someone that I think could step in and, and move and keep the county moving forward. Now, I will tell you, I do not feel that the county's going to stop, okay? I have more faith in our, 
employees than that. And I, I think our staff, they do their job because most of them do it because they love what they do and they love working for the county. And I don't think that's going to change. Um, you know, I will tell you, I feel like that if our county stopped, then we've got bigger issues, bigger issues. A county of this size cannot depend and lean just on one person. That's not how it's done. If that was the case, we wouldn't need 12 directors uh, that Commissioner Van Ostenbridge brought up earlier today. We wouldn't need them. So, you know, I think that sometimes we tend to exaggerate some of the things that we're worrying about. Is it is it a, a fun situation? Uh, no. Is it is it something I want to go through every day? No. Uh, that being said, we all need to come and, and bring this to an end uh, and, and move the county forward. Uh, so I'm not crazy about the motion. Uh, Commissioner Cruz, I understand why you brought it up. I know the county attorney needs a little bit more time, but I think it's just a little bit too long, that, the, the period on it. Um, I don't have a problem with, with uh, uh, Mr. Hines. I still want to call him commissioner, but mm -hmm. he's, he's, no, he's not a commissioner any longer. Um, I, you know, I think he could probably do a very good job. I would rather, for me, I've heard many names that have been brought to me. And I feel like that, you know, to look right now at the temporary position that we're looking at Mr. Hines for is perfect because right now we do not need to say we have a permanent replacement. And I'll be honest with you, I've thought seriously with some of the names that I've heard in supporting one or two of them that I thought, okay, they, they could probably uh, be a great permanent replacement. But I don't feel like that that's really what's best right now for us. And when I say us, I mean the county as a whole. Uh, I don't think that's where we are. I think that this board needs to figure out a way to come together and be supportive and, and run and make decisions that we need to make uh, together. We need to try to show some unity. I think that Mr. Hines will be great in helping us try to do that. I think that he's had a lot of experience at, uh, you know, looking in the market for a permanent administrator. He's done it three times. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, he's a good fit. Mm -hmm. So I'm in favor, uh, except for the time span. I, I think that we're just continuing longer than we need to the inevitable and that's what I want to see done that being said Commissioner uh, Van Ostenbridge you are next thank you madam chair um, I'll echo some of what you said uh, I would say let's not sound the panic alarm um, we're, I don't we're not headed over a cliff here we're, mm -mm. we're making a change in management it actually right. happens all the time right. um, and with sherry gone with the, the government is not going to fall apart. We're in, and if it is, then this move should have been made a lot longer, uh, yes. a, lot, a lot sooner. Great. Um, but, you know, the sheriff's department will still continue to run. Mr. Gore is here. The toilets are going to flush, and it's all going to go away still, right? This does not do <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the government, <laughs> That's hard the to government say. will continue to run. Um, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to, you know, instill, like, fear or panic in people. i just say we're making a, a management change up here. The meeting... Um, on the 17th, basically the negotiation that, that the county attorney referred to with the administrator's attorney, uh, I'm with Commissioner Ball on that as well. I, I don't see a need to extend. Um, I would like to you to enter into negotiations with, with her attorney, and I would like a resolution, and uh, I would like it by the 17th. Uh, that's my position. If we don't have it by the 17th, I'm prepared to move forward yeah, with I, a meeting to terminate. I, I cannot do it by the 17th based on their request. Okay. Well, so then, it would have to be the 23rd. I can right. I can bring it back by the 23rd. Right. I, I'm not the request to I have, the request I have is, is that we ex we do not try to do it on the 17th. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm not looking to extend this thing. Interesting. Um, Why is that? I'm, I'm prepared to move forward they, with the meeting on the 17th. I think it's enough time for you to negotiate a deal between now and then. Um, obviously, I, I support hopes. Um, there seems to be a consensus up here, however, um, that everybody seems to be rallied around Hines. Uh, if that's the case, I think there should be some unity um, amongst the board. So, uh, you know, 
I'll sort of lay down my sword and go along with everybody, and, and we'll go with Heinz if that's what everybody wants to do. If that's the consensus, then I'll, I'll go with the consensus of the board. Um, but I do, I, I do think we should move on. I don't want to continue to prolong and prolong and prolong this. Um, so, um, you know, my next thought would be, how does everyone feel about um, putting the administrator on paid administrative leave and moving on to Heinz? And, you know, let's sort of move forward. There's people on the button. I, I don't have so. a problem with that. Okay, that, that would be my next not. idea to the, for everybody. If we're, if, we're, if we're consolidating around Heinz, fine, let's do that. Have the county attorney enter into negotiations with the administrator's attorney um, and you know, put her on administrative leave and, and sort of you know, move her out of the building and let's, let's move forward. Commissioner Cruz. <clears throat> yeah, a couple things uh, just from what people said. The, the, reason I, I, the, the reason I mentioned the, the extension um, one is because our county attorney requested it. <laughs> He's the one doing the negotiation. I don't want to, you know, you never want to put yourself on, on the clock when it's against yourself. Um, the, really the only reason we kind of need that extension in the first place because we don't have a succession plan to speak of for any position in this county. And if we did, we probably wouldn't be uh, under the gun as we stand right now. Um, I, I'm willing to modify it to, to February 23rd to meet the request that was made by the county administrator's attorney and our own county attorney. I arbitrarily said the 26th, but you know, if that just leads to a whole separate meeting on a Friday, that's, that's tough, so I can, I can make that uh, change. But to, to their point, and I know that we've been sitting here all day, but this isn't crisis prevention. This is, this is a, a, an employee that, that could have come down with, with COVID or been hit by a bus. And you know, we're, we're trying to work out an amicable way for, for us to move on, it, it's not crisis prevention. Uh, if, if the concept of, of bringing in Hines is because he's actively found three other county administrators in his role, I mean, Sarasota <coughs> County exists today. Um, I, I don't think changing one administrator or one administration, if you will, on, by extension from a previous one for 13 years is, is knocking us off a cliff. Uh, I'm fine putting a, a few names in and having a discussion. I myself, as I said, had a name. But again, th this is a, uh, to, to Commissioner Van Ostenbridge point, a interim position. I, I do want to meet him once, or at least kind of look him up on, on the internet. <laughs> Make sure he's a real person. Um, if we're going to, to do this a little more, just we're all jumping in together and let's all hold hands and, and hire Charles Hines, mm -hmm. I'd at least like to request, and, and it's up to whatever negotiations <coughs> our county attorney comes up with, um, I, I would like to request that we, we structure some sort of a, a, a 30 day termination clause in there to allow us if, if we determine, okay, maybe this wasn't the exact right person, but it was the exact right person right now, that we can at least elect to start looking for a permanent position sooner if, if we all deem that to be the case. And maybe we kind of were a little ahead of ourselves, but we need somebody. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's fair, especially if he doesn't really want the job and he's just willing to do the job. He shouldn't have a problem with that. Even if we said, look, we're guaranteeing you 90 days, but it's a one-year contract, but after 90 days, we have a 30-day out clause. If we elect to start the process on a national search, I, I think that's fair, and that kind of gives me a little more comfort um, for if we're all just going to come ahead. Um, but, but to finish it, like I said, I, I'm willing to modify my motion on the table uh, to have the extension of the discussion on the termination of the county administrator. Uh, extended until February 23rd as opposed to the original February 26th and authorized the county attorney to begin settlement negotiations with the county attorney, uh, administrator. We need a second. Or so, um, can I the second or ask Mr. Cruz a question? Sure. Dialogue? Um, I was assuming you did it. Um, somebody said that the 26th is on a Friday. It, it, that's why I arbitrarily yeah. threw it well, out. Well, I mean, in all, in all respect from her being here for 30 years, it would be nice for her to work to a Friday and uh, then not come back on a Monday. And uh, I wish you would maybe reconsider the 26th. I mean, it was your idea, and I don't... Well, it was know. my idea because I wasn't aware of the additional information from the county attorney who just a minute ago said that he it was requested of him to extend until the 23rd. So he was given a specific date to no, extend. No, th that's not correct. If I misspoke, I apologize. Oh, okay. They haven't given me a specific date. They've just said they don't want to do this on the 17th because they need more time. Maybe that's, that's all they've said. I'm trying to get you there as quickly as I can, understanding where commissioners are. I guess the this. question I'll have with the you then. The 23rd is an, a scheduled meeting. It has to come before the board in a scheduled meeting. 
thought you could put it on the consent agenda on the 23rd if, that, if we have so, so that's out. the other problem. If it's the 26th and you work it out, then theoretically we're not going to be in a meeting yeah. to approve right. it. You have to call a special meeting. But then we have to call a special meeting, which, which, which opens up a whole other. We might as well do it on the 17th if we're going to call a special meeting and, and open up that can of worms. 23rd. So the 23rd is a consent agenda item. Yes, sir. Yeah. I will so, support uh, so the I will, 23rd. So I will make the... I'll make the motion I just made to modify it to the 23rd. I'll sec I'll, yeah. I'm the second. I agree. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, hold on. It's me, I think. Could be. I can't get the thing there for some reason. Can somebody oh. please fix my box for the next meeting? <laughs> it's working. All I know is it's flashing. I don't know what number I am. Mine's doing the same thing. It is? Yeah. Okay, mine just worked. Commissioner Whitmore, you're next. Okay, uh, I want to say publicly, nothing against Mr. Hopes, right. um, but he'd have to resign to run, and then it's temporary. He's not running. He's not running. running for anything. No, I mean, he'd have to resign from the school board no. to do this job. I don't think you can do both. Yeah. And um, I, if he wants to run for the job, that's different. But, um, you know, I don't think he can be on the school board and also be our county administrator. So... Um, you know, that's why um, I didn't support him. Mr. Hines is a qualified person. You all have your different names. I've only worked with him professionally. He's been nothing but fresh, pro professional. I think he was on the board for eight years before they did the term limits, and then I'm not sure how long he was on before then. But he's been through some really rough times in um, uh, selecting county administrators down there. And um, I agree, I, uh, Mr. Attorney, that... Um, if we do vote for this, if you could get him face-to-face um, -face for some that haven't met him before, I'm comfortable with him. And this is only a temporary job. Um, the people that I've heard the names that were mentioned, I would not be comfortable with. And I'm not talking about Mr. Hopes, others. No way. I wouldn't be comfortable with Have no no experience in this. So for now, until we do whatever we're going to do, I'm fine. But in all due respect, you know, I, I, I don't like what I heard Mr. Van Ostenbridge say about, well, let's just tell her not to come back to work or whatever. No, you know, she's been here 30 years. Let's show some compassion and integrity and let her stay until the 23rd. That's what I'm asking the majority of the board. Commissioner Servia. Thank you. Um, great discussion. Um, I just want to clarify, I agree, the government is not going to fall apart. People don't have to worry about that. But I do want everyone here to understand that the county administrator and the deputy county administrator will be leaving within 24 hours of each other soon. And those positions are not people that sit in offices and take a few phone calls with their feet up on their desk. These guys are working actively. I never leave here before these guys and I always leave late and their cars are still in the parking garage and they always beat me here. And I'm talking about you, John, down there because <laughs> I every, think he sleeps here. These yeah, they they are worker bees, guys. These are not, you know, uh kicking back people, pointing fingers and delegating. They are workers. So we are going to lose two very important working positions at the same time. And I just want to make sure that that doesn't create any voids in our service to the public. No, the government's not going to fall apart. But I don't want to miss any steps either. So that's why I feel it's very important that we do all we can to have a seamless transition. Um, I am in favor of the 23rd. I will support that motion. Thank you for that, George. Um, and remember... You know, our, what's imminent right now? What are we thinking about? The budget presentation. That is done by state statute. It's done by the county administrator. So we have got to get someone in here as someone exits to avoid any hiccups. Thank you. Commissioner Bellamy. With all due respect for everything that's saying, Madam Chair, can I call the question as far as voting for the 23rd so we can okay. get that behind us for, 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 for us to get move that forward? That is your prerogative. Yes, I'd like sir. to call the question. Second. All right, the question has been called and seconded. Um, Could I hear the clerk read the motion one more time, please? Well, right now, the Just only motion minute. to it's vote on It's only on the it. question at this yeah, point. Yeah. The question was called by Commissioner Bellamy, seconded by, I believe it was Commissioner Whitmore. Am I right on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the question? Aye. 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 All opposed?
The 23rd it is. Thank you. Would you read your motion again so we can vote on that? Oh, on the no. We just, <laughs> called, just, voted, we on just voted on whether or not to vote on it. Yeah, we just voted <laughs> to call the question. Did I lose that? Yeah. Now we vote on it. Now, now the we motion. I know. That's what I asked him to You're read. You're right. To tell us his motion again. <laughs> that's parliamentary procedure right there. <laughs> I mean, that's what I just said. Yeah, you did. Read it. So we'll know what it is. I think it's Vicki that needs to read it. Vicki, you read yeah, Whoever please. wants to read it. I don't really care. Just read it. Maybe read it. <laughs> I, I can paraphrase it. I, I mean, said G it. no, I, I think the, the one that made the motion can. Madam Chair, we should have the clerk read back the motion right. to the board. That's the appropriate way to do it. She has the motion of record. That's what I'm saying. That's my point. That's okay. You wrote it all down? <laughs> That's why I wanted to help her. <laughs> Oh, microphone, Vicki. Hold on, Vicki. The, they're asking you to put the microphone. It's okay. State Vicky, your name I'm for the sorry. record. That's why I wanted the motioner to repeat the motion All right. was to help you. I, I apologize. apologize. Go ahead. Uh, Vicki Tesper with the clerk's office. The motion, the amended motion, is to extend the termination period to February 23rd and to direct the county attorney to negotiate a separation agreement with um, with Ms. Corrier's attorney. Correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. See, she did get it. All right. So we have a motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. No. Sorry, did someone vote nay? James, I think. Uh, Commissioner Satcher okay. voted nay. So it's six to one. Okay. That threw me for a loop. So <laughs> that's just. All right. Um, Commissioner Satcher, you are on the board, sir. Yeah, I, I just voted no because I just I don't like the way I don't approve of the way this is going down. Um, but it, you know, obviously, uh, we're on the move. That's fine. Um, but I think it would have been appropriate for everybody to um, anyway for more dialogue on that. So that's that's my only issue. Okay, I'm. And it, well, I guess, and we're also on to the next. Issue. This would be the next issue as far as Heinz. We are going to vote on that today too, correct? Uh, yes. Like yeah. If the board wants. Me that's to and that's actually where my that's where my rub is. Um, so, I, w I think that the commissioners should have been able to put forth names. Um, I don't think that takes a lot of time. I don't think that the government would uh, fall off a cliff whether or not we get to say a name today or not. Um, and. I don't think that it's good governing to vote for someone. I, I mean, I did have it mentioned in a meeting uh, the other day, but uh, I don't know the person, and uh, and other people do, and that means that uh, that they're in a, an advantage um, in this negotiation, in this situation. Um, they're comfortable with them. I don't know them. Um, I would have proposed uh, Rick Mills, but I'll propose him for the. Um, for the uh, permanent position going forward, um, but I, I just don't, I don't agree with the way this has gone down. But obviously, we need to move forward. So if this is the way we want to do it, but it just didn't seem very complicated to me for everyone to to be able to make, to put a name out there and then have some discussions in a meeting. But uh, it's fine. I'm 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 going to make a comment on that, Commissioner Satcher. I understand where you're coming from, and and I will tell you that. Um, I, I think what I've seen happening here is that there's a there's several people that I've heard mentioned that I think would probably, um, you know, fit the bill as the permanent administrator, but I don't want to put them in the fray at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where there might be a problem down the road on something that maybe they shouldn't have to deal with right now with where we are as a whole, and that's what I'm a little bit afraid of. Uh, with some, you know, some of the candidates that might truly be great permanent replacements. For me personally, I just hate to put them in the fray right now uh, as a temporary. Get attacked. So that's I, I don't know if you agree with that, but I mean, I certainly do understand where you're coming from. Permission to yes, please. It's, that's a very reasonable assertion. So as always, very uh, very reasonable. Um, Commissioner Bellamy, you're next. Yeah, I just want to, um, is it okay for me to make a motion for the county administrator to, uh, I mean, <laughs> the county administrator, for the county attorney to communicate with Mr. Um, Charles Hines? Because that's what he was asking for. Yeah. yeah. Second. Here's a draft motion. 
could I? It, yes, have, please, because I know it needs to be more thorough than that. Right. Let's so, see. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bellamy, if if the board wants me to pursue this option of Mr. Hines, then I would ask that the motion read to authorize the county attorney to enter into contract negotiations with Mr. Hines for him to serve as acting county administrator. Second. I second. Though he needs to say so second. move second. first. Yeah, so move. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we have a motion by Commissioner Bellamy, a second by Commissioner Servia, uh, just so the clerk knows. Um, is there anyone from the public? Could, could I make a couple? Yes, Just please, one remark you, yes. Before, before you go to public comment. So, commissioners, yeah. first of all, uh, Commissioner Sasher, I very much understand your, your concern. I, I've, as I said before, I felt that I had a responsibility to bring this option to the board. That doesn't mean that I'm here to say this is the only way you could do this, but I am concerned particularly when we're talking about making a decision on the 23rd that we're on a tight time frame. I agree the government doesn't fall apart if we don't have somebody, but there are many decisions within the county that only a designated acting county administrator has authority to make. A department director can't make those decisions. An individual commissioner can't. Some of them the board can't even make because they're appealable to the board. So we do need to fill the spot with somebody. If there is another alternative the board wants me to pursue, I will do as directed. That's my job. No. But as yet, there hasn't been one offered up that it seems has enough people behind it for it to work in the time frame we're in. I also understand the public concern, you know, public input. Believe me, I get it. I've spent many years in public service. I understand it. But again, we're under a tight time frame right now. So there will be opportunities for that when you go through your process to select a permanent county administrator. And then when we have more time, we can do this in a way that's more transparent and better would be my, my statement to the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to open this up to public comment. We have no one on the phone, no one in the audience. We'll close public comment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? It is approved unanimously. Are we done? No, ma'am, we're not done. Are um, we done? Commissioner Whitmore, actually, you're next. Do you no, have I'm, any? I'm done. I mean, you voted, I voted, I gotta go. All right. Commissioner Von Austinbridge. Yeah, I was on the board. I actually wanted to make an amendment to the motion. Um, so the motion was made, so I had to move. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, so Commissioner Cruz brought up 30-day contract. And the amendment that I wanted to make. No. And out. Mm. And out. If it's not working. And I have a note to cover that. Right. 30 day termination. Yeah. Right. That's being covered. Right. If it's not working. Because right. I was just what I was looking, what I was going to make, my motion I was going to make was that it would be a, a 30 day contract that could be extended in 30 day intervals. Okay. Because I can. It is acting. Right? I don't need a motion to incorporate solutions. that into the negotiation, right. sir. I will, I will include that in my notes as well. Right. We're I understand for a long-term solution here, right? This I, I, is, all right, I will include clear that. Clear the rocks for a minute. Is yes, that sir. The majority of the board want that, no, though. I'd rather wait. Well, I was hoping. Ideally, to, I'd rather wait. <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm having a difficulty with this uh, motion. There's no, that's I, why we can't okay, well, all talk at once. Yes. May I dialogue with you, sir? Please. So, I would ask you to give me the chance to talk to Mr. Hines first, and then we can have a more informed dialogue about this. There are a number of ways. You can address the term of the contract, the ability of the board to end or extend the contract. Sure. So I, I'd rather not try to figure that out in the vacuum. I'd, I'd rather we have the chance to have the dialogue with him first. I have not had any discussion with him about the possible terms of an agreement because, quite honestly, I wanted to get direction from this board before I did that. That's which is budget. proper protocol. Which is what I should be doing. Yes. So that's my job. So that's what I would suggest, sir. Gotcha. Okay. I just, I've. But I will make like a we note were, of it. Yeah. I didn't feel like we were done dialoguing, and I feel like yeah. people were eager to get home because, I don't know, the news is coming on, and, and so we're bailing no. out of here before we finish <laughs> an, an important discussion <laughs> about the future of the county. My husband. Yeah, well, a minute ago, himself? the whole place was falling apart, and now we have to get home in time for Frazier. So, oh, please. For what? Well, whatever is on. I don't watch that <laughs> on cable, man. <laughs> You know, Seinfeld, right? Been here since nine. God, I'm glad I'm not in your world. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the rerun city, man. Nick at night. Um, 
Anyway, okay, well, we voted on Hines, and, yeah. and obviously I'll have a discussion with the county attorney, and I would like the contact information for Mr. Hines as well. I am. Like all, right, all right, I will circulate that. As soon as possible. And this yes, vote sir. today was uh, a vote for you to enter, enter into negotiations. We did not agree on a deal either. I want to make that, that clear is, to people as well. Yes, sir, that is absolutely correct. This has to come back to the board. Could I make one final comment? Commissioners, this is not easy stuff. <laughs> and I thank all of you for the very professional discussion that we've had here because I was pretty nervous about it. It's not easy to bring this to you. It was. And I appreciate that very. it was a very even-keeled and professional discussion. So thank you. Um, all right. Commissioner Servia. Yes. Uh, thank you. Can we please officially cancel the meeting on the 17th so it's off the calendar? So, that's so something you get to do. do that, yeah. yeah, the chair can do that. Okay. We I'll take care of that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Got it. Good idea. Um, I'm, there's no one on the board, so Adjourned? I think that's it. Uh, uh, anything else uh, from any of the commissioners before we adjourn? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 hit your buttons, I please. Did. Oh, 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 it says number one. I know. I see it. All right. Commissioner yeah, I, I, I still think we need to, to at some point, figure out what we're doing with our other open position, uh, which is coming oh. even more <laughs> recurrent. I, you know, that, that's something we need to figure out as well. Yeah. I, I can help with that. I apologize, uh, Commissioner Cruz. It's been a long day, and my mind is... I have something going on in Lakewood Ranch right now that really just I'll announce hopefully tomorrow. Um, regarding the deputy county administrator position that we are unfortunately losing John Osborne, and we have that opening coming up on the 16th, um, I got a phone call Saturday from uh, someone that used to work here, Sia Malol, I never can say his last name Retired. right. Retired. Yeah. Lol Lazar. Lazar. Can't ever say it right to save my life. At home and for um, vacation time. He's still employed. For those, he is still employed. And, and for uh, the new commissioners who never had really the opportunity much to work with him, he is the most knowledgeable person on this county that I've ever had the honor of working with. He was the... Uh, county engineer for I don't even know how many years. Um, Transportation. John, do you know? I, I don't know how many years Sia was the engineer. I, um, 30, yeah. He was here for 31. Well, 30, at, least, 36. at least 10 as the county engineer, 36 years as an employee. Yeah. 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 At any rate, he did call me on Saturday, and God bless him. I mean, this is so Sia. He said, Vanessa, I know. He said, what's going on? And he said, and you know what? He said, I'm ready to go. He said, let me know what you need. And I said, well, you know, have you ever heard about the deputy county administrator position? You know, we're losing John Osborne. He was offered it And, before. you know, I got to tell you, uh, John, Sia gave you probably the highest reference I've ever heard of anybody. Oh, wow. you, he really thinks very, very highly of you. And, and we had a great conversation, but I am, I, that truly is someone that could step in not totally know everything that John knows, but could help and, and do a very good job uh, in the interim. So uh, I am hoping that the board will go along with that, and that is something that we'll have to talk about. I mean, obviously, he's, he's in drop, so we're going to have to deal with that situation. But I didn't want to do anything until talking to this board. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, it needs to come back to the board. And then I don't know... Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Clegg, we haven't really but, talked about this yet, but it might be something you would need to get involved in. Well, I, I don't know. The code provides the code provides that a deputy county administrator has to be I nominated know. to the board by the county administrator and approved by the board. <laughs> right. Which goes back to my point okay, of why we'll we really for, need somebody uh, in the no, slot to handle Direct the county those. administrator to nominate that person. You can, but you still need to have her do it. You need to have somebody Sorry. do it. So, so. That's why it's important to have this slide. Okay, well, keep in mind, uh, Sia Malalazar, gosh knows, I know I'm not saying his last name right, but anyway, I think he'll be a great um, uh, deputy in that regard, and we certainly will need someone strong in that position. Commissioner Satcher, you are next, sir. Okay. No. All right. Carol, you're not on the board. I, I know, but I have to. I'm waiting for the camera. It's okay. We know, what you'll, we know what you'll look like. <laughs> I know, but you'll see why in just a moment. Yeah. Thank you, you so much. Radio anyway. So I wanted to, uh, probably inappropriately, I might get in trouble, uh, but I wanted to take advantage of being here to say happy birthday to my Miss Gloria, who Aww. turned six today. Thank you. Yay, happy birthday. That was a good day. Yes. Uh, 
Now I understand the camera. Right. Yeah. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I was just I'm sorry, Commissioner Cruz, is it okay yeah, if, I'm if gonna Commissioner leave. Whitmore I, goes I'm first? Leave. I just want to say Sia was up um, last time, I don't know if it was for your position or the administrator, and I know the development community had asked us to consider him for that position, and I think it was for your job at I, one I, point. I have no and, idea. Sure and, and in all fairness to Sia, he is great. He knows the transportation, especially in the North County, like the back of his hand. He's been a leader in the engineering, but he has been brought forth by the business community in the past. It's fantastic. So that's all I got to say. Thank you, Commissioner Whitmore. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I was just going to uh, see you reach out to me as well um, in light of everything moving. And, and I, I obviously known about him, and I had spoke to him once time previously, but uh, he, he called me about the same thing, and I had breakfast with him. Uh, he was just saying he would offer other services. He had some uh, other... Uh, opportunities but wanted to help with the county uh, obviously there's some complications relative to retirement and things of that yeah. nature um, that we need to look into but uh, I did a very good conversation with him he's a very smart person and uh, you know talk about institutional knowledge leaving this is an opportunity to keep it here if we can work something out so uh, you know uh, hopefully we can see what we can do yeah and and on that note you know, John, unless you would, now I would vote to really extend yours if you want. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I would do that. But, I mean, actually, John's last day is the 16th, is it not? Yes, ma'am. So I think our current administrator could put um, Sia in that position, and I'm sure that's something that we'll look at. Commissioner Servia. You yes. are next, ma'am. Thank you. Just a few comments because I have known Sia and worked with Sia for many, many, many many years, 30, I think. Uh, he's an excellent stormwater engineer. He knows this county. He, he knows all of the drainage facilities, like you could call him and he can tell you what size pipe is on which road. The guy's amazing. Um, I fully support him coming into this role. I think he would be fantastic. But like with every great opportunity, there are gonna be some challenges. He's three weeks away. I spoke with him this morning. Yeah. He's three yeah, weeks away from too? finalizing the drop. <laughs> yeah. Three weeks away from finalizing the drop program uh, that he's been in for five years. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I've talked to Mr. Clegg about this a little bit. You know, I, I don't know that someone like Sia would be willing to walk away from his drop money, which is what he would have to do in order to continue working. Now, in the past, this board has paid that drop money to keep people. That happened with Ed Hunsaker. Um, yeah, so that is something that could be considered, I suppose, and discussed. Um, I will tell you, people are knocking down his door to get him to work for them. So he he's got so many options. Uh, we could not be better served than to have someone like Sia. Uh, but it's a larger discussion than we have time to have yeah, today. Yeah, we don't have time today. Yeah. Commissioners, anyone else? Mr. Clegg, anything no, you want to add? No, ma'am. Thank you all again. I appreciate it. Tough day. Uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. I have an EMS ride along tomorrow in my district. Wish I've done that. You know, when I did it, we had a double um, oh, Lord, don't talk fatality. About it. So oh. it, it's, it really changed what I went through. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.